Honourable Senator, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Yes, Mr President, a committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators that question may be put at the request of any senator. There being none, I call the clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, sex discrimination and fair work, respect at work, amendment bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Uh, Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, there is scarcely an institution in Australia that has not been touched by an allegation of sexual harassment over the past few years. The Defence Force, the High Court, hospital operating theatres and theatre productions, big banks and big miners, and of course, here in the Parliament of Australia. The fact that these stories are being openly reported and publicly discussed may be new, but the stories themselves are old. They are wearyingly old for the generations of women that have had to live them. Sexual harassment has been a standing feature of women's working lives. That is one of the inescapable conclusions of the landmark Respect at Work report that was produced by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins. The report itself is a sobering document. I have read it, and it is difficult to imagine making your way through it and not feeling compelled to act to act urgently to address sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. And yet, staggeringly, that is precisely what the Morrison government did. The Morrison government ignored the Respect at Work report for over a year, leaving it to gather dust on the desk of the former Attorney-General, Mr Porter. And during that year, Mr Porter didn't even bother to meet with the Sex Discrimination Commissioner to discuss it. It took until April this year to respond to the report and Mr Morrison made a flashy announcement that he would adopt every recommendation in the Respect at Work report. But the truth is more complex. It's a lot more complex. Because if you read the fine print, and you always need to with this government, the government agreed to all the recommendations, except that for some the agreement was in principle. It was in part, or actually they just noted 
the recommendation with no intention to do a thing about it. It was months after that until the government prepared the legislation that we're now considering. And even this legislation has been brought on for debate a week late. And as I'll go on to explain, the bill ignores the most important and urgent legislative changes and botches up most of the recommendations that the government has grudgingly agreed to. From start to finish, this government's actions tell a pretty simple story. Unless the Prime Minister is being asked questions about this issue at a press conference, sexual harassment is not a political priority for the Morrison government. And that is simply not good enough, because, as the Respect at Work report makes clear, this is a serious problem that demands serious action. It is a confronting document. It found that workplace sexual harassment is prevalent and pervasive. It occurs in every industry, in every location and at every level in Australian workplaces. And Australians across the country are suffering the financial, social, emotional, physical and psychological harm that is associated with sexual harassment. And of course, this is particularly so for Australian women. This behaviour also represents a very real financial cost to the economy through lost productivity, staff turnover and other associated impacts, with workplace sexual harassment estimated to cost the Australian economy three and a half billion a year. The inquiry found that 40 per cent of women and 25 per cent of men have been sexually harassed at work in the last five years. The inquiry also found that most people who experience sexual harassment never report it. They never report it because they fear the impact that reporting will have on their reputation and their career prospect. And of course the answer to this is legislative change. The report makes that clear. The Sex Discrimination Commissioner has said that the current legal and regulatory system is simply no longer fit for purpose. The current system for addressing workplace sexual harassment in Australia is complex and confusing for victims and employers to understand and navigate, and it places a heavy burden on individuals to make a complaint. Often, there are only consequences for employers after sexual harassment has occurred, and only if victims are brave enough to risk their careers by making a formal complaint. And this can lead to employers discouraging victims from making complaints instead of providing a safe working environment free from sexual harassment. The Commissioner found and I'll quote, that there was an urgency for change. She recommended a whole new approach. She said that a whole new approach to addressing sexual harassment in workplaces was needed. Well, this bill doesn't do that. This bill does not implement that urgent new approach. Instead, it nibbles around the edges of substantial reform with most changes simply clarifying or confirming the way the law already operates. The Respect at Work report was clear. We cannot tackle sexual harassment without meaningful legislative reform. Unfortunately, the Commissioner herself has described the government's response as a missed opportunity. Labor recognises the opportunity before us to remedy these wrongs. Labor is committed to fully implementing all 55 recommendations of the Sex Discrimination Commission's groundbreaking Respect at Work report to help keep Australians safe from sexual harassment at work. We will be moving a detailed series of amendments to remedy the worst of the government's oversights. And if the government refuses to amend the shortcomings in their bill, under Anthony Albanese, a Labor government will work with the sexual, Workplace Sexual Harassment Council, employers, workers, unions and legal experts to finalise and implement stronger laws as a matter of priority. As part of our commitment, Labor announced today that we will commit $24 million to ensure that there are properly funded working women's centres in every Australian state and territory. I have visited the surviving working women's centres and I have met with the amazing and hard-working people who staff them. They provide free, confidential assistance and advice about workplace matters, including sexual harassment, wage theft and discrimination. You would think, having received and committed to the Respect at Work report's recommendations that the Morrison government will want to keep these centres open. You'd be wrong. In May this year, I was at the Alice Springs office of the Northern Territory Working Women's Centre, which was under threat because of budget cuts by this government. And a Labor government would act to keep their doors open and establish new centres across the country. A second reading in my name has been circulated, and I now move it. 
I will have more to say about Labor's other amendments in the committee stage, but I want to outline at this stage in the debate the key issues we are seeking to remedy. At the heart of the new approach that Kate Jenkins called for is Recommendation 17, which calls for a positive duty on employers to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. Not to fix it up later, but to prevent it happening in the first place. And this recommendation is designed to shift from the current reactive model that requires complaints from individuals brought on an ad hoc basis by those with the courage and means to do so. It shifts to a proactive model that would require employers to take the initiative, to take responsibility to create workplaces that are free from sexual harassment. Despite claiming that it has taken action to implement the Respect at Work report, the government only notes this recommendation that is at the heart of the approach, and this bill does nothing to seek to implement it. Recommendation 18 of the Respect at Work report calls for the Sex Discrimination Commissioner to be given the function of assessing compliance with the new positive duty and for enforcement, and these powers are important to make the new positive duty real and enforceable. Unfortunately, there are many other recommendations that remain unimplemented in this bill. For example, Recommendation 19, which was to give the Commission a broad function to inquire into systemic unlawful discrimination, including systemic sexual harassment. Recommendation 25, which calls for the introduction of a cost protection provision in the AHRC Act, mirroring the cost protection regime, that's already in place in Section 570 of the Fair Work Act. Recommendation 23, to amend the AHRC Act to allow unions and other representative groups to bring representative claims to court, consistent with the existing provisions in that Act that allow unions and other representative groups to bring a representative complaint to the Commission. Recommendation 28, that the Fair Work System be reviewed to ensure and clarify that sexual harassment using the definition in the Sex Discrimination Act is expressly prohibited. The government's response to this was only to agree in principle and it's not actioned in this bill. Unfortunately, the reality is that there is only so much that can be done to fix a bill once it has been introduced. Labor will be moving amendments to introduce a positive duty on employers to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment from happening in the first place. We will seek to change the Fair Work Act to explicitly prohibit sexual harassment. We will seek to make substantive equality between women and men one of the objects of the Sex Discrimination Act. We will allow unions and other organisations to bring legal action against perpetrators on behalf of complainants, and we will seek to establish cost protections for complainants so they aren't discouraged from taking legal action against perpetrators due to the possibility of having to pay massive court-ordered legal costs. Now I look forward. I look forward to debating this during the committee stage. I look forward to hearing from the government why these matters are not considered a matter of urgency for them, why these matters haven't been included in this bill. The Respect at Work inquiry was an important and landmark piece of work. It confirms what Australian women already knew, that the steady drumbeat of sexual harassment and assault cases reported in the media are simply the tip of the iceberg. The truth is that going public has been no guarantee of justice for women who have experienced completely unacceptable behaviour at work. It is also an option that is not available to the overwhelming majority of Australian women. Your boss or your workplace should not have to be high profile for you to receive justice and support. All women, all women deserve a safe workplace. This bill reveals that the Prime Minister didn't really mean it when he said that the government would implement all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report. That was a hollow commitment. Labor will do what we can in this debate to remedy the gaps. But an Albanese Labor government will work with the Workplace Sexual Harassment Council, employers, workers, unions and legal experts to finalise and implement stronger laws as a matter of priority. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Waters. Thank you uh, very much, Deputy President. And uh, I rise to speak finally on this bill uh, to protect women 
in all workplaces and uh, to attempt to deliver on the report of Commissioner Jenkins, a safe workplace for women. But it really takes the Morrison-Joyce government to be 17 months late to the party and then to leave out the key point of that Jenkins uh, review uh, into keeping workplaces safe. This government has managed to belatedly put forward a bill that misses the key recommendation uh, that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner put forward, which is to have a positive duty on employers to provide a safe workplace for its workers, uh, mainly women, who are the ones who are inevitably sexually harassed in so many workplaces. So here we are with the Prime Minister once again really failing to grapple and failing to understand the predicament that so many women are in and once again treating women like a political problem to be managed rather than actually listening to the advice, uh, acting on it and providing a safe workplace for women. So it feels like an election's in the offing because the government has taken 17 months to get to this point and now they're hastily rushing through a bill uh, that doesn't actually address all of the recommendations of the Respect at Work report, which was tabled uh, in March last year. Uh, and they provide no explanation for their failure to do that. Um, but one look at the number of women in the government's ranks perhaps answers that question. This government has got the opportunity to provide a safe workplace for workers across the country. And rather than to do that and to the act on the advice of the Jenkins report, despite saying that it was going to, it's now put forward a bill that leaves that main point out. I'm genuinely baffled, um, but perhaps not really surprised if I'm, if I'm honest, that once again, the government has failed to deliver for women. Well, we're sick of this. We are sick and tired of you not getting the predicament that women are in. Um, your botched response to the pandemic, which has been uh, felt disproportionately by women, your belated and botched response now to, to women in all workplaces, your absolutely botched response to the issues of harassment in this very workplace at Parliament House. There's no other conclusion that can be drawn. This government just does not understand women and it actually doesn't really care that much. Uh, about addressing the situation that we're in. That, that's the only conclusion that can be drawn. The Respect at Work report um, was initially on the books of then Minister Porter, uh, where it went nowhere and gathered dust. Um, and we all know that Minister Porter was, uh, has been accused of a historical rape, but he remains in Cabinet, albeit with a different ministry. Um, this bill is now under the, uh, the auspices of a different minister, and we've finally seen a bill bowled up, but it leaves out the key point. Uh, you, you just there's nothing that typifies the Morrison government better than this bill. It's late and it misses the point. Um, I do want to talk about some of the features of this bill which um, we will be supporting. There are some good bits in the bill because they actually implement some of the recommendations that uh, Commissioner Jenkins recommended. Um, but then I'll come to the amendments that the Greens uh, will move to uh, fix the fix the bits that the government's forgotten about or deliberately left out because it doesn't want to offend um, people, perhaps. Uh, so the bill includes sex-based harassment as a separate offence, which is which is positive. It recognises that not all harassment uh, based on gender is sexual in nature. Some of it's just misogyny. Um, it finally makes politicians and judges subject to the Sex Discrimination Act. Why politicians and judges were exempt in the first place is just beyond me. And the past few years have highlighted just how absurd um, that absence has been. I hope that the inclusion of those roles will really herald a change in the culture of parliamentary officers and judicial officers for that matter. Um, we want women to aspire to those roles and to know that they will be safe and respected um, in those workplaces. Uh, the bill extends the time in which complaints of discrimination and harassment can be made. Now that's a positive thing. And it recognises that it takes an awful lot of guts and courage to raise these issues. Uh, and often that takes some time for a worker to, um, to take that decision to progress a complaint. Um, they, should have, they should have the time to do that. Um, sadly, it often takes the worker to have been moved on from that workplace 
uh, before they have the um, ability to take the complaint. Uh, because inevitably it's, it's, it's women that suffer the consequences and the, uh, the harassers who are so often uh, men uh, are the ones that often get to keep their jobs. Sometimes they even get promoted, uh, particularly if they're in the Liberal Party. Uh, but that's why the extension of time within which complaints are to be taken is so important. Um, this bill also allows workers who are sexually harassed to apply for a stop harassment order from the Fair Work Commission. That's very positive. We support that. It removes the exemption that state government employees uh, currently have, um, also uh, much needed. And this, um, it's much needed in particular because this is the only facet that had been excluded. All of the other anti-discrimination um, elements uh, were, were able to be pursued federally or at the state level. This was the last remaining one. And I want to, at this stage, acknowledge uh, Jack Woodhouse, who's been in contact with my office over several years. Uh, and she's been a long-term advocate for making sure that state government employees can uh, make a complaint under the Sex Discrimination Act, not just under state laws. Uh, Jack was driven by her own experience of being discriminated against and bullied from her job and fell between the cracks as a result of this exemption. Uh, I hope that uh, she draws some comfort um, when this loophole is finally closed. The bill also extends protections against sexual harassment to all paid and unpaid workers, including volunteers, interns and the self-employed. That's positive. Um, and it also provides five days of compassionate leave to workers affected by miscarriage. Um, this again is, uh, it's outside the scope of the Respect at Work reforms, but it recognises that workers experiencing trauma should have access to paid leave. That's very welcome. Um, the same rationale should be extended to uh, survivors of family and domestic violence. Um, the Greens have long campaigned um, for 10 days of paid family and domestic violence leave to be available to workers. Um, and indeed, there'll be amendments moved. The Greens have circulating amendments. I understand the Labor Party will also um, uh, be circulating their amendments. Uh, this is a great opportunity to finally have paid family and domestic violence leave for workers to keep that connection with the workplace and to provide survivors with the best chance of um, getting their life back in order after, um, after the epidemic of violence that so many workers face. So there's been some positives here in this bill, but as I said, it leaves out the key point. Um, the scope of the problem really warrants a better response. The fourth national survey on sexual harassment in Australian workplaces found that 40% of women, um, that's more than one third of all workers, have been sexually harassed at work. That is just a thoroughly unacceptable number, 40% of women. Um, and that's more than a third of workers. So it's about bloody time we had this bill and I wish it was better and I hope some of the amendments pass to make it actually provide a safe workplace uh, for women and for workers. Uh, when we had the Senate inquiry into this bill, the Women's Legal Centre, ACT and Job Watch said that calls to their services about sexual harassment had increased threefold over the past two years. This problem is not going away, it is only getting worse and we need that broad scale cultural change in workplaces, in society more broadly, uh, to make sure that women are not being sexually harassed in their place of work. Um, sexual harassment has serious and enduring impacts on workers, um, on everyone, on broader society. It can destroy workers' self-esteem, confidence, productivity, career progression, overall health and well-being. Um, it is the ultimate example of the gender inequality that persists um, and the grip that patriarchy has on our decision-making um, organs. It also costs an awful lot. The cost of sexual harassment is estimated at $3.5 billion each year in lost productivity. Um, and each case of harassment represents around four working days of lost output. Parliament needs to fix this problem, not just in our own workplace, but in workplaces everywhere. The Respect at Work report really canvassed the scope of the problem, but it set out a comprehensive targeted set of reforms um, to tackle it. It was a holistic package of 55 recommendations to address discrimination and those structural inequalities to make workplaces safe. We need to implement the full suite of those recommendations if we are to achieve the goal of safe and respectful workplaces. Now, when the government um, finally 
issued its response to the Respect at Work report uh, um, uh, 13 months after the fact. I read the press release and it claimed to um, to say that it would it would implement all of the recommendations. It accepted all of the recommendations. Well, the devil was in the detail because now that we've seen this bill, in fact, the government has not accepted all of the recommendations. It is failing to act on the main recommendations that Commissioner Jenkins made, which was a positive duty on employers to maintain a, a safe workplace. That was the centrepiece of the report. Uh, and this bill doesn't even tackle it. It's taken the Greens to initiate an amendment um, weeks ago, and the uh, Labor Party is now doing the same. In fact, I believe we're, we're collaborating and we'll be moving a joint amendment. Um, no one should be blocking an obligation for employers to provide a safe workplace. I presume the government are going to vote against this amendment. Please think, think before you do so. This should not be a political issue. The right of workers to be safe at work, the right of women to not be sexually harassed at any time, let alone in their workplace, should not be something that uh, you can vote against. Uh, we'll, we'll wait to see how the vote goes, but uh, uh, I'm just more and more incredulous at the new lows that this government seems to find every single day. The vast majority of submissions to the Senate inquiry into this bill called for the implementation of the full suite of 55 recommendations. Uh, and really, I don't know what more can be said about the need for it. Eliminating workplace sexual harassment will take a big cultural shift. It's long past time that we began that cultural shift. A positive duty to create and maintain a safe workplace is the best way to achieve that. The vast majority of submitters to the Senate inquiry emphasise that that positive duty was critical to achieve the broader um, objectives. And I really don't understand what the government is missing here in, in not saying that the, um, the positive duty is in fact crucial. Uh, there's, they contend that there's already a duty in the fair work laws, but it's clearly not working. If it was working, you wouldn't see one third of workers being sexually harassed. And it was laughable because even the Minerals Council, with whom I frequently disagree, in the Senate inquiry um, agreed. They said, uh, and I quote Tanya Constable here, the CEO, the Minerals Council agrees with the government and others that a positive duty already exists in workplace health and safety law. However, the positive duty that already exists works for traditional health and safety risks. It is clearly not working for sexual harassment. Therefore, given the significant issue, we support there being a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act." End quote. It wasn't just the Minerals Council, whose uh, tune the government usually dances to. It was folk like the ACTU, the CPSU, the Law Council, the Discrimination Law Experts Group, the National Foundation of Australian Women, the Women's Legal Centre, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, the Diversity Council. The vast majority of submitters could see that you've got to have a positive duty on employers to create a safe workplace or you won't fix this problem of 40% of women being harassed at work, sexually harassed at work. So as I mentioned, the Greens um, and Labor will be moving a joint amendment to give effect to that most central of recommendations by Commissioner Jenkins. And um, we beg the government to put politics aside and just do the right thing and support that amendment. It should have been in your own bill. Uh, there's no justification to not support that amendment. How can you possibly not want women to be safe at work? Oh, genuinely don't understand. Uh, we'll be moving some other amendments as well. Uh, an important one is the need for um, representative actions to be able to be taken. It takes an awful lot of guts for an individual worker to challenge their colleague or their boss and it often comes at the expense of them keeping that role. It shouldn't be the weight just on individuals' shoulders. We should have representative actions allowed to be taken to fix what is a systemic issue. Um, we also want to make sure that the Human Rights Commission can uh, undertake reviews of systemic workplace, workplace issues of their own accord, rather than just when the minister um, asks them to. When we want to make sure that costs are not a barrier to taking action. So we'll be moving that and a host of other amendments when it comes to um, the committee stage, if we get to that stage before the election. The government has a women problem and this bill really shows you why. Thank you, Senator. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 
Um, well, I rise to make some remarks about the sex discrimination and fair work, respect at work amendment. Uh, and these are serious issues because we want every Australian to have an equal chance uh, at success uh, in life. And the data regrettably shows that there are many Australian women um, that are being harassed at work, and that is doing great damage to them, but also great damage to our country. Uh, because this is about work. Work is about a whole lot of things. It's about um, personal meaning. It's about economic participation. And if we don't get these things right, then the whole country is much diminished because uh, we do have a problem with female workforce participation. Um, we should be in a stronger position than we are. Um, I do think that these are issues which are, have dogged workplaces for too long. And the Human Rights Commission data shows from 2018 that two in five women are harassed at work, uh, which is an extraordinarily high number uh, when you think about Australia being a modern, advanced, liberal democracy. The commissioner who performed this work, uh, Kate Jenkins, has said, and I think this is an appropriate quote, that workplace sexual harassment is not inevitable. It is not acceptable, but it is preventable. And I think that's a good segue to um, a, a few remarks on these, these matters. Um, my friend Kelly O'Dwyer commissioned this report some years ago uh, when she was uh, the Minister for Women. And um, the former minister asked that there be a review into these matters which looked at uh, reporting, risk factors, the legal framework, uh, what are the existing measures that are used uh, to deal with harassment, uh, and also what is the impact on individuals who are harassed. Um, the government, uh, through the, uh, the executive government, through the attorney general, uh, has now decided to advance this report which is important. Um, this particular bill puts a few planks down, uh, one setting out that harassment is harassment, um, with a view to eliminating harassment in all workplaces. In all workplaces. Um, we do regulate the private economy in this place uh, with the slew of laws we have, workplace laws. I would often say we have too many. Uh, but I think in this case we clearly do need more and better and better enforcement. So this bill establishes that harassment is a legal and valid reason for dismissal. Uh, it gives uh, more uh, opportunities for the Commission uh, to put in place um, punitive measures like stop orders. And critically, it expands the mandate of the regime uh, to public officials, including members of parliament, uh, public servants, members of parliament staff and judges. And I have to say, um, I can't understand why all those people weren't already included uh, in these arrangements. I think there is um, a very important uh, principle at stake here. And that is that everyone's job is important, um, and no one should be um, in any different position than anyone else when it comes to harassment. And it doesn't matter who you work for or who you are, you cannot harass people at work. Um, and so I think including these uh, additional people uh, is a no brainer. But of course, the, the broad thrust of this is to ensure that there is uh, better tools to stop harassment and more punitive measures. And unless we are able to get on top of this, Australia will stagnate as an advanced nation on the question of female workforce participation. Um, there are more men than women in the workplace, and I don't think that's a good thing. We want people to have an equal shot at economic participation. Uh, that is critical for our nation. It is critical for our nation. And these issues uh, that have been tabled in the report, I'm very pleased that our government is taking the lead on this. This is not the only part of the reform, but this is a big chunk of the report's recommendations. Finally, I just say that um, I note that there are 
some particular issues um, around the, the trans and the LGBTQI community that they would like to see addressed in some form. Um, that may, may be appropriate to address here or it may be appropriate to address elsewhere. But I think the principle um, is, is sound that we want every Australian to have an equal crack at work and to be safe at work to provide that economic participation. And it shouldn't matter who you are. Uh, and if there are minority groups that feel that they are in need of additional protections, I think that those should be seriously considered because um, it is very important that countries like Australia go out of our way to protect minorities. Uh, minorities are not there to be bashed up. Minorities are there to be protected. And uh, I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator. We will go remotely to Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy President. Look, I rise to speak on the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respected Work Amendment Bill 2021. The issue of sexual harassment in the workplace has come to the fore in recent years. It's been global, the global Me Too movement, which has sought to hold the wealthy and powerful around the world accountable for sexual abuse. In Australia, we've seen a former High Court judge, Justice Hayden, found to have sexually harassed six of his young female associates. Now, there has been an alleged sexual assault in the Australian Parliament. I commend the bravery of Brittany Higgins for speaking out both on her own behalf and also in support of thousands of other survivors around Australia. There's been the March for Justice, where thousands of Australians marched hand in hand to demand gender equality and justice for victims of sexual assault. I was proud and humbled to join one of the marches at the Parliament lawns. While the pandemic of sexual harassment has become regular from front page news, it's not a new story for the vast majority of Australians. Because 72% of Australians over the age of 15 have been sexually harassed at some point in their lives. That includes 85% of Australian women and 57% of Australian men. The fact is that people in Australia and around the world, particularly women, have been forced to suffer sexual harassment and abuse in the workplace since time immemorial. It is a plague that I have personally encountered since the 1980s when I was a union delegate representing workers at the Cronulla Workers Club, where some managers unwritten rule for young female workers was that if you wanted to pick up more shifts, you had to sleep with the boss. And if you refused, or you stopped, your shifts would get cut. It is an unthinkable situation for a young woman who may have to lose those shifts to pay the bills or put food on the table for their children. Those women do not have sufficient legislative protections, and even though if those protections exist, it is difficult as an individual to enforce them. As is often the case, it is collective action and collective power that ultimately improve protections for one young women at the Cronulla Workers Club. And we reached an agreement with the club that their hours could not be cut if they had not been working a regular pattern of shifts. In the 1990s, while I was at the Transport Workers Union, I recall the union being attacked for pursuing the introduction of paid parental leave. That was a fight the TW eventually won, and paid parental leave was introduced into the award for truck drivers. I was proud to be a part of the fight, and I was prouder still when paid parental leave was enshrined in the National Employment Standards by the Rudd Labor government in 2010. And 2014, as the National Secretary for the Transport Workers Union, we reached an agreement on behalf of the workers with worker representatives with Virgin Australian CEO John Borghetti for the introduction of five days paid domestic violence leave. I know when we took the same proposal to Qantas, Alan Joyce's Qantas fought tooth and nail against it. After a two-year-long fight, Qantas finally introduced that right in 2016. I commend Mr Borghetti and other business leaders who have recognised that the Australians suffering domestic violence deserve to be supported by their employer. However, until recent pandemic paid, sorry, however, until 
Paid domestic violence leave is guaranteed as a right by the federal government. People will continue to slip through the cracks. At the Senate Committee on Job Security, we heard from Ms. Therese Kingston, a domestic violence support worker at Mackay Women's Centre. Ms. Kingston said, and I quote, for a woman in insecure and casual work who is unable to access sick leave, annual leave or domestic violence leave, the ability to safely leave an abusive situation is reduced significantly. I've seen multiple occasions where women have lodged private applications for protection orders and then are forced to withdraw because they are not at risk of losing their job. Ms. Kingston goes on to say, tragically, I have then seen their names turn up on court lists again several months later, which tell us that they have been victims of further violence. No woman in Australia should have to choose between their job and their safety, or their safety of their children. That is why Labor is committed to enshrining 10 days paid domestic leave in the national employment standards. And I urge the Morrison government to come on board. But sexual harassment and abuse continues to plague women and men in workplaces around Australia. Harassment at work often occurs when someone in a position of power preys on someone with more vulnerable. As work in Australia becomes more precarious, the power imbalance becomes even more pronounced. As more and more Australians are engaged as casuals or as contractors or part-time, rolling contracts, short-term contracts through labour hire companies or gig workers with no rights whatsoever. It becomes harder and riskier to speak out about harassment at work. If, you, if your contract or your shifts can be cut at the drop of a hat, then just as I saw at the Cronulla Workers Club almost 40 years ago, sexual harassment and abuse can become rife. In fact, this was highlighted in the Respect at Work Self report, which said, and I quote, people in working arrangements described as precarious or insecure may be more likely to experience sexual harassment in the workplace. This is particularly true for young women who are more likely to be insecure, carrying out insecure work and are more likely to experience sexual harassment. Mr. Tim Peterson, coordinator of Hospo Voice, told the Job Security Committee inquiry earlier this year, and I quote, we conducted an extensive survey of more than 400 young women working in hospitality in 2017. And we found that nine out of 10 of those workers had been sexually harassed at work. When you're employed from one shift to the next and you have no guaranteed hours, it puts you in a position where you're unable to speak up. Ms. Mara Lesman, the director of the Young Workers Centre, told us about the case of an apprentice chef, and I quote, they were sexually harassed by their direct boss and that had a huge impact on their ability to finish their apprenticeships and it had a huge impact on their mental health. Then when the physical altercation between the boss and the apprentice occurred, the boss told the worker not to tell anybody or they would be fired and they wouldn't be able to complete their apprenticeship. Then there is a disgraceful state of sexual harassment and assault protections in the gig economy. Companies like Uber classify their workers as contractors to avoid any responsibility or obligation for their safety. A survey by the TWU found 44% of female rideshare drivers suffered sexual harassment while working. And what sort of protections do they have? Well, one female Uber driver, Karen, was sexually harassed by a passenger last year. And after she lodged a complaint, Uber banned her from the platform. Karen was also sexually assaulted two years earlier while working for Uber. And after the assault, the perpetrator left her at one, a one star rating which impacted her uh, ability to uh, earn income and to get appropriate shifts. And even after the police complaint was filed, Uber never rescinded that rating. Because as an exploitive employers like Uber, if you're harassed or raped at work, your rapist can be leave a permanent rating of your performance. It's horrific. Those are the real stories of Australians and insecure work. Sexual harassment is so widespread and it particularly impacts those who are already vulnerable and already economically insecure. That is why the landmark Respect at Work report is so important. I want to commend Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins and her team for their comprehensive inquiry and their exceptional report. 
The Australian Human Rights Commission received 460 submissions, conducted 60 consultations, and produced a 930-page report. There can be no question of whether of question or doubt about the degree of detail and care which has gone into the report. And in the 55 practical and carefully considered recommendations that Commissioner Jenkins have put forward, which makes it so disappointing that the government response has fallen so short. It is bitterly disappointing, but it's not surprising. We have a Prime Minister who could only empathise with, empathize with Ms Higgins after his wife had urged him to imagine how would he want his own daughters treated. Well, we have a Prime Minister who has refused to launch an investigation into the very serious allegations against the former Attorney General, Mr Porter. When we have a Prime Minister who instead has, has reinstated Mr Porter as acting leader of the House. And we have a Prime Minister who refused to meet with the March for Justice and then suggested that protesters should be grateful they weren't met with bullets. Well, when we have a Prime Minister who has demonstrated time and time again a complete inability to understand or empathise with survivors of sexual abuse, it's no surprise that the bill Mr Morrison put forward falls short. It has taken more than a year and a half for Mr Morrison to present his legislation response to the report. The Respect to Work report was first presented to the government as early as January 2020. And the former Attorney General, Mr Porter, did not meet even the once with Commissioner Jenkins about the report or its recommendations. Sadly, Mr Morrison's bill only implements a handful of the report's recommendations. Mr Morrison owes survivors around Australia an explanation of why he has stalled and delayed his response to this report and why he has now failed to implement many of its recommendations. Labor supports the full adoption and implementation of all recommendations in the report. The Labor dissenting report on the bill provides a full breakdown of many of the recommendations that Mr Morrison has now adopted. Mr Morrison has not adopted Recommendation 15, which calls on the government to ratify the International Labor Organization Convention on Violence and Harassment. Mr Morrison has not adopted Recommendations 16B and 16C, which would prohibit the creation of a hostile environment. Mr Morrison has not adopted Recommendations 17 and 18, which call for the introduction of an enforceable positive duty of, on all employers to take reasonable measures to eliminate sex discrimination and sexual harassment in their workplace. Mr Morrison has not adopted Recommendation 19, which would amend the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to provide the Commission with the powers to inquire into systematic unlawful discrimination. Mr Morrison has not adopted Recommendation 23, which would amend the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to allow a representative groups such as unions to bring representative claims to court. Mr Morrison has not adopted Recommendation 25, which would amend the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to insert a cost protection provision consistent with existing provisions in the Fair Work Act. Mr Morrison has not adopted Recommendation 28, which would amend the Fair Work Act to expressly prohibit sexual harassment. And Mr Morrison has not adopted Recommendation 16A, which would amend the Sex Discrimination Act to reduce a new object to achieve equality between women and men. Instead, the wording in Mr Morrison's bill uses the phrases, to achieve so far as practicable, equal equality of opportunity between men and women. What a joke. Now, it certainly seems that in all up, uh, Mr Morrison has inserted the phrase, so far as practical, because Mr Morrison's only interested in tackling gender inequality when it won't be the inconvenience to himself and other men who benefit from it. Which would also amend, and also we should be amending um, the, um, talking to Mr Morrison about, you know, even when there are sexual assaults in his own workplace, the ministerial wing of the Australian parliament, the extent to which Mr Morrison uh, cares about this issue is the extent to which he impacts his own personal popularity and political fortunes. But for 72% of Australians who have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime, and for the millions of other Australians 
who knows someone who has been impacted. This bill is not good enough, and this issue will not be swept away. Every day, sexual abuse in the workplace continues around Australia. A recent survey by the Mining and Energy Union and the Australian Workers Union found two thirds of female fly in, fly outward mine workers in Western Australia had been subjected to verbal sexual harassment. 22% said they'd been offered uh, better working conditions in exchange for sexual favours. One in five said they experienced sexual assault. Most telling of all, almost half of the female FIFO workers said they did not believe that their reporting sexual harassment was encouraged by managers. And, and, said, and also said that they feared being blacklisted as troublemakers if they came forward. That is a damning indictment of some of the richest and most powerful companies in Australia and of the government which allows it to continue. Thank you, Senator. We will go remotely to Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As other speakers have noted, this bill enacts the government's response to Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins' 2020 Respect at Work report. That outstanding report made 55 recommendations to address widespread and pervasive sexual harassment in the workplace. Widespread and pervasive. It's a sad reality that so many girls and women around us have experienced such harassment while at work. The Human Rights Commission 2018 Sexual Harassment Survey, aptly titled Everyone's Business, revealed 39% of women and 26% of men had experienced sexual harassment in the workplace in the previous five years. And if we look over a lifetime, 85% of women and 57% of men said they had experienced it at some point in their lives, and most of them had experienced it multiple times. This is not a niche problem. It is very much mainstream. The behaviours they reported range from suggestive comments, offensive jokes, indecent messages and insulting or explicit questions, to leering, sexually explicit gifts, sexual nagging, and inappropriate invitations, unwelcome touching, indecent exposure, an attempted or actual sexual assault. And that list is not exhaustive. Unfortunately, most incidents like this go unreported, even though they can make an employee feel unsafe or diminished in what should be a professional environment. Commissioner Jenkins noted in her respected work report that the rate of change since the introduction of the Sex Discrimination Act 1984, more than 35 years ago, had been disappointingly slow. We still put the onus on the victim to speak up and take action against their colleagues or employers. And that can be extremely difficult for them to do when you're starting out in a workplace or when you're depending or very much dependent on keeping your job as so many people are. Unless we make concerted efforts to tackle these behaviours at work, nothing will change. Unless we do more to prevent harassment and to support employees, this harassment will only continue. This bill makes some good first steps, such as enabling the Fair Work Commission to issue stop orders for harassment. But I agree with many other senators before me that the bill does not go far enough to implement the recommendations of Commissioner Jenkins' reports. As the Commissioner says in her report, workplace sexual harassment is not inevitable. It is not acceptable. It is preventable. She also notes that a safe and harassment-free workplace is also a productive workplace. And I think that is self-evident to all of us. For those reasons, it is only logical that employers be asked to do more to prevent harassment in the workplace. <coughs> the Respect at Work report recommended that the Sex Discrimination Act be amended to include a positive duty on employers, except perhaps the very smallest businesses, to take reasonable steps to prevent sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation. It seems the absence of this positive duty means that many employers focus on only complying with work, health and safety laws, 
which means it is solely up to the victim to initiate action. The government does not appear to consider this positive duty necessary because there is an implied duty to prevent harassment in WHS laws that require employers to provide a safe workplace and to reasonably avoid health and safety risks. But if this is the case, I see no harm and in fact only benefit in making that duty explicit. Telling employers it is your job to make sure you educate and protect employees from this type of harm, as you do with any other workplace harms. And you cannot turn a blind eye to sexual and gender-based harassment or dismiss it as just a bit of fun. There are a number of other proposed amendments that take the bill from being a significant first step, which is how the Senate inquiry report described it, to making it a more fulsome piece of legislation that better reflects the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's Respect at Work report. I intend to support all the amendments that enact those missed recommendations, as they are sensible and also necessary if we are to get this reform through. To continue to ensure we stamp out opportunities for abuse and harassment, I foreshadow that I have a second reading amendment that will ask the federal government to work with the states and territories to ensure that employers and managers who routinely hire teenagers under the age of 18 are required to undertake working with children checks. Now, this issue was raised during the Senate inquiry, and it struck me as being common sense that we address this loophole to protect teenagers embarking on their first job, many of which are in retail and fast food sectors. The SDA told the inquiry that 51% of its female members aged 15 to 17 years of age had experienced sexual harassment in the last five years. That is a shocking number. And teenage boys aren't immune. 14% of teen boys also experienced sexual harassment. The union's National Assistant Secretary, Julia Fox, told the inquiry, and I quote, do parents know that their child, their daughter, is more likely to be sexually harassed at work than not? What environment are we sending our kids into? It's their first job, and this is what happens. Both retail and fast food industries also employ large numbers of children under the age of 18, yet there is no requirement to have a working children check. A volunteer coach at the netball club or the football club, and indeed a parent coach, is required to have one. But a manager at a McDonald's or a supermarket isn't, yet they too are working with children. End of quote. I'm not naive enough to think that working with children checks will stamp out this problem, not by a long shot. But it does make it more explicit to employers that they have an obligation, a duty of care, to ensure their young employees are safe from sexual harassment while at work. To conclude, this bill is a very good starting point, but it is not the end point. I will support this bill and, as I mentioned, I will also support key amendments that enact further recommendations of the Commissioner Jenkins' Respect at Work report. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Everyone, regardless of their sex, has the right to feel safe from sexual and gender harassment. Since the first Sex Discrimination Act was introduced in 1984, we have come a long way. However, since then, time and time again, we are unfortunately reminded that the work is not done and that there is still more to do, which is why I'm so grateful that we have people such as Kate Jenkins, who, go, who does such important work to make Australia a better place. As Ms Jenkins states in the Respect at Work report, workplace sexual harassment is not inevitable. It is not acceptable. It is preventable and that sexual harassment is not a woman's issue. It is a societal issue which every Australian and every Australian workplace can, can contribute to addressing. The Morrison government's commitment to creating effective, meaningful policies 
to positively improve women's workforce issues is why the government funded the Australian Human Rights Commission to undertake its landmark national inquiry into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces, the first of its kind in the world. The national inquiry found that, sadly, too many workplaces fall short and that women across Australia are still subject to harassment and discrimination. The government's response to the national inquiry, which was released in April 2021, is about creating a new culture of respectful behaviour in Australian workplaces. The government's response to this provides a clear and comprehensive path forward to prevent and address workplace sexual harassment, and while supporting meaningful culture change in Australian workplaces. Madam Acting Deputy President, the inquiry found that the existing legal and regulatory frameworks for addressing workplace harassment are complex and difficult to navigate, which as a result has made it difficult for many victims to deal with, a, with their cases of discrimination and harassment, which is why the government is acting quickly to strengthen the national anti-discrimination and industrial relations frameworks by simplifying and enhancing protections against sex-based harassment, discrimination and harassment in the workplace. We want to see change, and we want this change to happen as quickly as possible. If we are to be successful, state and territory governments, industry groups, professional organisations, employers, workers and the private sector all have an ongoing role to play in building a culture of safe and respectful workplaces in Australia. This bill implements the majority of the legislative recommendations in the Respect at Work report focusing on the changes that can be implemented quickly that will see the greatest improvement to the anti-discrimination and industrial relations frameworks. The bill would also amend the existing entitlement to compassionate leave to enable an employee to take up to two days of paid compassionate leave if the employee or their spouse or de facto, uh, de facto partner experiences a miscarriage. This bill sets out very clearly that this government has no tolerance for sexual harassment in the workplace. This bill will make important changes to the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984, and this act provides an important framework to protect against discrimination as well as discrimination involving harassment. Importantly, this bill will introduce a new objects clause of achieving equality of opportunity between men and women. This is an important objective However, it is not an objective that legislative reform can solve on its own. The Respect at Work report concluded that while sex-based harassment is already prohibited, this is not well understood, which is why steps have been taken in this bill to clarify that sex-based harassment is unlawful. Importantly, this bill will ensure, that, that will ensure the prohibitions against sexual harassment and sex-based harassment uh, cover all forms of workers. Sorry, sexual harassment and sex-based harassment cover all form of workers. This means that the current exemption for state public servants will be removed and it will be clarified at the government's own initiative that the Sex Discrimination Act applies to members of parliament, ministerial staff and judges. We want to ensure that no matter the workplace and no matter your work status, by law you are protected. Amendments will be made to the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to reduce procedural barriers to encourage complaints. This will be done by providing, by providing that the, the, at the president's discretion to terminate a complaint initiated under the Sexual Discrimination Act uh, arises after 24 months. In addition to the Sex Discrimination Act, the Australian Human Rights Commission Act am amendments will be made to the Fair Work Act so that it is clear on what actions can be taken to deal with workplace sexual harassment. By adding a new legis legislative note in the unfair dismissal provisions, it will be clarified that workplace sexual harassment is a valid reason for dismissal. This bill will also make it clear that the Fair Work Commission can, within the existing stop bullying jurisdiction, make orders to stop sexual harassment. These amendments highlight this government's commitment to eliminating the scourge that lurks in, within our society of workplace sexual and gender-based harassment. We are pulling on every lever of government possible to address this issue and will continue to do so. As we announced in the 2021-22 budget, 
the government is providing more than $64 million over four years to implement the government's response to the Respect at Work report. This builds on the initial $2.1 million over three years provided in October 2020 to implement the key recommendations of the report. As this bill outlines, the Morrison government is committed to taking action. By expanding the scope of existing harassment provisions, promoting clarity for employers and workers and reducing procedural barriers for sexual harassment complaints. With these, we can ensure that all Australians are protected under the legislative frameworks from sexual harassment and sexual discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mario Smith, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also would like to make a contribution to this debate on the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Amendment Bill. This bill represents the government's response to the Australian Human Rights Commission's landmark Respect at Work report. It amends the Australian Sex Discrimination Act 1984, the Human Rights Commission Act 1986 and the Fair Work Act 2009. We are broadly supporting this bill because we understand and appreciate that the issue of providing a safe workplace for all Australians is too important to delay. The work needs to be done urgently. But we also acknowledge that the government has completely missed this lesson. For eight years, eight long years, they've known important work needs to be done and they have not done it. And they've taken far too long to respond to this landmark report. Theirs is a half-hearted, partial response to what is a detailed and comprehensive report about a problem that Australian women from all walks of life deal with throughout their lives, and many of them deal with over multiple, multiple times in their life. The Commissioner found that Australia's existing laws relating to sexual harassment are out of date and that they are failing to protect workers. The Commission found that reform is urgently needed, and that's a view shared by many, many stakeholders. The reform work is urgent, but this government sat on the report for more than a year. It sat with then Attorney General Christian Porter, who didn't do a thing. And it was only earlier this year when the incredibly, incredibly brave women came forward to share their stories of sexual harassment and assault when this government was shamed into action. And as a result, what we've seen, rather than the detailed, careful, considered policy response that we should expect to a report like this, was a knee-jerk political response to what is a serious, ongoing, society-wide problem. One in three people experienced sexual harassment at work in the past five years. 40% of women and around 25% of men. First Nations Australians were more likely to experience workplace sexual harassment than non-First Nations people. And if these statistics weren't bad enough, weren't shocking enough to spur the government into action, we know that widespread workplace harassment costs the Australian economy $3.5 billion a year. All of these figures, these statistics, should shock us, but for many Australians, they're not shocking because this is the reality of life that they live every single day. They know these statistics because they live these statistics. They make up these statistics. The Respect at Work report tells us harassment is happening everywhere, but certain industries place people at even greater risk. We know retail, hospitality, the healthcare and social assistance workers are at particular risk as are women, young people, those in precarious and insecure work, those from diverse backgrounds. These people are overrepresented in these industries and can be overrepresented in the statistics. And of course, we've seen terrible, terrible allegations of harassment in this workplace, the federal parliament, a workplace that should set the standard for workplace safety. It should set the standard for acceptable behaviour. And I do want to acknowledge the incredibly, incredibly brave women who came forward and are continuing to come forward to talk about this and to shine a light on it. It's incredibly important that you do that and we're listening and we believe you. But it shouldn't take the bravery of young women to come forward 
to force the government to act on protecting women at work, to get them interested in this area of policy reform. Labor is committed to stamping out sexual harassment across society, but we need to see the same urgency of commitment from the government. Back in April, the Prime Minister said the government had agreed to all recommendations of the respective work report. But as is too often the case with the Morrison government, when you take a closer look at the detail, you will be disappointed. Because many of the recommendations were only agreed in part or in principle, others were simply noted. They want the credit for the strong response, but the strong response actually requires detailed policy work to follow it through. Too many recommendations are either not being acted on or have been largely ignored, essentially watering down key elements of the response we should see to this report. So whilst Labor supports this bill broadly, my colleague Jenny McAllister has moved amendments to this and importantly one of these amendments would see 10 days of paid domestic violence leave. And while this was not a specific recommendation of this report, we know from stakeholders, we know from women with lived experience that this is an essential reform to ensure women's safety at work. Now we know that many stakeholders have called the government's response to this report a missed opportunity. A missed opportunity, like many missed opportunities in policy work that we've seen from this government. Let's just be clear, Labor supports all 55 recommendations. We want to send a clear and unambiguous message that sexual harassment must stop. And to do that, you need to support this report in full. Sexual harassment must stop in all workplaces across the entire country. We are committed to doing what it takes to do this. We are committed to doing the hard, detailed policy work required to keep people safe at work. We believe it. it is core to our mission as a Labor Party and a Labor movement, and we will never stop fighting until men and women get the dignity and respect at work that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We will go to Senator Rice remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Australian Greens, Greens believe that women have the right to equal respect, responsibilities, opportunity and outcomes in society. And we believe that women have the right to equal access and participation in decision-making processes in all areas of political, social, cultural, intellectual and economic life. I mean, these should not be controversial statements. These should be outcomes across the board, across the political spectrum, that we should be seeing and achieving across all parts of life. But sadly, that's not the reality. And I want to acknowledge the incredible work of my colleague, Senator Waters, in the portfolio of, women's, of women and all of our Australian Greens MPs who are advocating for gender equality, because this is fundamental to who we as Greens are as a party. And that's why we need to see clear action and we need to see urgent action so that this reality of genuine gender equality across the, across the board is reached. We need that action so that women are safe at work, so that the recommendations of the landmark Jenkins Re Respected Work Report are actually implemented, including the core recommendation that employers should have a positive duty on it. There should be a, a positive duty on employers to ensure a safe workplace. The right of women to be safe at work. It should not be controversial. And particularly given that the Kate Jenkins recommendations were given to government at the beginning of last year, it should not be something that we are lagging on. The government has been so slow off the mark and it is so disappointing to see their response that doesn't go to this core recommendation of the Jenkins Review. And it's so important. We, we have to un overcome the situation where currently one third of workers in Australian workplaces are sexually harassed, report being sexually harassed, and that that's 40% of women who report being sexually harassed at work. These are just the most appalling situations. You would think that a government faced with those statistics 
would really pu be pulling out all stops to do everything they can to address them, to make sure that we reduce this experience of sexual harassment dramatically, to, to, to cut, cut through that, the, the experience of sexual harassment by women at work, to, act, to do everything they can to be addressing it. I mean, the government should be doing everything it can to promote gender equality and build a fairer society. I mean, Senator Waters has spoken this morning on our response overall to this legislation and what changes we Greens think should be enacted in our laws to support women. And I fully support the measures that she has outlined in her speech. You can take that as read. What I want to focus on today, as the Greens spokesperson for LGBTIQA plus people, is that today we've also got an opportunity to make some changes to our legislative framework that will improve outcomes for people who are transgender, who are gender diverse and non-binary, and people who have variations in sex characteristics, because these people are also dramatically impacted by the gender inequality, and because equality should not be negotiable. And Kate Jenkins, in her report, noted that there's increasing evidence that sexual harassment affects some groups of people in disproportionate ways, noting that in, in addition to gender, other factors may increase the likelihood that a person may experience workplace sexual harassment. And workers who may be more likely to experience sexual harassment in the workplace include young workers aged less than 30 years, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer or intersex workers, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander workers, workers with a disability, workers from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, migrant workers or workers holding temporary visas, and people in working arrangements described as precarious or insecure. So we've got intersectionality going on here. These are, there is in, these are intersectional issues. And with regards, in addition to that, on the basis of people who are transgender, gender diverse, non-binary, and people with variations in sex characteristics, there is discrimination on the basis of gender identity. And so, I mean, just do some sums in your head. If 30%, almost a third of all workers in Australia report having experienced sexual harassment at work, and 40% of women experience sexual harassment at work, just have a think about what the levels of sexual harassment are for people in these groups. With, for each of these groups, the most very much you know, at the level of one in two or even more of people in these groups that are particularly um, like, more likely to experience sexual harassment, that is what their experience is going to be. And that, so I mean, what, I, what I want to fo focus and in particular, um, what I want to focus on is that there are gaping holes in our legislation that would protect people of diverse gender identities and people with variations in sex characteristics that is not being addressed by the legislation being proposed today. And in particular, gender identity and sex characteristics are not currently protected attributes under the Fair Work Act. I'd like to draw on some work by the advocate and activist Alastair Laurie who notes that the Fair Work Act 2009 does not protect trans, gender diverse and intersex people against workplace discrimination. While this legislation prohibits adverse treatment on the basis of sexual orientation, thereby protecting lesbians, gay men and bisexuals, at least to some extent, it does not include equivalent protections for trans, gender diverse and intersex people. In short, the Fair Work Act 2009 does not protect trans, gender diverse and intersex Australians from mistreatment or unfair dismissal based on who they, who they are. This is either a gross oversight or a deliberate choice to treat transphobic and intersex phobic workplace discrimination less seriously than other forms of mistreatment. And that, of course, also includes the situation that not only are people not protected when they're at work from sexual harassment or discrimination, if you're trans, gender diverse, or people with variations in sex characteristics, there is also considerable discrimination going on for people actually gaining employment if they are trans, gender diverse, non-binary, or people with variations in sex characteristics. So 
we've got a situation of people struggling to actually get a job. And so many trans and gender diverse people and non-binary people just don't get jobs. And just this morning, a colleague, a contact of mine, um, Ricky Spencer, a Melbourne person, a trans woman, she wrote on her, face, her Facebook page, just had another rejection for a teaching job. I've now applied for over 45 teaching positions in government and non-government schools in Victoria. It feels that in 2021, when you disclose that you have a mobility disability and are a transgender woman, you're not seen as a suitable candidate for a teaching position. I completed my Bachelor of Education specialising in English and qualified to teach primary and secondary schooling at Victoria University, a graduate certificate in religious education at Australian Catholic University and a Masters of Education specialising in diversity at the University of Melbourne. Yet I feel that our gender becomes an issue and that schools are still heteronormative in thinking and presenting. How can we ever address the issues confronting our students who are struggling with gender identity in school settings if they won't allow teachers like myself to be role models in schools? Why am I so unwanted? Ricky ends her Facebook post this morning. This is tragic and this is the reality that trans and gender diverse non-binary people with variations in sex characteristics are being discriminated against now under our existing legislation. So we've got the opportunity today. I'm putting forward some amendments to the government's legislation today that would address these issues, that would enable us to actually make gender identity and variations in sex characteristics as, prote as protected attributes. There is an opportunity to improve this legislation today to do that. And why does this matter? And why does it need to, be, to happen now? Because it matters for people's lives. I'd like to quote the submission from Just Equal about why this matters for people's lives overall. And the recent Private Lives 3 report found that respondents were far more likely to experience unfair treatment on the basis of gender identity than sexual orientation, while 4.5% of respondents reported being unfairly treated always or a lot in the past 12 months because of their sexual orientation, 19.8% of respondents reported the same with respect to their gender identity. And in a separate question, 9.9% of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender respondents combined reported being refused promotion or em employment in the previous 12 months, which is a disturbingly high figure. And meanwhile, although intersex status, status was not included in the above questions, when asked whether they currently felt accepted a lot or always at work, only 50% of intersex respondents answered yes. Um, just equal then, also said that it's clear to us that trans, gender diverse and intersex employees need at least the same level of work workplace protections as their lesbian, gay and bisexual counterparts, as well as women, people with disabilities and others. That's very clear. The experience of Ricky Spencer is not, she's not alone. This is not a unique situation that she's going through. This is widespread across Australian society. So we think that the legislation before us today is an opportunity to address this gap. And given this legislation is a response to the Respect at Work report, we've, of course, overall in our Greens um, engagement, focusing on the important work being done to make safer workplaces for women. Now, again, I want to commend Senator Waters for her work on this issue. But what we, regard, we are asking with regard to trans and gender diverse people and non-binary people and people with variations in sex characteristics is quite simple. To make minor amendments to the Fair Work Act to ensure that the attributes that are protected under the Sex Discrimination Act are also protected under the Fair Work Act. Now, I'm going to be moving two amendments um, later on in this, in this debate on the first one would adopt a newer definition for sex characteristics which would draw on recent state legislation which is now understood to be best practice so it would be updating the sex discrimination act to be changing the definition of rather than referring to intersex people to be including to be changing that to people with variations in sex characteristics and another amendment i'm going to be um, moving which i've requested after discussions with colleagues 
it does something similar. And I, I really do want to thank the Procedure Office for their quick work in preparing it at short notice. And that amendment takes a slightly different technical approach and rather than creating a new definition in federal legislation for sex characteristics, it would simply include intersex status in the Fair Work Act by reference to the Sex Discrimination Act. That one is not our preferred option, and I'll speak more to it when we're in the, in the committee stage, but I really hope that either of these amendments will be adopted so that we can change our legislation so that people who are transgender, gender diverse, non-binary, or have variations in sex characteristics can be protected under our laws the same way that other people are so that we can be really making the steps forward that we need to be making to ensure that we are truly reaching equality, whether it's equality for women, equality for gender diverse people, equality for people with sex characteristics. We need to actually reach equality. It's not good enough to just continue to be on the journey towards equality. And we have an opportunity today to be taking strong, simple action to actually be moving us towards actually reaching equality for all Australians. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Henderson, remotely. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's my pleasure to rise and speak on the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2020. Sexual harassment is a blight upon our workplaces. It corrupts the bonds of trust which workers should develop for one another and clothes its victims in fear and shame. It is absolutely unacceptable that this kind of behaviour still persists in our great nation. As we've heard in this debate, the statistics on sexual harassment in Australia tell a grim tale. Uh, very concerningly, the Australian Human Rights Commission found in 2018 that only 17% of those who experienced sexual harassment in the previous five years had come forward to make a formal complaint. This means that most victims of sexual harassment it's suffer in silence. Thanks for order, Senator Henderson. Um, Senator Rice, I don't think you've put your microphone okay. back onto mute. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. And um, Ricky Spencer. Senator Rice, uh, could you please mute your microphone? On Facebook yesterday about her experience. Telephone <laughs> Senator Rice's office. I think we have the microphone muted. Okay. Senator Henderson, you may continue. Thank you so much. As I say, we cannot allow this situation to continue, and this bill is just one of the ways in which the government has responded to the need to bolster and supplement our already strong laws against sexual harassment. In particular, it responds substantially to the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's Respect at Work report, and I want to commend the exceptionally hard work of Kate Jenkins. The bill makes a, a wide range of improvements, such as clarifying that harassing a person on the basis of sex is prohibited under the Sex Discrimination Act by making this explicit on the face of the Act. Uh, it provides that um, more workers from sexual har harassment will be protected, particularly vulnerable workers, volunteers, interns and self-employed person. It extends the time frame for which a complaint can be made to the Australian Human Rights Commission to reduce procedural barri barriers for complainants under the Sex Discrimination Act. It clarifies that the Fair Work Commission may make orders to stop sexual harassment in the workplace, a very important provision, of course. It clarifies that sexual harassment can be a valid reason for dismissal under the Fair Work Act, another very important provision and that the Sex Discrimination Act aims to achieve, so far as practicable, a quality of opportunity between men and women. It also amends the Sex Discrimination Act so that a person who assists someone to sexually harass a person can also be found to have engaged in unlawful conduct. Madam Acting Deputy President, this is the kind of bill which the Australian people expect from this government. It is based on sound evidence, it is realistic and it is effective. It is also a bill that is the result of the hard work of the coalition government. And I want to particularly recognise the former Minister for Women, Kelly O'Dwyer, who initiated the Respect at Work inquiry, which resulted in these recommendations and now this bill before the parliament. As we've heard in this debate, Labor and the Greens are very good at throwing mud. But sex discrimination hasn't just been an issue since 
our government was elected in 2013. It was very much thriving when Labor was in power, and yet we saw no such measures from Labor to provide these important protections in the workplace. The government's commitment to women was also highlighted in the recent budget, and it is incredibly substantial, with over $3 billion worth of funding allocated for women's safety, women's economic security, affordable childcare, health and wellbeing, and domestic violence support. The government is also providing more than $64 million over four years to implement its response to the Respect at Work report, including over $43 million for additional legal assistance funding for specialist lawyers with workplace and discrimination law expertise. So as we have seen in the budget, as we have seen in this bill and all of the other government's measures, the government's commitment to women is unmatched. And in keeping with this commitment, the bill doesn't stop at just sexual harassment. It also includes a very significant amendment to the Fair Work Act by enabling an employee to take compassionate leave if they or their spouse or de facto partner has a miscarriage. Not only will this promote women's workforce participation and women's economic security, it also represents government at its best, caring for those whose lives have been seared with the scars of suffering. Madam Acting Deputy President, I want to particularly address the concerns that Senators opposite have raised, particularly Senator Waters, uh, because I am concerned that the government's position in relation to some recommendations made by Commissioner Jenkins has been misrepresented and substantially misrepresented. Order. In particular, Senator Henderson, Commissioner Jenkins. you will be in continuation when debate resumes at being 1.30. We now move to two minute statements and I call Senator Polly. Tomorrow is thank you for working in Aged Care Day, and I want to take this opportunity to express my gratitude for all the hard work, dedication and care given by aged care workers right around this country to older Australians. In the last 18 months, it's been particularly difficult in this sector to work and care for older Australians because they have been at risk not only to themselves with COVID-19 but to their families and to the people that they are charged with caring for. We have seen a lack of resources being needed uh, in this sector to look after the most vulnerable Australians and all aged care workers have gone beyond what we could have expected of them to ensure the safety of older Australians and to give them the support that they so richly deserved. But over the last eight years of these Liberal governments, we have seen this system come into complete and utter chaos with crisis after crisis. And really, the only way you can categorise this sector now is one of severe neglect. The Morrison government has passed on to failed minister after failed minister to take charge of this sector, but they have so desperately failed to protect older Australians and, in particular, to support aged care workers in this country. They have refused to support a pay rise for them. They have refused up until now. There's still 60,000 aged care workers in this country that do not have a vaccine. This is outrageous. This government has proven time and time again that they undervalue aged care workers in this country. It's not good enough. It's another election promise that Scott Morrison has failed to deliver on when he said he was going to make aged care a priority of his government. Well, he has failed. He's failed so dismally that we have now seen too many deaths in this country. It's outrageous. Order, Senator Polly, your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Within the community, consensus is clear. The children need to go back to school. On the quiet, deserted streets of Melbourne, there is no conversations going on. There's no people meeting. So telephone calls, Zoom calls, all the conversation, I'm told, is almost always the same. Parents, doctors, teachers are all concerned. Recent reports indicate that in my home state of Victoria, more than 340 teenagers a week are ending up in hospital with mental health emergencies, an 83 per cent rise on last year and a 162 per cent increase on 2019. Anyone will tell you these figures are truly horrific and it's a clear indication the negative effects 
of 212 days of the Andrews government lockdown are causing. While battling one health pandemic, it is essential that we do not create another one. The return to school can only be achieved with safety front of mind. What is occurring right now is simply untenable. Our young people need to go back to school. Once all school staff members are vaccinated, there is no reason this cannot happen. Our wonderful, highly educate, educated teachers know that social interaction is a fundamental prerequisite for learning. Many years of research make it clear that social cohesion is essential for educational and cultural assimilation, especially in the formative years. These teachers want face-to-face -face teaching because they know it is best for the children. Parents want it because they can see their children need it. This so-called shadow epidemic is anything but. There are so many people on social media talking about how it's affecting their families. Doctors have been on radio and in the newspapers. These children need a childhood. They need something to look forward to. They need to go back to school. Thank you, Senator Vance. Senator Rice remotely. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Yesterday I spoke about the crisis in Afghanistan and the impact of Australia's invasion and the 20 years of war on the people of Afghanistan. And often when we raise these issues of, well, you know, what are the alternatives of going to war? How else could we have addressed the issue of terrorism and the, the scourge of the Taliban 20 years ago? We can approach our foreign policy, our defence policy differently. There are alternatives to going to war. And in particular, I want to mention a feminist approach to foreign policy that is being developed around the globe. And the Centre for Feminist Foreign Policy says a feminist approach to foreign policy challenges the modus operandi of current political processes. It means ensuring equal participation against all, across all hierarchies in all institutions, shaping and implementing foreign policy, from ministries to embassies and implementing partners. It constantly evaluates whether political processes allow for equal influence of the politically marginalised and actively seeks the cooperation of civil society actors, promoting gender equality and the rights of political minorities. A feminist foreign policy also acknowledges continuing colonial legacies within foreign affairs and actively works to overcome them. And most importantly, a feminist foreign policy also always champions cooperation over domination, fosters partnerships and inclusion over dom instead of domination and exclusion, emphasises the shared com communalities of human beings across the globe instead of reinforcing divisions and distinguishing between us and, and them. By having a feminist approach to foreign policy, we are actually supporting collaboration. And I think there is a lot that we could be learning in Australia. Rather than immediately thinking we have a conflict, there are problems, we've got to go to war, there are collaborative approaches to be doing that things differently. Order, Senator Rice. Senator Walsh remotely. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, today is Equal Pay Day. Uh, and today I want to recognise some of Australia's most overworked and undervalued women, our aged care workers. As a country, we ask incredible amounts of these amazing women. We want them to provide the best quality personal care for their residents. We want them to know each resident's needs completely. And we want them to not just care for those physical needs, we want them to connect we want them to comfort and support our residents. And in COVID, we want our aged care workers to be the front line of preventing infection in a really high risk environment. As a country, we want all of this for just over $20 an hour, and it is a national disgrace. We have to stop expecting so much of these dedicated, skilled, professional women while offering them so little in return. Aged care workers, we know, love their jobs. They love to care. But as so many aged care workers have told me, love just does not pay the rent. It's time for our country to stop wanting the impossible from our aged care workers. It's time to stop expecting these dedicated, skilled and compassionate women to do this critical work for so little return. It's time to respect our essential aged care workers, not just with our words, 
but in their wages. And not just with our thanks, but in good, secure jobs that they can count on. And there are so many reasons that we need to do it. We need to do it for these amazing women to have their own economic security. We need to do it for our country to build the long-term workforce that we need in this sector. And we need to do it for all of us to have the high quality aged care Senator system. Walsh, the work Senator Roberts, as we remotely. Need. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The national account figures published yesterday carry great news for our community and very bad news for those in the Senate for whom mining is a dirty word. Australia's balance of trade surplus is now at a 10-year high, just over $10 billion in June, up from $9 billion in May. Every dollar of surplus is one dollar of growth for the Australian economy, generating jobs, economic security and making Australia more resilient. Every $10 increase in the iron ore or coal price adds $1 billion to government revenue. Overall, metal ore exports reached a record high in April of $16.5 billion. $16.5 billion in mining exports in one month. Consider all the employment this is creating, the breadwinner jobs, the families supported by individual labour rather than by government handouts. Investment in mining is an investment in our future security. It's that simple. Iron ore is now at $154 a tonne and coal $171 a tonne, both against budget projections of $40 a tonne. The government has a windfall here. Copper is up 23%, steel up 24%, nickel up 15%, cobalt up 57%. Our mining recovery is broadly based and sustained. This revenue must go in part to building Australian infrastructure, which is our future and in part paying back our profligate deficit caused by temporary COVID measures that now somehow appear permanent. Yet Labor and the Greens are telling miners bad luck because both want to ban any new mines and extensions of existing mines. Their policy will devastate the economy and the government revenue base. Entire communities will be reliant on government welfare and any rules imposed on them in order to keep those benefits. No wonder the Greens and Labor hate mining. There will be none of this supporting ourselves under a government Anthony Albanese and Adam Bant lead. We are one community, we are one nation, and mining will keep us free. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes to speak about some of the challenges facing our younger Australians. Professor Patrick McGorry arguably the most respected mental health expert in the country, has spoken of the shadow pandemic in relation to mental health issues. Uh, and this is being significantly felt by our young people who have um, had to deal with school closures and lockdowns and learning from home. Um, our own chief psychiatrist in New South Wales, Dr Murray Wright, has spoken of a 31 per cent increase this year in emergency department presentations by children and teenagers for self-harm and suicidal ideation. Now, uh, we know that lockdowns and learning from home is difficult and our young people um, are really feeling the pinch. As we speak, some of our young people are going into final exams and assessments without having spent a full school term in the classroom, um, and it's devastating. As the mother of teenagers myself, I know how difficult it is for parents. I also know how difficult it is for children, and particularly if uh, your relationship with your young people is like mine, where um, I, I admire all of our teachers and the patience they show in educating our young people. I just want to say to any young people watching and listening, um, stick with it and try and be strong. If you need help, reach out for help. Stay in touch with your mates. Check in with your mates. Don't be afraid to reach out. And to parents and others who are watching their young people, if they're struggling, wrap your arms around them and help them. Help them find the help they need. Um, stick with it because we will get through this and we'll get through it together. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Davey. Senator Griff remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. An enduring problem with superannuation is that many Australians have, without knowing so, invested in super funds that have high fees and low returns. Many, without doubt, would be better off switching funds. 
but working out how to do this is often confusing and very much stressful. Of course, not doing anything means less money for their retirement, and that is certainly something that everyone wants to have, um, more money for retirement. I supported the Your Future, Your Super reforms because it was going to help those very people. And I'm pleased to see one of these measures actually takes effect today, with APRA publishing the results of the super fund performance tests. Funds which fail the test will now be named and shamed. They will be, have to, in fact, notify members that they have failed and they must include the words, you should consider moving your money into a different fund. Very, very powerful words, a very strong message. One which will have three beneficial effects. First, many workers looking for a new fund will choose not to invest in those failing products. And second, some members of failing funds will invest elsewhere. And third, failing funds will have to change how they operate or close down entirely. Now, the overall effect is that these requirements will help flush out some of the rot from the super sector. All three will benefit Australians in their retirement. <coughs> super reforms were bitterly contested, but I was an enthusiastic supporter because they benefit the people who elected me. I was not elected by dud fund managers, ex-union bosses or executives pulling seven-figure salaries, but ordinary working Australians who just want a dignified, financially secure requirement at retirement, and I'm very proud to have Order, them. Senator Griff. Senator McCarthy, remotely. My condolences to the Kalgarinji community for the passing of Mudra Elder, Mr Wayfield, last week. He was one of the stockmen who walked off Wayfield in 1966, led by Vincent Lindiari. He was a remarkable man who leaves behind an even bigger legacy. He protested against the poor conditions to take back the land that belonged to them. And this is why it was so important to be able to celebrate Freedom Day here in the Northern Territory. For those of us who have walked in the footprints behind Mr Wayfield, Mr Lingiari and so many other Gurindji leaders, now is the time to reflect when we lose our elders. We didn't have the celebration this year because of COVID, but we may have the celebration later this year. It was Gough Whitlam who symbolically passed a handful of sand to the old man, Vincent Lingiari. 55 years on, the community still wish to celebrate the birthplace of land rights, and that anniversary was last Monday. While it is sad that it has been cancelled, I know that the community are looking forward to when they can have people come back to Kalgarinji and obviously celebrate the life of an amazing man in Mr Wayfield. The movement with Mr Lingiari, whose grandchildren joined the fight last year to maintain the electorate of Lingiari in the NT, was so critical to us being able to save the seat of Lingiari, along with obviously now the seat of Solomon. My heart goes out to all those families in Kalgarinji, to the Wayfield people, to Rosie Smiler, to all the grandchildren, but also to the Gurindji Association, to the men and women who work tirelessly, and also the union movement who are still very much a part of the way of life of the Wayfield people. This is an important year. I send my best wishes, not just for myself, but also my families. Bye -bye. Thank you, Mr. Senator Wayfield. McCarthy. Senator Abetz remotely. Some time ago, I was critical of Australia Post service delivery standards, noting specific examples of where Australia Post could do better. Part of the criticism was its unilateral decision to refuse to continue to deliver perishable goods. In my home state of Tasmania, Australia Post's decision caused uncertainty, dislocation and job insecurity. Having achieved a moratorium on the decision, the Small Business Ombudsman, Bruce Bilson, was called in to help develop a solution. The good news is that a solution has been found, with Australia Post committing itself to continue to deliver perishable goods across Australia. Many jobs are dependent on getting our fine products to market. Individual purchases, buying habits are now more internet-based, with direct sales going from producer to the door. 
Australia Post's reconsideration of their duty is much appreciated by both producers and consumers. The decision means Tasmanian businesses like Tasmanian Gourmet Online, Ashgrove Cheese and 41 Degrees South can continue to have their highly sought after premium quality products delivered to their discerning com consumers. Food safety issues have been worked through exceptionally carefully to ensure perishable products arrive in a manner ensuring consumer safety. Australia Post can again truly say about its service, we deliver. On behalf of Tasmania's premium food sector workers whose jobs depend on a safe, reliable service delivery, a big thank you to all involved in overcoming this impasse. It has secured jobs, families and communities in my home state of Tasmania. Thank you, I Senator thank the Senate. Senator Patrick, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Total policy failure. When I see news reports talking about import terminals for gas, that's what I think. Total policy failure. Australia exports two units of gas for every one unit that it uses domestically. Unfortunately, we export the cheap gas to competing Asian markets, and we retain the more expensive gas for use here in Australia. The ACCC is warning that the market price for gas has turned and we are going to see gas prices rise significantly over the next couple of years. This is despite a fall in domestic consumption that tells you there's something awfully wrong from an economics fundamental perspective. What's the cause? Well, it is not a shortage of gas. It is firstly exports, exporting gas at the expense of supply here in Australia. $62 billion worth of gas was exported uh, in 1819, and we got $1 billion in PRRT. So we're exporting it, but not getting any benefit. We've got a cartel operating on the east coast of Australia. We also have a monopoly in terms of gas pipelines. We have to do something about this. Firstly, we need to pull the Australian domestic gas security mechanism to make sure there is enough gas here. We need to look at things like a reservation policy, which the governor announced but haven't dealt with. We have a total policy failure when it comes to gas. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak about some very mysterious things that seem to be happening in central Queensland, particularly in Rockhampton. This weekend, the Rockhampton Morning Bulletin reported that Senator Pauline Hanson had secured $8 million of federal funding for a new hospice in Rockhampton. This is a good project. I've actually met with the proponents of uh, this project myself. But the question must be asked, why is it that federal government funding, Morrison government funding, is being announced by a One Nation senator? The last time I looked, uh, this was in the electorate of Capricornia, held by government member Michelle Landry. Why is it that Ms Landry is not getting to announce government funding, but instead Senator Hanson is getting to announce that funding? In the article in the Morning Bulletin, Senator Hanson claimed that she had been the only federal representative to make representations to government for this hospice, which again begs the question, what is Ms Landry doing? She's not making representations for this funding. She's not getting to announce this funding. Instead, it's Senator Hanson who's getting to announce this funding. And Senator Hanson claimed that her efforts and her funding announcement came as a result of discussions that she had had with Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. So again, this raises the question, why is Senator Hanson getting to announce $8 million of federal government funding? Is this part of some deal that she has with the federal government? We know that Senator Hanson is the most reliable uh, ally that the LNP has in this chamber, voting with them almost every single time. Does, is this what she gets in return? She gets the ability to go out and announce government funding instead of the government's own members? 
The issue became even stranger yesterday when a media release appeared on Michelle Landry's website claiming that she had delivered the funding. So two days after it's reported in the Rockhampton Morning Bulletin that Senator Hanson delivered the funding, now Michelle Landry is claiming the funding. There are only two options here. Either Senator Hanson is lying or Michelle Landry is being sold out Order, by her own Senator government. Watt, uh, Senator Wish Wilson remotely. Uh, Senator Bush Wilson, you might be on mute. I'll come to you in a second. Um, Senator Watt, I have just received advice from the clerk. It's not in order to refer to a, another senator as lying, so if you could please withdraw that comment. I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Bush Wilson. I might go to Senator Smith because he is on his feet and then we will come back to Senator Wish Wilson. I assume he's just logged off and will be logging back in again. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. I rise to acknowledge the rapid progress of the government's COVID-19 vaccine rollout and its critical role to unlocking both my home state of Western Australia and the whole nation. In doing so, I acknowledge the work done by so many to make this possible and the millions of Australians who have already been vaccinated, protecting themselves, their families and their community. Based on numbers released yesterday, more than 19 million vaccine doses have been administered nationally, growing by around a million doses every three days. This means that one in two Australians over 50 and one in three over 16 are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Australians are being vaccinated at a faster rate than was ever achieved in the United Kingdom, in the United States or across Europe. Western Australia has been fortunate during this pandemic to date, enjoying freedoms that many other Australians have not been able to enjoy, but we must not allow this fortunate position to become complacency or rely on the only defence of our border. As we started the week, WA's vaccination rate has been lagging behind other states and territories, with 49.8 per cent having received their first dose and just 31 per cent their second. Meeting WA's vaccination targets is an important part of the Morrison government's national plan, which will minimise lockdowns and pave a safe path to reopening both WA and Australia, opening up to each other and to the entire world. So I strongly encourage everybody in Western Australia who has not yet taken steps to get vaccinated to please do so. Now is the time. As patron senator for Perth's northern suburbs, the Kimberley and the Pilbara, I particularly encourage locals there to book their vac vaccinations now. And I ask members of the many multicultural groups with which I work closely and who contribute so much to our wonderful West Australian community to do the same. To those who have already been vaccinated, we say thank you. Your local community, local businesses and your country, thank you also. Now is the time to vaccinate. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On Friday, in evidence to the Job Security Senate inquiry, labour hire companies were turned around and made evidence, gave evidence at Hayes that of 2,500 staff contracted the Australian Public Service have no access to paid leave for time spent isolating or being vaccinated for COVID-19. This is despite the fact that many do the exact same job as directly hired colleagues who are entitled to this leave. What's more, I later heard from an ABS worker on a different labour hire contract who said she did receive vaccination leave. But it's not even as though it's impossible for labour hire firms to do it. They just are allowed by the government to get away with not bothering to. And the government says it's not its responsibility to keep the labour hire workers and employees safe from COVID. This kind of two-tiered system is becoming endemic in Australia and it's unacceptable that it should be allowed to operate within Scott Morrison's own government departments. It's this sort of evidence that led to Mr Morrison teaming up with One Nation to act the health security inquiry last week. Mr Morrison knows Australia's industrial relations system is broken and he wants to muzzle the voices of workers experiencing severe jobs in security. Hayes received $380 million from the federal government last year. 
has $380 million of taxpayer money, and yet they can't afford to stump up for COVID and vaccination leave. Also revealed the inquiry on Friday was the fact that one even is even keeping, no one is even keeping track of how many APS are engaged on a temporary basis. There is no central record keeping or reporting their numbers. So it's not even the government knows what proportion of its own staff are casual at any given time. Order, Senator Shaw. Right, Senator sorry. Wish Wilson. Can you hear me, President? We can now. Great. If you are one of the millions of Australians yesterday who received a spam text from United Australia Party from Clive Palmer, uh, you're not alone. I got one yesterday too, and it's bloody annoying. I wanted to raise this issue today in the Senate because while it's not surprising that Australia's kind of billionaire buffoon is again carpet bombing this country with his millions of dollars uh, to try and influence an election, what is critical about this is that unfortunately the Spam Act in Australia doesn't safeguard against false information if the message is authorised by a registered political party. And this is a great challenge for us going into a federal election. So I, I listened to the message yesterday from uh, Mr Craig Kelly uh, in the other place, and I have grave concerns about the kind of information that Mr Kelly and Clive Palmer and the United Australian Party are peddling going into this next federal election and our ability to hold them to account for misinformation and potentially a dangerous information uh, around COVID. So this is the time of the great lie. Uh, for anyone who saw the ABC series last night on Fox News, we've seen Sky News in Australia banned from YouTube for spreading misinformation. This is Order, an important Senator time Wish Wilson, for Australians to get 2 the PM, We'll move to questions. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Is the Minister aware that today the New South Wales Health Minister, Brad Hazard, confirmed the gap between the first and second doses of Pfizer vaccine in Sydney will be spaced out to eight weeks? Mr Hazard said, and I quote, Simply put, there is not enough Pfizer in New South Wales or anywhere in the two major states, New South Wales or Victoria, for the people who are now wanting it. Will the minister acknowledge today's announcement is not enough to fix this? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thank Senator Keneally Order. for her question, uh, Mr President. Yes, and I did see the a media conference where Minister Hazard indicated that uh, the spacing Order. for Pfizer vaccines in New South Wales had been spaced out to eight weeks. I understand, Mr President, that in Victoria it's actually at a six-week interval. Um, in other jurisdictions, uh, they have varying, uh, Order. They have, they have varying uh, intervals between the doses based on the health advice, Mr Senator President. Watt. Uh, and we have continued um, uh, to put additional capacity where we can uh, into jurisdictions. In fact, uh, only recently we announced that we had available to Australia, through a deal with Poland, one million additional Pfizer doses, Mr. President. And we put half of those into New South Wales with the acknowledgement of the circumstances that New South Wales was seeing with the current outbreak, Mr. President. And today, uh, very pleasingly, and an additional half a million doses coming from Singapore, Mr President, will also assist uh, with, the, with the circumstances nationally with the vaccine rollout. And as the Prime Minister has said, we continue, we continue to work on the availability of vaccines to assist the vaccine rollout, Mr President. We've been very transparent with the Australian people. We have published the Order. supply projections for vaccines out to the end of the year that mr president that information was provided to the chamber order that was that information was provided out to the uh, uh, to the chamber uh, some months ago mr president uh, and we continue to be transparent there are there are significant supplies right now of astrazeneca available 
There are no constraints with respect to the supply of AstraZeneca, Mr. President. So I would encourage anyone who wants a vaccine to make inquiries about getting one. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Mr. Morrison announced all aged care workers would have at least one COVID dose by 17 September. But today, New South Wales Health Minister Brad, ha Brad Hazard said he is, quote, not at all confident that will happen. Will the Morrison Joyce government ensure all aged care workers receive a vaccine by 17 September to protect them and the people in their care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I don't agree with Mr. Minister Hazard with respect to his perspective on uh, the vaccination of the aged care workforce. As of yesterday, there were about 58,000 workers aged care workers in Australia yet to be vaccinated. Last week, Mr President, we vaccinated over 22,000 of them. We've been, we've been vaccinating about 20-odd 20 20 odd thousand uh, a week. Um, we offered uh, last week uh, 35,000 opportunities. We'll op offer this week 28,000 opportunities for aged care workers through our range of programs, specific aged care uh, opportunities for vaccination, Mr President. So uh, we're working extremely hard with the providers uh, with the union movement, in fact, Mr. President, who uh, my department meet with twice a week, I meet with uh, every Friday to discuss the rollout and the issues relating to the aged care uh, workforce rollout. So we are determined, Mr. President, to get the aged care workforce vaccinated. Uh, we are at uh, order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. When Mr Morrison's own New South Wales Liberal and National colleagues have today continued to lay the blame for the bungled vaccine rollout squarely at his feet, how can Australians languishing in lockdown possibly believe Mr Morrison when he says he's fixed the failures of his bungled vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, I simply don't accept the characterisation that Senator Keneally uh, has put on her question, Mr President. Uh, we are currently running uh, vaccination rates on a per capita basis uh, that are as good or better than any place in the world, the UK, the US, Mr President. So, yes, we did have some problems with the vaccination rollout early. We've acknowledged that, Mr President. We have been straight with the Australian people. We haven't been trying to undermine public confidence in the Order. vaccine rollout like Labor have. We've, we've continued to work, Mr President. We have continued Order. to work to support supply Order. of vaccine for the Australian Senator people, Keneally. Mr President. Uh, we've, we've done deals where we could to gain access to additional capacity, and we've provided that information to the Australian people. And Mr. Pre Mr President, it's clear to the Australian people, even if it's not clear to the Australian Labor Party. Uh, vaccination is important. Take the opportunity to go and get a vaccine. The best vaccine is the one that's available to you right now. Order. Order. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on the ways in which our diplomatic capability is delivering to protect Australians? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith uh, very much for the question. Mr. President, uh, as announced uh, today by the Prime Minister, uh, particularly in relation to Singapore. Through our diplomatic channels with Singapore and previously with Poland, the government uh, has been able to secure access to 1.5 million vaccine doses this month. Earlier today, the Prime Minister, the Health Minister and I announced that Australia will receive 500,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine from Singapore under a dose-sharing arrangement. We will in turn deliver 500,000 Pfizer doses to Singapore in December uh, when those supplies are available. It is a constructive and flexible way for governments to work together in all of our interests to manage COVID-19. And I particularly want to thank Prime Minister Lee, Foreign Minister Vivian Balakrishnan and the people of Singapore and acknowledge the work of Australia's High Commissioner Will Hodgman and his team who have worked closely with the government of Singapore to achieve this outcome. Mr President, earlier this month we announced our agreement to receive one million Pfizer vaccines from Poland. Uh, these additional doses came uh, on top of the 40 million Pfizer doses that Australia has secured for 2021, and that does provide a boost to the vaccine rollout across the country. It does also demonstrate the value of Australia's close engagement with other governments, and it's a strong example of countries cooperating and supporting one another as we face the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic together and across the Indo-Pacific in particular. 
It also reinforces uh, the role that my department, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, plays in supporting Australia's response to and recovery from COVID-19. We are cooperating with our partners in the region, Mr President, cooperating to save lives, to advance economic recovery and to build health systems to protect against future pandemics. Senator Smith, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the work we are doing to support vaccine access and COVID-19 support in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia? Senator Payne. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. President. And again, I thank Senator Smith for his question. Uh, at the G7 in June, uh, Prime Minister Morrison committed to the delivery of at least 20 million vaccine doses from Australia's domestic, domestic supply to our region by uh, mid-2022. We have already delivered over 2.1 million vaccine doses to the Pacific and Southeast Asia, as well as that vital end-to-end -end support for those doses to be administered where they are needed most. The delivery of 403,000 doses to Vietnam last week was the first of a number to our Southeast Asian partners. We have also committed 2.5 million doses to our partners in Indonesia, and we will begin delivery of those uh, soon. We are working in partnership with our neighbours to support comprehensive vaccination of the Pacific and Timor-Leste. Mr. President, At this point in time, we have delivered 861,000 vaccine doses to Fiji. 577,850 to Timor Leste, as I said, 403,000 to Vietnam, and further doses, of course, to Papua New Guinea, Order. the Solomon Senator Islands, Payne. Samoa, Tonga, Time Tuvalu, the Vanuatu. Has expired. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate of our cooperation with international partners in support of vaccine <coughs> access across our region? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We are working closely with international partners to support the region's response and recovery to the COVID-19 pandemic and to ensure access to COVID-19 vaccines for our partners. The impacts of COVID-19 continue to be very significant. The da damage to economies and to communities in our region is severe. We have committed $130 million to the COVAX AMC, which has been delivering vaccines to the region since February. Our neighbours in Southeast Asia and the Pacific have now received more than 48 million COVAX doses, with more deliveries planned. And in addition, Australia has contributed $100 million to the Quad Vaccine Partnership. That is directed to vaccine procurement for the region and support for national vaccine rollouts. We are working with our partners to support these countries within their national plans on uh, their priorities and delivering uh, in those uh, partnerships in that manner. Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Today, 1,164 new local COVID 19 cases have been recorded in New South Wales, with 143 people currently in an ICU and tragically 96 total deaths during the current outbreak. An experienced respiratory physician at a Western Sydney hospital has described the COVID-19 crisis in Western Sydney in the following words, and I quote, imagine if during last year's bushfire, bushfires, brigade captains were not informed where fires were moving and what resources might be required. This is exactly what is happening now. Spot fires have turned into roaring blazes of the virus. Is he right? So, could you say the last phrase again, Senator Sheldon, um, after the quotation? Uh, we didn't quite hear. Uh, is, is he right? No, thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think, I think it's, it's disappointing that Senator Sheldon would seek to make such a direct comparison between the circumstances of the very tragic bushfires last year and the circumstances Order. of the uh, pandemic right now, Mr. President. Clearly, in New South Wales, uh, it's clearly in New South Wales, the situation is extremely difficult. Uh, the New South Wales government has placed uh, significant lockdowns on large proportions of the uh, New South Wales community, uh, Mr. President, and um, uh, and of course across all of New South Wales in an attempt to manage the current outbreak and suppress. The spread of the virus, Mr. President, and suppression of the spread of the virus has been part of the national strategy on COVID-19 right since the outset of the pandemic in, Mr. President, in, um, uh, in 2020, Mr. President. Uh, 
we value the contributions of all medical providers in relation to the management of the outbreak. And at all times, Mr. President, both at a state level and at a national level, uh, we have relied significantly on the medical advice uh, from our health professionals at a national level in guiding in establishing the national plan for COVID-19. And we know that in, in the states and territories, uh, the chief health officers have played an absolutely pivotal role in the management and the advice to the, to the states and territories with respect to the management of the virus. And I am certain uh, that they will continue to do that. They provide very valuable information and advice in, with respect to the management of the, uh, the, the pandemic, Mr. President. Uh, and of course, through National Cabinet, the states and the territories are working together uh, with respect to the management of the virus uh, and the pandemic across the country, Mr. President. And we'll continue to do that take the advice that's being provided to us by the professionals that are leading the pandemic uh, and continue to work with them on managing the particular outbreaks in Lord all of the Senator jurisdictions. Colbeck. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. It has been reported the Morrison-Joyce government is only now seeking urgent advice from intensive care doctors about the pressure on hospital wards. Despite being more than 18 months into the pandemic, why has the Morrison Joyce government waited for a living crisis to seek advice? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I completely reject uh, the, the insinuation of, uh, of, of, uh, of Senator Sheldon, Mr. President. In fact, uh, in March last year, Mr. President, in March last year, we established a national agreement with the public health, uh, with private hospital the private hospital sector that provided us with the capacity to supplement public health uh, capacity across the country. And, Mr. President, and as the circumstances of each of the outbreaks have come into place, those measures have been put into place. Mr. President. They were in Victoria last year, Mr. President, and they ha can be and they will be in New South Wales. Mr. President. So one of the very first things, Mr. President, one of the very first things that this government did was to ensure the hospital capacity available to treat Australians who were suffering with COVID-19, Mr. President. So for Labor to be just coming on board now, it's a bit late to come to the game, Mr. President. Order. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. The Western Sydney doctor also warned, and I quote, with the coming deluge of cases, it is possible ambulances will not reach people suffering from heart attacks or strokes as quickly as they should. Can the minister guarantee that ambulances across Australia will be properly resourced to cope with the increased demand of high COVID-19 case numbers in the coming months? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I at first pay tribute to all of those uh, paramedics, ambulance workers across the country who are doing such a great job? And, and I'm happy to concede, Mr. President, uh, at the current time, particularly in New South Wales, under severe pressure, under severe pressure, uh, because there are there there, there is a significant uh, transmission of COVID-19 in the community at the moment, Mr. President, uh, and and I know that they are working very hard and very diligently to meet the demand, Mr. President, uh, Mr. President. So we have put additional resources, significant additional resources, into the national health system. Uh, across the country uh, are particularly focused on uh, COVID-19. In fact, on the 13th of March last year, 13th of March 2020, the, the Australian government and all state and territory governments signed a national partnership to respond to the, the virus, uh, Mr. President. So we have been working on this and ensuring the capacity was there for a long time, Mr. President. Order, order, Senator Thorpe, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister. A First Nations man died because of COVID-19 this week. Our communities are not getting the help they so urgently need as COVID rips through our communities. Will Kenya Mob ask for urgent help over a year ago? Why did you neglect our people and our calls for support? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, sir, Mr. President. I thank Senator Thorpe for her question and acknowledge that uh, every loss of life through, uh, through this pandemic is a tragic one. Uh, it's tragic around the world uh, where, Mr. President, uh, we've seen more than four and a half million deaths across the globe. Uh, and of course, it's tragic in Australia where some 1,006 deaths have occurred. Uh, and whilst the death rate in Australia has been far, far lower than around the world, we acknowledge the personal pain and anguish of those individuals. Uh, if we compare uh, the situation through Australia during this pandemic, in Victoria last year, when we didn't have the targeted aspects of the vaccine rollout in place, uh, there was a fatality rate of around 4.2%. This year, during the outbreak that's occurring in New South Wales, that fatality rate has dropped by close to 90% and down to 0.45%. Uh, that's a large factor due to the heavy focus on ensuring that older Australians were vaccinated first and foremost, uh, and in doing so, uh, helping to make sure that we reduce the fatality rate in those most vulnerable uh, populations of all older Australians. Uh, I acknowledge that, uh, that we do have particular challenges in Western New South Wales and around the Wulcanian uh, region, as Senator Thorpe. Can I point sorry, of order? No, sorry, Senator Thorpe, the remote participation rules don't allow for points of order when participating remotely. Well, how can I get the um, question out? You've got a, um, someone in the chamber can raise something or you've got supplementary questions, my apologies, uh, but they are the rules the Senate adopted. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, so, in relation to those around Western New South Wales, in particular the Wilcannia region, we've been working closely with state and territory governments and Aboriginal controlled and community health services to ensure the needs of Indigenous community planning and delivery, including through uh, this outbreak of COVID, and particularly as it relates to working through uh, the vaccination program. Uh, indeed, Mr. President, uh, we know that there are particular challenges in there. Uh, and it is in response to those challenges uh, that we have ensured additional resources have been provided to Wilcannia to help to support that community and those across Western New South Wales. The Commonwealth Department of Health stood up an incident management team to coordinate the Commonwealth response. Order. Senator Birmingham, the time for the Can answer has expired. Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The gap between First Nations vaccination rates and non-Indigenous rates is as high as 17 percentage points in some states. When will all First Nations people be vaccinated? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, I, uh, I continue to urge and encourage all Australians, including Indigenous Australians, Torres Strait Islanders, uh, indeed, all parts of our population uh, to respond and to seize the earliest opportunities to be vaccinated. And we're seeing amazing growth in Australia in the vaccine program. Uh, and that growth indeed has seen uh, from four weeks ago, uh, when 42% of the population uh, had had a first dose, uh, to now nearly 59% of the Australian population Senator having Young. had oh, so on a, a first point of dose. order. Sorry, Senator Birmingham, working. I have Senator Hanson Young on a point of order. You Senator Hanson Young. On a point of order, um, Senator Thorpe asked specifically about Indigenous peoples, and I'd like the minister to answer that well, question. I, I when would they be vaccinated? Senator, um, there was a, a, a statistic asserted. Senator Hanson Young, there was a statistic asserted as a preamble to that. I believe the minister is being directly relevant to that with this part of the answer. I'll continue to listen carefully, but I can't instruct him how to answer the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. We have more than 9,000 access points uh, for people to get a vaccine across Australia now. That is only going to grow. Uh, we are working uh, across particularly Western and far Western New South Wales uh, with the Royal Flying Doctor Service, uh, with other vaccine providers with primary health care networks and Aboriginal community controlled health services to make sure that we have an even more points of access for individuals as we're doing across Indigenous communities right around the country. The message must be clear to take advantage of these opportunities yeah, to help Senator drive Birmingham, the vaccination time for the answer has expired. Hard. Senator Thorpe, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you for your non-answer. Minister, people are dying out there and you did not answer my question. Our communities and our people warned you, warned this government about housing, safe decarceration and self-determined health service 
a year ago, how much blame do you accept for completely failing Aboriginal people in this country without the excuses? Senator do your Birmingham. job. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I don't accept uh, the characterisation by Senator Thorpe in, uh, in her answer. Uh, this is a challenging global pandemic. Uh, as I said, in response to the primary question, more than four and a half million people around the world uh, have lost their lives. And we've sought to provide the best protections possible for Australians from the outset and through the closure of Australia's international borders to the scaling up of a range of different health responses across the country, working closely with those state and territory partners. Uh, and now at this stage, through the vaccine rollout. I'm sorry, this is wrong. Order, Senator Thorpe, please. Senator Birmingham to continue. We lost Senator Birmingham. Somebody, I don't have any so friends order. in there. Senator Thorpe, order, please. Do black light. Senator Thorpe, I can ask for your microphone to be muted if you keep interjecting. Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, nobody pretends these issues are easy or have easy responses. Uh, but indeed, ensuring the additional Senator vaccine. Senator Seward, on a point of order. So, do have a point of order. Um, the minister isn't answering, answering the question was, how much do you accept blame for the so, failure sorry, to Senator vaccinate Seward, First Nations? I, so Senator Seward, resume that your seat. The... I have asserted repeatedly that I'm not going to allow points of order on direct relevance for people to simply stand up and ask the question again, or as in this case, part of the question again. There was not even an attempt to make a point of order about direct relevance, Senator Seward. There was a lot in the question asked by Senator Thorpe, and the minister is entitled to respond to any or all parts of it in the time allotted. That part of I the cannot question. Instruct, Senator Seward, I have said before that I can't instruct a minister which part of a question to answer, which assertion to address, or how to answer a question. If there are long questions with a lot of content in them, the minister is entitled to address any or all parts of it in the minute he has allowed in this case. I've ruled repeatedly that tight questions will be, uh, have a very tight test of direct relevance. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said in the Chamber many times, uh, we accept responsibility for the challenges the vaccine rollouts faced and for fixing it. And indeed, we accept responsibility for dealing with all of the different challenges we've faced during COVID-19, because that's the job we have to get on and do. And it's why we've put the RFDS in place with additional vaccine capacity. Order. While we're working Senator with Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout as part of the national plan agreed by National Cabinet, particularly in relation to older Australians? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Brockman, for your question. Mr. President, Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout continues to ramp, at, ramp up as we said it would. More than 19.3 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have now been administered in Australia. Mr. President. Over the weekend, around 380,000 people rolled up their sleeves and got a jab to protect themselves, their friends, Mr. President, uh, their families and to protect their country. Yesterday, a further 277,000 doses went into arms of Australians, Mr. President, and I thank every single one of those people for going out and getting vaccinated and encourage all Australians to do the same. While your home state of Western Australia, Senator Brockman, has uh, very low COVID infections, the vaccine rollout is forging ahead in Western Australia too. So that when the time Order. comes, WA can join Order. all the states Senator Watt. and reopen to the rest of the country and to the world, which is going to be very important for us all, Mr. President. We've got on with the job of protecting our most vulnerable Australians. That's our older citizens first. More than 87 per cent of over 70s are protected with the first dose. We have done this because we know that elimination of the virus is a fallacy and vaccines are the answer to us living with the virus, not in fear of it. We have a national plan that states and territories have agreed on to open up at 70 and 80 per cent vaccination rates progressively. If we don't stick to the plan, the cost in terms of lives and livelihoods, as we're hearing right now, 
will be unacceptably high. Jobs will be lost, businesses will close. I'm, I'm pleased that you think that's funny, Senator. I really do. I think that's outrageous. The debt burden will rise and the well-being of Australians will suffer. Vaccines, Mr President, are the path to safety and living order. with the virus into the future. Order. Order on my left. Order. Senator McAllister. Senator McAllister. Senator Watt. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a supplementary question. How is the Liberal and National Government strengthening the skilled workforce in aged care to help protect older Australians Order. through Sorry, Senator, and Senator beyond? Brockman, I'm going to, Senator Brock, I have repeatedly asked for silence during questions. If the opposition expects the courtesy, it should give the same to the government and vice versa. Senator Brockman, you can start the question again. I couldn't hear it. Obviously touched a sore point over there, Mr does, President. Just to the question, how, Senator Brockman. How is the Liberal and Nationals government strengthening the skilled workforce in aged care to help protect older Australians through and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic? Good question. Senator Colbeck. Thank Senator you. Watt, take a breath. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. <laughs> I'm pleased Polly. to report that the vaccination rate of our workforce who care for our most vulnerable Australians is climbing each and every day. And 78 per cent of the aged care workforce in residential care have had at least one dose of the vaccine. National Cabinet agreed that the COVID-19 vaccination of residential workers will become mandatory by mid-September. The Department of Health has been working with each residential aged care facility to ensure they have plans in place and provide support where needed to ensure every residential aged care worker has access to COVID-19 vaccination. Mr. President. There are a number of channels open to them to get vaccinated, including the government's inreach services, vaccination of their own staff and using the Commonwealth and state vaccination clinics, GPs and around 3,000 pharmacies across the country. Mr. President, we are determined to get this done. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What other measures, including rapid antigen testing, is the government introducing to further protect communities across Australia? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And a very important question. Mr. President, the Australian government is making rapid antigen testing kits available to residential aged care, home care services delivered through the Commonwealth Home and Services delivered through the Commonwealth Home Support Program in high-risk local government areas of concern across Sydney and Western New South Wales. Rapid antigen testing, Mr. President, is not an alternative. To vaccination, but it does provide an extra layer of defence in Order. that it helps to detect COVID-19 in people without any symptoms of COVID-19. Applications are open and remain open, Mr. President, to receive rapid antigen test kits. To date, orders have been dispatched Order. to 128 sites in Sydney and New South Wales. Kits will be distributed under the national medical stockpile arrangements. Mr. President, the TGA has published guidance, including a checklist to help businesses with the implementation of COVID-19 rapid, rapid antigen point-of-care testing in their workforce. Order. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Today there are close to 70 COVID-19 cases in Wilcannia. And tragically, it was reported yesterday that a First Nations man died from COVID-19 in Dubbo. New South Wales Deputy Premier Nationals MP John Barillaro has said today, and I quote, We know that the federal government's vaccination program at the start of the year identified Indigenous communities as part of the 1A rollout, and it hadn't occurred. And that's something that they lost attention of. And we know earlier in the year the rollout wasn't anywhere where it needed to be. Why did the Morrison-Joyce government lose attention and fail to ensure these communities were vaccinated as planned many months ago? Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and can I say um, we all uh, join with um, others in the chamber in respect of the unfortunate passing of the uh, Indigenous person in, um, in Wilcannia, Order. Mr President, but can I say uh, the Senator is completely incorrect with respect to characterisation of the work that's been done in that community. Order. And Senator Watt. Oh, sorry, Senator O'Neill, I hope it's a point of order and not attempt to restate the question. Uh, 
Your wish is my command, Mr. President. Thank you. So, um, can I just say that? No, I don't want to restate the question, but uh, what, the, 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 the minister order? has the point of order is is really a, that he said to work outside the standing orders in terms of attributing to me a quote that well, was Senator, from Senator Minister Barrow. Senator O'Neill, there was no breach of the standing orders. Um, there's a time to debate the answer to questions after question time, where people's satisfaction or otherwise with answers can be attended to then. Senator Colbeck to continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the, the, the government, Commonwealth Government, um, through a GP respiratory led clinic, uh, has had a presence um, through Marai Ma in Wilcannia since May of 2020. Since what, May Watt. of 2020, Mr. President. Um, Mar Marai Ma transitioned to become a Commonwealth vaccination clinic, Mr President, on the 22nd of March this year, so very early in the vaccine rollout. Uh, so so, so it, trans Order. it transitioned into uh, a, a vaccination clinic on the 22nd of March, offering AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, and then started administering Pfizer vaccine on the 11th of June, Mr President, so well before. This Order. outbreak occurred, Mr. President. Well, if you're, if, so, Senator, if you are talking down, if you are talking down AstraZeneca, Senator, you Order. ought to be ashamed of yourself, Senator. If you are talking down AstraZeneca, which is what you're doing by your statements, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, Mr. President, because the medical Order. advice, Mr. President, the medical advice Order. is that the best vaccine for you is the one that you can get today, Mr. President, and that vaccine's been available in this community, Mr. Order. President, since March of this year. Since March of this year, in Senator line with our commitment Senator to Keneally. prioritise Indigenous Senator communities, Polly. Mr. President. So, if, well, sen if, 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 the, if, if the good senator wants to continue to downplay, order, Senator or Colbeck, talk time to, for uh, the answer has expired. Order. At least while I'm calling the chamber to order, can a little respect for the rules be shown? Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Senator Keneally, Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Mr. Barillaro, and it is Mr. Barillaro who said, and I quote. Should they have been vaccinated earlier? Yes. It was all part of the federal government's rollout of the vaccination program at the start of the year, and it didn't occur. Why didn't this occur? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, as I've just indicated, Order. Mr. Barillaro in that context is completely wrong because there was a there was a Order. there was a, an AstraZeneca clinic out Senator Watt and Will Kenya, Mr. President. Out in Wilcannia from the 22nd Senator of Colbeck, March this please year. Resume your seat. I'm going to insist that when I call individual senators to order, they stay silent for a little while, because I can't hear the answer. And I have numerous complaints from those attending remotely that, with the volume in the chamber, they can't hear the answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. AstraZeneca was available in that community from the 22nd of March this year in line with our commitment under the national plan. Pfizer was available in that community from the 11th of June this year, Mr President. So the vaccines have been available in those communities, Mr President. Uh, as we said we would do and we continue to ramp up the vaccination rollout, Mr President, and as the circumstances, and as the circumstances in those communities have changed, Mr President, we have added additional support. We have the Royal Flying Doctor Service out there working with us. We have the Defence Force working out there, uh, providing additional vaccination clinics, Mr. President. So we have continued to support those communities, and we will continue to do so. Order, Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Tragically, it was reported yesterday that a man in Dubbo was the first Indigenous person to die from COVID in Australia. Health authorities said he wasn't vaccinated. He should have been vaccinated months ago. How has the Morrison-Joyce government failed so badly to protect vulnerable First Nation people from COVID? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and as uh, Senator Birmingham indicated earlier in the day, uh, the vaccination rates uh, we're quite a have, we're, have acknowledged that the vaccination rates um, need to increase, Mr President, as of today. 
216,724 Indigenous peoples, or 30 per cent, 37 per cent have had their first dose. 20.5 per cent, or 118,886, have had their second, Mr. President. The numbers aren't high enough. We need to continue to work on this, and we've done that through a number of programs, Mr. President. We have sought out uh, influences to support vaccination into those communities. Unfortunately, Mr. President, there have been some very unfortunate, very unfortunate, but influential voices who have Order, been anti-vaccine in some of those communities. We have to turn those attitudes around, and we will continue to do that in support of getting Senator particularly Indigenous Australians vaccinated, but all Order. vaccinations, because we know that that's our path Order, through, the, Senator through Colbeck. the pandemic. Sen Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on the National Summit on Women's Safety and how the summit will be delivered in light of the current COVID-19 restrictions? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Chandler for her question. Well, the National Summit on Women's Safety is an absolutely critical step in the development of the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. It will be an ambitious blueprint to stop the scourge that is family, domestic and sexual violence in Australia. The plan will respond to urgent new issues that we are facing today and build a base for emerging and evolving issues into the future. I'm pleased to advise the Senate that the summit will be held next Monday and Tuesday, the 6th and 7th of September, in virtual format. Through an online platform, it will bring together experts, survivors, advocates and service providers from locations all around Australia. Panels and presentations will be live streamed uh, to enable um, Australians to engage in this very important milestone in our work towards developing the next national plan. The summit will uh, cover a very, very broad range of issues, uh, including things such as economic security and financial independence, e-safety, perpetrator interventions and responding to sexual violence, to name but a few. It's the culmination of extensive consultations and will allow a diverse range of delegates to build a foundation in shaping our next national plan. Importantly, the summit is an opportunity to put a spotlight on our shared commitment to create a future where women and children live free from violence. We are absolutely committed to work towards a towards zero target to ensure all Australians are safe in their home, at work and safe in our communities. The live stream will be available to watch on the 6th and 7th of September via womenssafetysummit.com.au. I encourage absolutely everybody who wants to have their say on the next national plan to engage with this very, very important milestone. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how will you be engaging with people across the sector throughout the summit? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, hearing from the diverse groups in our community is absolutely crucial to ensure our next national plan is the best possible plan it can be. And that's why our consultation process is extensive and involves hearing from victim survivors, from advocates, service providers, and other experts in this field. For maximum reach, we are using a, a range of medium, including public survey, the recent parliamentary inquiry, targeted workshops and interviews with key stakeholders through the up-and-coming National uh, Summit for Women's Safety. Through the summit, panels uh, are being held to bring together a cross-section of views from survivors, the service sector, academics and other experts to discuss existing issues and to delve into the new and emerging issues that we are already starting to see. So, to ensure that all Australians are able to contribute to this important national conversation, consultations have been extended through a new survey available to all members of the public and will be available on DSS Engage until 15 September. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How else is the Liberal and Nationals government continuing to work towards the commitment to end violence against women and their children in the transition to the next national plan to reduce violence against women and their children? Senator Rustin. Well, this week I announced that we're committing $4.2 million to a trial, a new domestic violence deterrence program, as part of our commitment to end violence against women and their children, which is part of the government's $1.1 billion women's safety package. Early interventions are absolutely essential if we are to reduce violence, and that's why perpetrator programs are such an important part of our response. 
It is absolutely unacceptable that in Australia around 50 per cent of perpetrators will commit a further domestic violence offence within four years of their initial offence. The Coordinated Enforcement and Support to Eliminate Domestic Violence Program aims to deter perpetrators from reoffending through overt monitoring and clear consequences for re repeat offending behaviours. The program will be delivered by the Australian Institute of Criminology, working in close contact with the state and territory police forces. This program has been highly successful in the US by holding offenders to account for their behaviour. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Senator, rapid antigen testing kits for COVID-19 are going to be Sorry, effective. Senator like Lambie, the... I'll, I'll let you start the clock again, but you, we just, you just dropped out a bit after I got the direction to Senator Colbeck. Could you start the question again, please? Uh, okay, Mr. President, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Um, Senator Colbert, rapid antigen testing kits for COVID-19 are going to be a fact of life for many of us in the next stage of this pandemic. From Monday, unvaccinated people in Sydney will need to take them before they can go to work. I reckon a lot of us will be going the same way eventually. The tests aren't as accurate as lab tests, but they give you a quick answer in 20 minutes and they're just a swab up the nose. Easy enough to do on your own. Senator, does your government understand how important rapid tests will be for us in the next few months? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Lambie, for the question. Um, I think it's an important one. Uh, Mr President, there are, I think, over 20 different types of rapid antigen tests that are approved for use in Australia through the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, a lot of businesses are already looking at their utilisation as part of the way that they manage uh, and protect themselves and their workforce from COVID-19 as we go forward. As you might have heard, uh, earlier in question time today, I indicated that we uh, have commenced a process of rolling out rapid antigen tests uh, from the national stockpile to aged care providers in um, metropolitan Sydney and also in regional areas of New South Wales where COVID is uh, a concern because it is uh, a simple way to get some indication in short time frame of whether or not uh, there is um, a, a worker uh, who might have uh, an infection of COVID-19, Mr President. Senator Lambie, you're right when you mention in your question uh, that they don't have the same efficacy as a um, uh, one of the standard tests that's being used, the PCR test that's being utilised uh, more broadly across the community, uh, but I think they can and will play a role in the management of COVID-19. That's why we're rolling them out through uh, residential aged care, because you can get an indication of somebody who might ha be carrying the virus before they go to work, and that's why business and industry are utilising them uh, already, Mr President. Uh, well, uh, and so even someone who's vaccinated can be transmitting the virus and carrying the virus, and so these provide an additional layer of protection uh, to us all as part of our management of COVID-19. Uh, so as I said, there are over 20 different types of uh, uh, rapid antigen tests that are currently Order. approved Colbeck, with very good time guidelines the on the TGA has website. Expired. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator, in the United Kingdom, you can pick up a rapid test for free from any pharmacy. You can take it home and get an answer in 20 minutes. But for some reason in Australia, we can only do the test if we're supervised by a trained health official and we have to pay for it ourselves. Is there a reason that the coalition doesn't trust Australians to chuck a swab up our nose? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and again, it's an important question. Uh, because one of the things that's a very important part of our overall management of COVID-19 is our test, track and trace capabilities. Our test, track and trace capabilities, Mr President. Uh, we saw that in Victoria last year, how important it was. Uh, we see what's happening in other jurisdictions around the country now, where significant effort is being undertaken by states and territories across the country in their testing regimes, their tracking and tracing, and then isolation of the virus. So they all play a very important part in that process. 
You order. made a point yourself, Mr. Uh, Senator Lambie, when you talked about the fact that these tests aren't as accurate as the PCR tests that we're using in that broader process. So we support the use of these tests under the conditions of approval by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, Mr. President, supported by the backup of a PCR test if there's an indicator, Mr. President, which is very important. Order. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, you and I uh, know that I don't always agree with big business lobbyists, but today in his Willix, the head of the Australian Industry Group called on the government to pay for rapid tests when their government mandated, like in New South Wales. He says that forcing employers to pay for tests so they can get their workers on site is putting a tax on jobs. I reckon he's right. Why are we so far behind once again? And when will free rapid tests be available for every worker who needs one? Senator Colbeck. Uh, well, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Lambie. Um, and in, in high-risk occupations, Mr. President, in high-risk areas, we are actually doing that. As I've indicated, we are supporting res residential aged care providers in New South Wales with the provision of rapid antigen tests uh, into those facilities, and over 120 facilities uh, have already received tests and have started the process, Mr. President. So, in the circumstances where it is warranted, Mr. President, we're already uh, providing that level of support, which I think is important, and we'll continue to do that. An extra layer of protection for those businesses where we're looking after our most vulnerable, Mr. President. Uh, uh, I saw in, uh, in Tokyo over 600,000 tests of rapid antigen type. Uh, applied through the Olympic Games to support the running of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, Mr. President. So they can form an important part of the overall management uh, and uh, uh, testing regime that occurs in the country, Mr. President. But they need to be supported by the efficacy of a PCR test. Order, Senator McCarthy. Sorry, we're not hearing you, Senator McCarthy. I know I've got a reserve here for you. I'll give you another chance. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I referred to reports the First Nations woman was turned away with COVID-19 with breathing difficulties from Wilcannia Medical Service last week. Barkindji woman Monica Kerwin Wyman said the woman was left outside like a dog and has pleaded, and I quote, somebody, anybody, get this out there. This is what's going on in Wilcannia, and I'm crying, I'm tired, and nobody's helping us. Minister, why has the Morrison government abandoned First Nations people in Wilcannia? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I would be very concerned if any person, any Australian, was Order turned away. What? Was turned away from a health service when they were in need. That should not be occurring. Simply should not happen, Mr. President. Uh, I don't accept uh, Senator McCarthy's characterisation that we have in any way abandoned Order. Indigenous Australians, Mr. President. Uh, we we established we established very early on in the pandemic. In fact, in March, beginning of March last year, uh, a national strategy. National strategy. Uh, an advisory group on COVID-19 back on the 5th of March in 2020, Mr. President. Uh, there was a national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander management plan for novel, novel coronavirus approved uh, on Senator the 26th McAllister. of March last year, Mr. President. And the implementation of that plan um, for the vaccine program uh, and Torres Strait Islander people was finalised on the 9th of March this year, Mr. President. So, we have prioritised Australian, Indigenous Australians as a part of the program. We have supplied vaccines, as I have already indicated, Order. to the chamber today, Mr. President. Uh, the circumstances of the Indigenous woman that's been described by Senator McCarthy should not have happened. Australians should be able to access health services. Order. They should be able to access health services when they need them, Mr. President. They Mr. President, uh, we will continue the work that we are doing with the RFDS, the Defence Force, the Archos, all the Indigenous health services around the country who are supporting their own people in managing the pandemic, through, whether it be through providing vaccines, uh, as many of them are doing, Mr. President, or providing health services. Uh, and we will continue to support them in doing that. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. 
The CEO of the Northern Territory Aboriginal Medical Services, John Patterson, has warned, and I quote, the targets suggested of 70 or 80 per cent vaccination are totally fraudulent if applied to remote Australia. They would totally fail our people. How many First Nations Australians, Minister, will be fully vaccinated when Australia reaches the 70 and 80 per cent targets for Australians aged over 16? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I would hope that, all, uh, that the uh, Indigenous, the indigenous vaccination rate, I would hope that the Indigenous vac vaccination rate is lifted to at least match, but if not better, uh, the vaccination rate for the rest of the population, Mr. President. That's what, that's what we would like to see, Mr. President. I have acknowledged here today, Mr. President, I have already acknowledged Order. here in the chamber today uh, that uh, the vaccination numbers are not high enough. We can need to continue to work to lift those numbers, working with the Indigenous communities, with the First Nations people, with influences of those First Nations people to encourage Indigenous Australians to take up a vaccine. Mr. Order, President. Senator Colbeck. I have Senator Keneally on a point of order. Senator Keneally. It is a point of relevance. It was a very um, tightly worded question how many First Nations Australians will be fully vaccinated when we hit 70 80 per cent. I that, invite that, that the minister question, to Senator either Keneally, answer you are, it or are, take you it are, on notice. You are going beyond an issue of direct relevance and asking me to instruct the minister how to answer a question. When he's talking about this subject material, he is being very rele directly relevant to a very specific question. Senator Colbeck to continue. And Mr. President, I have actually addressed specifically the matter of the question, Mr. President. And so Senator Keneally might like to just interrupt question time as many times as you possibly can, Mr. President. Uh, and our objective is to have uh, vaccination rates equally high across the country, across all communities, because it's important and it's our path through the pandemic. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Ms Cohen Wyman also warned, and I quote, they don't have a COVID plan here, they don't have ventilators, they don't have anything, and I think they've just got body bags. Minister, given Mr Morrison has failed to deliver on his promise to vaccinate 1B priority groups by winter, does the Morrison-Joyce government regret Mr Morrison declaring the vaccine rollout is not a race? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I think the statement made uh, by that community representative is a very unfortunate one because very early in the pandemic, the thing that this government did and the, and the work that we did, particularly with the states and territories, and can I say I commend the work of the Northern Territory government and the relationship that we have with the Northern Territory government in relation to uh, providing uh, health services out through to, to communities, um, uh, uh, Mr. President, and, and across the country, Mr. President, uh, is, is extremely important. Uh, and, and we have provided significant assets and resources, including ventilators, to ensure that they were available in the circumstance that they were needed. In fact, we, we, we were able to gather so many ventilators that, we've, ventilators that we've actually been able to provide them to some of our regional neighbours who didn't have them, Mr. President. So I reject the premise that we haven't worked to put the systems in place and the relationships in place to support Order, Australians Senator through the Colbeck. health system. Senator Small. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Unlike the Labor Party, which included a retiree tax in its policy platform taken to the last election as just one part of $387 billion in taxes, can the Minister advise the Senate on the headline results from APRA's release today of the very first annual superannuation fund performance test and how this forms just part of the Morrison government's plan to not only protect but to enhance uh, the Australian's uh, uh, retirement incomes into the future. Senator Keneally and Watt, during the question, please. The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Small for his question, and a very important question it is too. In fact, it's a very important day today for all superannuation members out there and Australia's future 
retirees, because today the outcomes of the first annual performance test for My Super Products has been published on the Your Super Comparison tool on the ATO's website. Now, this performance test reveals that $56.2 billion of Australians' retirement funds is in fact invested in underperforming products, and these products are held in almost 1.1 million separate accounts. The test assessed the performance of over 80 My Super products and found that 13 of these products have underperformed, and as we predicted, it is a mixture of retail, industry and corporate funds that have underperformed. Mr President, the Morrison government is hauling performance out of the darkness and into the light, into the bright sunlight of accountability, and it will be very uncomfortable for some of those funds. But it is so important, and let me explain to you why. Because, Mr President, the Australian superannuation industry has now reached the dizzying heights of $3.3 trillion. Now that, to put it into context, is bigger than GDP. Order. It is bigger than the ASX, and it has, doubled. it has doubled in size since the coalition came to government. Senator Watt. Reports of superannuation's death have been greatly exaggerated by those opposite. Back when we came to government, we inherited a system that was riddled with flaws that meant that super wasn't delivering on its promise to the 16 million Australian workers and retirees who rely upon it. Since then, the Morrison government has been chipping away at those inefficiencies. We're eliminating unintended multiple accounts that you allowed to proliferate. We're reuniting lost and inactive and low balance accounts with their rightful owners. We've banned exit fees. We've capped fees on low balances. We've removed unnecessary insurance premiums, particularly for young people that did not need them. And we've empowered all Australians to choose their own funds, something you have Order. denied them Senator for years. Hume. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a supplementary question. In light of the fact that Australia's superannuation pool is now larger than GDP, arguably connecting Australians to their own money in superannuation has never been more important. So, how can Australians access the Your Super Comparison tool? And take up. Oh, sorry. And how has the take up of the tool been since it was launched? Or, se sorry, Senator Watt, I have repeatedly asked for silence during the question. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, at present, Australian households pay around $30 billion a year in superannuation fees. Now, to put that into context, it's actually more than the $27 billion that households spend on energy bills and the $12 billion that they spend on water bills. It's now easier than ever for Australians to ensure that they are not being ripped off by their fund with the introduction of the Your Super Comparison tool. Mr. President, more than 375,000 Australians have, in fact, already accessed the Your Super comparison tool in just the two months since it was launched. And we know that many more Australians will now use that tool to compare their super fund after those performance results were released today. Finally, superannuation members can compare apples with apples. It's Order. so simple to use. Just jump on your search engine and look up super comparison tool. Click on the ATO website Senator and you will, the next thing you know is you'll be comparing funds and you can even personalise it. Your fund, your balance through the ATO portal, through Order. the MyGov Senator website. Hume. It's Time never been the easier. Question. Answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Because the Morrison government stands for protecting, preserving and enhancing the retirement incomes of Australians, can the minister outline what the consequences will be for those funds that failed the performance test two years in a row? And what reactions has the government received from stakeholders in uh, the super sector to these important performance measures? Senator Hume. Thank you again, Mr. President. And this is an extraordinarily important question because if your superannuation fund is failing, there are very serious consequences. Funds are now required to notify their members, to notify you of their underperformance on the 27th of September this year. Funds must provide members with the details of, their your, of the your super comparison tool so that members can then consider whether a different product would better suit their needs. Mr. President, the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority has now also written to super Annuation Order. funds whose products fail or marginally pass that performance test, setting out their supervisory expectations. And this will include APRA assessing 
the credibility of funds' plans to improve their performance and to lower their fees. Importantly, products that fail the annual performance test two years in a row will be closed to new members until their performance improves. That means they will not be allowed to take on new members who will suffer from their continual underperformance. APRA have made their position clear. Trustees of the 13 products that have failed Order. the test now Senator face Hume, an important time choice. For the answer has expired. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Sheldon, O'Neill, McCarthy and myself. The situation in New South Wales today is deeply concerning. Our hospital system is groaning under the weight of the latest COVID outbreak, and there is no relief in sight. Mr Morrison had two jobs this year, roll out a vaccine and fix the leaky quarantine system, and he has monumentally failed at both, and it's Australians and their families that are left to suffer. We have seen in other countries what it looks like when a hospital system is overwhelmed by COVID. Doctors and nurses struggle to care for the skyrocketing number of patients requiring intensive care. They're ultimately forced to choose which patients receive life-saving treatment. Effectively, they must choose between who lives and who dies. This doesn't just impact those who have COVID-19, but it affects anyone suffering from a life-threatening illness and injury, as the finite resources of our healthcare system are stretched to the breaking point. It is a fate that is too difficult to contemplate for my home state, and yet we are seeing the telltale signs of a system on the brink of disaster. Last week, Westmead Hospital and Blacktown Hospital stopped accepting COVID patients, forcing paramedics to ramp up with patients on board. It's been reported that overworked Sydney ICU nurses are now sedating patients to manage what they describe as hellhole conditions. Another 1,000. 164 cases in the state today will only add to this strain. We are 18 months into this pandemic. We are six months into this vaccine rollout, and yet it's never looked more dire, and yet never has this minister looked so out of touch. Everything, according to him, is going just fine. Patting himself on the back for failing to meet the targets they set, leaving New South Wales, leaving Indigenous people, leaving aged care workers, leaving Australians behind. Remember, this is a Prime Minister who claimed that the vaccine rollout wasn't a race. And look where we are now. Like as usual with Mr Morrison, it's always somebody else's fault. Make no mistake, what we are seeing in New South Wales today is the direct result of the failures of the Morrison government. A proper hotel quarantine system would mean we didn't have leakages. But hotels are for tourists. They're not for quarantine. And under Mr. Morrison, we have seen 27 leakages, which have led to illness and death across the country. The outbreak that we are currently experiencing in New South Wales was something that Jane Halton warned the Prime Minister about last year, the transport system, a leak in the quarantine system. And by the way, the 27 leaks I'm talking about doesn't even include the Ruby Princess debacle, which we heard this week the Inspector General of Biosecurity said was a failure of federal officials, agriculture department officials, who didn't check the traveler with illness checklists, didn't review the ship medical logs, and didn't warn New South Wales Health that COVID was rampant on the Ruby Princess, meaning they failed to stop the one boat that mattered. If we had a proper vaccine rollout, we'd have a safe and speedy rollout of jabs in arms. Remember, four million of us were supposed to be vaccinated by, the, by May. Ten million, all of us were supposed to be vaccinated by October. That's not going to happen. It is always too little, too late. It is vulnerable communities that are being left behind. 
We are now seeing doctors like Dr. P Peter Malouf in New South Wales labelling the vaccine rollout in Indigenous communities a chaotic crisis. The Morrison government's response to COVID-19 must be seen as one of the most catastrophic public policy failures of any government in the history of our nation. We have New South Wales Minister Brad Hazard pointing the finger at the federal government. We have the New South Wales Deputy Premier John Barilaro pointing the finger at the failures of the Morrison government. The problem we have here is not that people have vaccine hesitancy, it's that we have a Prime Minister who has just apathy. He's too little, too late, it's always somebody else's fault, and it's the Australian people who are being left behind to suffer the consequences. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, what we have just seen from the, uh, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition in this place uh, is exactly why the Labor Party lacked the credentials to lead this country. Uh, they, this panicked pantomime that we just saw from Senator Keneally is exactly what the Australian people do not want now at a time of difficulty and crisis. This is a very difficult time for our country. It's a very difficult time for the world to be tackling a pandemic. But what people want in a pandemic is not panic. They want calm. What people need during a pandemic is not gross exaggeration. They want us to steely and stoically deal with the situation and come up with solutions. Uh, Senator Keneally and the other Labor senators today, Madam Acting T Deputy Chair, quoted from the New South Wales government extensively in their questions, but they failed to quote the Premier on the very topic that Senator Keneally just spent her time talking about. She is in this place spreading panic through our land that somehow our hospitals within hours, within days, may be completely overcrowded and have no ability to take people. That is completely untrue. And if she was seriously looking at the statements from the New South Wales government, she would know it is untrue. But she has been cherry-picking those statements for political interests rather than providing the professional, calm leadership that is required at a time like this. Um, the Premier of New South Wales, Premier Berejiklian, was quoted, quoted just the other day. Uh, this, was, this was an article from just four days ago that uh, Premier Berejiklian said that we have been ready for additional ICU patients for a long time. We have always had these contingency plans, but what is confronting for us is when you have a network that has great staff is seeing more patients. It does stretch things, and it does mean things are done differently. That's exactly what the Australian people need. They need that calm leadership that we will respond to this, we will, we will tackle it. And I don't know if Senator Keneally has spoken to her own local health authorities. I've been in constant contact with mine in central Queensland from the start of this pandemic, and I know that, that very early on they expanded their ICU capabilities. They've always had plans in place to do that. And in fact, there was a detailed paper um, published in the Medical Journal of Australia last year which showed the ability of our great health system to respond, our fantastic health system. And that paper, a, a variety of professionals, uh, went across the country and uh, I believe they spoke to 191 different ICU units across Australia. They had, at the start of the pandemic, we had 2,378 intensive care beds. What this study found was that very quickly we could add another 4,258 intensive care beds if required, if we had to, because we have a great health system full of great health professionals. And I think Senator Keneally does our health professionals a great disservice when she seems to question their ability to respond. I have great faith in them, and what we need to focus on now is, is, is coming up with the solutions to support our health professionals, to support Australians in this pandemic, not unnecessarily panic everybody throughout the land and, and contribute or further contribute to the stress and strain that is on many Australians, especially those going through lockdown right now. We would, of course, all love to return to a place where we had zero COVID cases. It was wonderful. It was great. But we do live in the real world here. And it seems to me that Senator Keneally and her colleagues on the Labor side want to be the government of Disneyland, not the government of Australia. The only place where zero COVID cases will exist now is in a fantasy land, in a Disneyland. We are not going back to that state of affairs. That is the reality. In fact, even the Victorian Premier today has recognised that 
when he said that he will look at easing restrictions even before, before Victoria gets back to zero cases, that he will in the next few days apparently outline a, a, a st some steps where even, even with positive cases where restrictions will be eased. That is a sensible approach. But the Labor Party here are playing catch-up. They are playing catch-up. They are holding on to a fantasy that can no longer, we can no longer uh, deliver. And what our job should be as leaders, as people in this country in positions of authority, our, our job should be to level with the Australian people, to tell them the truth, uh, not to spread panic and fairy tales that will never be able to be implemented. This government is, along with the state and territory governments, is responding professionally to this crisis. We need to have a map out of this so we can let people out of their homes, let people get back to work and deal with this pandemic in the best way we can with a wonderful, the wonderful health system we have in this nation. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Deputy President. Well, when Mr Morrison decided to take a gamble on hotel quarantine and vaccines last year, he set in chain a series of events that led us to exactly where we are today. And it didn't have to be this way. A Prime Minister who was more interested in leading rather than reducing vectors of political exposure would have actually fixed our quarantine system, would have taken responsibility for securing more types and greater numbers of vaccines. Instead, we have a Prime Minister who found time to research his family tree during a trip overseas while thousands of Australians remain stranded with no way home. And the consequences of Mr Morrison's decisions are becoming clearer by the day. In the last 48 hours, we have had significant numbers of health personnel speak out, despite the fact that their employment contracts actually make this kind of personally risky for them. They choose to speak out about the pressures they are under and about their fears for the health system. These are people on the front line of the pandemic and the government should listen to them. Senator Canavan is right. A government should level with its people. Nothing about the current approach suggests to me that the government is levelling with its people because it's not willing to engage with the questions that are being raised from the very people whose daily responsibility is to protect and to care for sick people in New South Wales. Nurses, paramedics and doctors, they are blowing the whistle on the challenges ahead. And I'll quote a Sydney nurse who said this, we are exhausted. Last night was brutal. We literally hit capacity just holding on. The patients are air hungry, starving for breath. We simply don't have enough of us. We are on the edge now. We have been trying to warn the government for a year. Now, the union that represents these workers has said it's becoming increasingly concerned that Australia's public hospitals will not be able to cope with the growing demand if we allow COVID to take hold before we're truly prepared. And that's the key, isn't it? Because yes, we want to get out of lockdown, but it needs to be safe. And a safe emergence from this pandemic requires careful planning and consideration. Yesterday we heard of the tragic news of the first Indigenous COVID death in Australia, a 50-year-old man, a much-loved granduncle who got to see his grandchild just once. He wasn't vaccinated. And Aboriginal health services workers, advocates, community members have warned the government for months and months that this was a possibility, but these warnings have been ignored. The New South Wales Deputy Premier, Mr Barillaro, has said, and I quote, we know that the federal government's vaccination program at the start of the year identified Indigenous communities as part of the 1A rollout and it hasn't occurred. And that's something they lost attention of and we know earlier in the year the rollout wasn't anywhere near where it needed to be. PM promised, he promised that First Nations communities would be fully vaccinated by winter. But the reality is, is that just 8% the First Nations people in Western New South Wales are fully vaccinated. It's time to take responsibility for that and to develop a plan to remedy it. Because the government has bungled this vaccination rollout. We are a very long way away from the 70 per cent threshold or the 80 per cent threshold. Yes, people are looking for a safe pathway to resume something like normal life. People are desperate for it. 
But it all depends on having a serious plan to manage the pandemic. And frankly, Mr Morrison has bungled every opportunity presented to him to lead through this pandemic. He stood by while the crisis raged through nursing homes in Victoria, a sector that is regulated, controlled by the Commonwealth, refusing to take responsibility, shunting responsibility onto the state government. He failed to procure enough vaccines and a diverse range of contracts, and it left the Australian community dangerously exposed to Delta. Less than a quarter of Australians fully vaccinated when the second wave brutally started sweeping through our communities. And I see absolutely no sign that he's now ready to roll up his sleeves and tackle this next crisis. What he would prefer, of course, as always, is a political approach. Just pick fights with state premiers, distract, divert, wait till the news cycle moves on. Well, a pandemic doesn't move on. A pandemic doesn't move on. And real leaders do offer calm, considered leadership. It involves talking to people, not harassing them and nitpicking. It involves actually engaging the state premiers to make this, pan make this federation pandemic Thank ready. You. Senator McAllister, your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal. Uh, and, uh, I'm glad to rise today to speak to this particular issue. Um, oh, Act Acting Deputy President, sorry, uh, to speak to this issue. And in particular, uh, I'd like to uh, just remind Senator Keneally of the boats, because when the Labor Party was last in power, over 1,200 people died at sea in the boats by something that was totally brought on by the Labor Party. Now, compare that to the number of people who died with COVID, and that is only just past 1,000, and, and a lot of those had comorbidities. Uh, and I can assure you that the Morrison government didn't design COVID. Unlike the boat people, unlike the boat crisis that was designed by the Labor Party uh, and it was something that was totally self-inflicted, so it's a bit rich for them to come in here and play games and accuse the Morrison government of causing deaths, which had, you know, is basically, was basically out of their control. They, the Morrison government Australia has got one of the lowest COVID deaths uh, deaths in, in the world, and we've actually got one of the lowest case uh, fatality rates in the world. And it's worth noting that this year we've had less than 100 COVID deaths out of over 20,000 cases. That is a case fatality rate of 0.04 per cent, or four people, less than four people out of every 1,000 cases. Compare that to the number of deaths in 2019. Australia had 170,000 deaths out of 25 million people. That was a, a death rate of seven people out of a thousand. So the COVID fatality rate is just around half of the overall fatality rate. Now let's talk about the vaccine rollout. We've basically now got 86% of over 70-year-olds uh, first dosed, and over 63% of over 70-year-olds second dosed. And I get a little bit sick and tired of hearing the Labor Party talk about this AstraZeneca Pfizer uh, as though it's a competition. I mean, the fact of the matter is this: is that last August, when and when Labor loved to claim that we could have bought 40 million doses, the fact is, is that the Pfizer vaccine hadn't even been approved for safety and hadn't even been proved that it actually worked. It's a completely new technology. Interestingly enough, the World Health Organisation came out in September last year and said that it was going to take another nine months, or wouldn't be until mid 2021. Uh, until such time as the Pfizer vaccine was going to be ready. Another point to note is that the Pfizer vaccine had to be refrigerated and stored at negative 70 degrees. Now, the Morrison coalition government had to make a decision back then. They went to, with the uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine uh, as its main supplier because they could get it produced here in Australia. And they could get it produced here in Australia by none other than CSL. Now, to remind people about the history of CSL, that used to be government owned. It was actually set up in 1917 so that Australia, by the government, so that Australia would have its own, wait for it, vaccine supplies. And what happened was that the Labor Party sold CSL, and in that time since, it's now got into blood transfusion and a lot of other products, uh, but its main core business, vaccine production, has gone by the wayside. So for Labor to come in here and claim that, oh, we haven't got enough vaccines, they ought to look in the mirror because the damage was done. That, that was caused right back in 1992 by a bloke by the name of Paul Keating and one of his great advisers, Bill Botel. He's out there running around being an expert on everything. 
and yet he was one of the advisers to Keating that allowed CSL to be sold. I mean, the hypocrisy is astounding. And it should also be noted that the US hasn't, didn't even export Pfizer. The first country it exported Pfizer to was Mexico on the 29th of April. On the 29th of April. So the USA is, is exporting very few vac uh, Pfizer vaccines, and that seems to be overlooked in all of this, is that it's not that easy to just go and conjure 50-odd uh, you know, million uh, Pfizer vaccines at the drop of a hat, keep them stored uh, at negative 70 degrees and get them rolled out. But can I say that we, the, the vaccination program is well and truly on its way, and it hasn't been helped, of course, by you know, Queensland's chief health officer, who's been there under a Labor government, who's been basically talking people out of getting the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. Uh, having, all the while, while she's saying this, she's failed to disclose that her own husband used to work and consult to Pfizer. Now, if that's not a conflict of interest, I don't know what is. But can I say that that type of behaviour, while we're trying to encourage vaccine rollouts, hasn't helped anyone? So it's about time Labor got on board and started to work for the interests of the Australian people rather than whinging and wailing. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Well, that was quite mind boggling. Um, you know, quite clearly, when we first got into this vaccines, we decided there was a clear indication there was a necessity to have a whole series of vaccines purchased on order so that those that failed, those that didn't follow through, that we'd have enough for the Australian community. And of course, the time has proven it. Pfizer told them, epidemiologists told the government, uh, Pfizer told the government in, in direct conversations and indirect conversations. And yet the government still has failed to turn around and take responsibility for its mistake. And not, not because we're looking back, I'm looking backwards. I'm looking forwards. If they won't take account for what they're doing wrong right now, how can people have the confidence necessary of this being appropriately dealt with in the future? Now, today we have another 1,164 new local COVID-19 cases here in New South Wales. We have 871 in hospital and 143 in intensive care. People are suffering from the mental toll of months of lockdown and small businesses are suffering dire economic hardship. It's important to remember that the reason we are in this situation is because the Prime Minister failed in his two most important jobs, to get the vaccine rollout right and to get a dedicated quarantine system up and running. And of course, we saw with the Bondi outbreak with the limo driver driving international flight crew, that there was not appropriate safeguards at our border. That is a federal government responsibility. And yet we hear repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly from the government that they should not be held to account for the mistakes and the failings that they have made and the ones they continue to make. Now, the health system is already a breaking point before the Prime Minister's national plan, which would now be based on Doherty modelling will put tens of thousands more Australians in hospital. Without any plan for how our medical system can handle that pressure, any serious plan about a way of moving forward. This rollout is quite clearly a failure. And now the failure and the government needs to take responsibility. Not enough Pfizer, delays, New South Wales Health Minister making it clear and blowing the whistle on the silence of the federal government and their incompetence about Pfizer. And of course, the moment of truth, respond to a quote from an experienced respiratory physician at Western Sydney to Senator Colbeck. Yeah, we're, and I'll, I'll repeat this because you know, I'm hoping that, uh, that those listening to the Senate will just be so outraged as I am that this question was not answered. With the coming deluge of cases, it is possible ambulances will not reach people suffering heart attacks or strokes as quickly as they should, said a Western Sydney doctor. I mean, quite clearly, the government needs to take responsibility and be able to deal appropriately and fitting in, in a fit way the sorts of pressures that are applying at the moment on our health system. Now, you know, of course, you don't you have to sort of um, have too much of an imagination because 
You've got the government turning around saying it's not a race. You don't have too much imagination that we're in a crisis. So the government says it's not a race. You can't have too much imagination about the fact that we've got so many people that are now suffering from COVID and the effect on business. But of course, it wasn't a race. Now, this government continues to try to distract people, distracting them by saying the failure is the opposition. This is just ironic. The failure is the opposition by raising the government's mistruths and failures. That is absolutely ludicrous. Take responsibility. I know the Prime Minister won't do it. I'd say this to the ministers. Take responsibility and to the government. New South Wales, of course, along with those pressures on services, we've seen staff shortages, hospitals reaching out to ICU capacity, reaching out ICU capacity, an increased sedation of ICU patients in order to manage the burgeoning work life in the New South Wales COVID system. In 60,000 aged care workers are still not vaccinated. Don't be alarmed. Well, I wish you were more alarmed. I wish you actually thought it was a race. It is a race to vaccinate the dead, by the deadline 60,000 aged care workers. I think it's appropriately said by Health uh, Services Union National President Jared Hayes, said the Aged Care Royal Commission found in March the sector was facing a staffing crisis by risk being Order, exacerbated Senator by the pandemic. Sheldon, um, the question is the motion moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise to take note of the answer by Senator Birmingham to uh, Senator Thorpe's question on vaccination rates for First Nations peoples, but particularly focused on Wilcannia in Western New South Wales. And the minister would not answer the question, which was, when will all First Nations peoples be vaccinated? When? And he danced around and he danced around, but he wouldn't say because he can't say because the rollout for First Nations communities has been dismal. It is unconscionable. First Nations peoples were either in phase 1A or phase 1B. Supposed to have been vaccinated by now. And yet here we see a man in Wilcannia passing away due to COVID. A First Nations man passing away when the government knew if COVID got into First Nations communities, it would have a devastating impact. In fact, if you look at the timeline, in March last year, Miramar Aboriginal Health Corporation wrote to the Morrison government warning about COVID-19 outbreaks in Western New South Wales. In July this year, Nacho was excluded from the National COVID-19 Vaccination Task Force meeting how did that happen when everybody in Australia knows that First Nations communities are, such a, are at such significant risk? How did it happen? We've had elders calling for vaccine supplies. Nurse, this is in August 18 for nurses to support Aboriginal medical services and appropriate accommodation so people could quarantine. And what does the government do? It sends in the army and the police. In the letter that was written from the, Maramar, from the Maramar Aboriginal Health Corporation, they warned about the great risk because of overcrowded housing, food insecurity, highly mobile population, low health literacy and issues around poorer health and chronic diseases. All the things the government, I'm sure, knew about it. But they reminded the government about it to put it high on the agenda. And what do we see now? The situation, the disaster that's happening in Western New South Wales. It is unconscionable that the Prime Minister has overseen this happening and they override First Nations wishes. We should have First Nations peoples making these decisions. Nacho is very clear in providing the advice. The Aboriginal health organisations are very clear that they need to be in the driving seat here because First Nations peoples have and must have self-determination and control over this program. I'm told that First Nations peoples are laughing at the messaging. It is so poor. Well, you know how you make sure you get it right? Is you put it in the hands of First Nations organisations. It's not as if they haven't got their own media hubs. Many communities, in fact, have their own media hubs, and they know how to communicate to their own community. Get 
enable them to do it, enable communities to take control of the decision making. But what have they done? Excluded, excluded Nacho from crucial meetings. And what targets are they going back to Senator Birmingham's non-answer on targets? Or when, when will we see all First Nations peoples vaccinated? Now, Nacho is calling for 100 per cent vaccination of First Nations peoples, or, or as close as you can, you can get, acknowledging that some people can't, due to health reasons, have a vaccination. But we need to make sure we're aiming for 100 per cent. When will we see that happen? This government, the minister representing the Prime Minister, could not answer that question. When? We know. We know that First Nations people are so at risk. So when, so when Marama wrote to the government, they suggested accommodations such as motels and caravan parks could be used for quarantining. They saw the need for this. They saw in March last year the urgent need for these sorts of things to take place, knowing very well that we needed to make sure that there were safe places for people to go because of the overcrowding. And I won't take up the rest of the time talking about the appalling state of housing for First Nations peoples, because Australia knows that. We also need to, so they also suggested ways to safeguard against food shortages, and we're hearing about that. We're hearing that people can't go out and make sure that they're being able to be adequately uh, fed. We now see Wilcannia has the highest transmission rate in New South Wales. Shame on the New South Wales government and shame on the Morrison government that it's got to this point. They knew this could happen, and unfortunately it is now. It's a travesty that this is occurring to First Nations communities and to Will Kenya. The question is the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Rustin. Uh, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraph 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the following bills, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. National Health Amendment COVID-19 Bill 2021, National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Bill 2021, Paid Parental Leave COVID-19 Work Test Bill 2021 and Treasury Laws Amendment uh, 2021 Measures No. 6 Bill 2021. I also table statements of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? <coughs> it is. If there are other, no other notices of motion, I shall proceed to the placing of business. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. If that leave of absence be granted to the following senators from the 30th of August to the 2nd of September 2021, Senators Antic, Birmingham, Fawcett, Griff, McLaughlin, McMahon, Patterson and Patrick for personal reasons, Senators Abetz, Dunningham, Ferravanti, Wells, Hanson, Henderson, Lambie, MacDonald, McGrath and Roberts because of COVID-19 travel restrictions and Senator Molan for medical reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Wong, Katie Gallagher, Shikoni, Kitching, Billick, Sheldon, Ayres, Dodson, McCarthy, Mariel Smith, Chisholm, Stirl, Walsh, Farrell and Green for 30th of August to 2nd of September for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, it is. Senator Seward. I move that leave of absence be granted for the following senators. Senators Waters, Rice, Thorpe, Wish Wilson, Akim, Steelejohn and Faruqi from the 30th of August to 2nd September for COVID-related reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. There are no others. I'll call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Mr. President, a postponement notification has been lodged in respect to all business of the Senate. Notice of motion number one for today postponed to the 1st of September 2021. I've got no notifications for committee extensions. Uh, the, that question may be put if requested by any senator. 
There being none, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business and I'll go through them in the order on the notice paper. Matter number 1231, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Mr President. On behalf of Senator Kitching, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1231 be taken as a formal Is motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move Urquhart. the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Number 1232, Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Mr President. On behalf of Senator Dodson, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1232 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government will supply this data within the available constraints of collected data sets and privacy considerations. Further, the Department of Health releases over a thousand data points on the vaccine rollout daily, which can be found on their website. The question is that motion number 1232 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young, number 1233. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1233, proposing an introduction of the bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the law relating to the environment and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. I present the bill and move that this bill may now proceed without formalities and be read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. An act to amend the law relating to the environment and for related purposes. Senator Hanson Young. I move that the bill may now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, it is. Senator Hanson Young. I table an explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have my second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, it is. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Seawitt, number 1234. Thank you. I ask that general business motion number 1234 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawitt. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government will supply requested data within the available constraints of collected data and privacy considerations, as well as the extremely short time frame nominated. Further, the Department of Health releases over a thousand data points on the vaccine rollout daily, which can be found on their website. The question is: that Motion number one two three four be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. One, two, three, five. Are you moving that on behalf of Senator Waters, Senator Seward? Yes, I am. On behalf of Senator Waters, I ask that just general business notice of motion number one, two, three, five be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The Australian government is not in possession of these documents. The Energy Security Board is structurally independent of government and, under its terms of reference, only undertakes work at the direction of all energy ministers. The ESB's advice on the national electricity market post-2025 market design is the culmination of two years' work and extensive consultation. Their proposed reforms have been warmly welcomed, including by the Australian Workers' Union and the CFMEU Mining and Energy Division. The AWU has said that making the ESB's recommendations law is critical to securing Australia's manufacturing sector. The ESB estimates that these reforms could save consumers $1.3 billion. The question is that motion number 1235 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Seward, the last matter is number one. Or Senator Seward. President, Seawitt. obviously we support our own motion. Yes. For the Senator Urquhart. Labor also supported that motion. Yes, so recorded. No one else seeking my attention on the screen. I'll now come to the last matter, number 1236, Senator Seward. On behalf of Senator Waters, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1236 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. 
The Energy Security Board works in close collaboration with the energy ministers of all jurisdictions in the NEM, and the integrity of its processes underpin Commonwealth-state relations. The Energy Security Board is structurally independent of all governments. Under its terms of reference, the Energy Security Board only undertakes work at the direction of all ministers. The Energy Security Board's terms of reference prevent it from conducting work or reporting to a specific minister or jurisdiction. The Australian government has no awareness of private staff engaged by the Energy Security Board to work on their task projects. Internal matters of that nature are handled by the Energy Security Board. The question is that motion number 1236 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1236 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes, and Senator Smith, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 12. The votes being equal, the question is therefore resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I'll allow people to leave the chamber or resume their seats before I commence the MPI. I have received the following letter from Senator Pratt. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The reported views of members of the New South Wales Liberal Government, including that they consider Mr Morrison to be the Prime Minister for Mr Morrison and no one else. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, this afternoon for the MPI, we of course debate the reported views of members of the New South Wales Liberal Party, including that they see the Prime Minister to be the Prime Minister for Morrison and no one else. The Prime Minister for himself. Well, what a divided bunch the Liberal Party is. All of us here already knew that, frankly. We've all been around this building and seen some of the bickering and side glances, but who would have thought the, Prime Minister, the Premier of the State of New South Wales, a stalwart in the, New South, in the Liberal Party and in the New South Wales Liberal Party, just like the Prime Minister, who would have thought the New South Wales Premier would be in open revolt? Of course, there is very apparently mutiny in the ranks. The Sydney Morning Herald on the 28th of August published a piece entitled Even Gladys Berejiklian is fed up with the Prime Minister, who she privately regards as evil and a bully. And I must say, when I heard that, even I was taken aback. After all, I had said just last week, I had said the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister for New South Wales. But frankly, not even the Premier of New South Wales wants him as their Prime Minister. It is no surprise to hear someone calling the Prime Minister a bully. It's almost synonymous with his name at this point in terms of the many debates we've had in this place regarding his character. But evil, that is something quite new. And here it is coming from one of the most senior Liberals in Australia. The Premier of Australia's largest state. And I find that damning and I find it very worrying. The nation should be worried that senior Liberals describe their leader of their party and the leader of the government in this way. Because it's all very well, yes, we take it with a pinch of salt when the opposition rails against the policies of a government when it rails against the decisions of a government and when we rail against the incompetence of this government. But for our Prime Minister's character to be impugned in this way in public debate and on the public record, well, yes, our country should be worried. We've heard the phrase from all over the country in the last year that the Prime Minister is Prime Minister for Sydney, New South Wales and nowhere else. Doesn't care about South Australians, Victorians or 
Indeed, he called Queenslanders and Western Australians cave people. But now we're told by the Sydney Morning Herald that among Premier Berejiklian's inner circle, the Prime Minister is considered a joke. And it's a joke to consider the Prime Minister the Prime Minister for New South Wales, because New South Wales, in the inner circles, certainly doesn't regard him that way. They regard him as the Prime Minister for Morrison and for no one else. But let's break down why the Liberal Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, may think the Liberal Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, is evil. We're told a few weeks ago the Prime Minister's press office phoned political reporters backgrounding against Premier Berejiklian to try and push the pressure of a failing vaccination rate onto New South Wales, backgrounding against members of his own team. Our Prime Minister has certainly been feeling the heat because he and his government had failed to fulfil one of the two most crucial jobs they've had that, this year, and that is costing Australian lives, and that job was vaccination and quarantine. But like every other time, our nation's Prime Minister has been put under pressure and held accountable. He crumbles and tries to shift the blame onto others. It's utterly pathetic. It's a low political tactic employed by those who can't stand behind their decisions and the consequences of this de these decisions. And it is a tactic that our Prime Minister has employed over and over again to background against people, to undermine them uh, and impugn their character. So maybe the Prime Minister Morrison's attempt to to shift blame onto Premier Berejiklian for the failed vaccination rollout is one reason Premier Berejiklian might have for calling the Prime Minister evil. Senator Pratt, I understand that you are make, uh, quoting someone, but uh, the president has ruled that we be careful of unparliamentary language, even if we are quoting documents. So I, I remind you of the president's ruling. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is not the first time the Prime Minister's staff have been accused of backgrounding against the Premier Berejiklian or many other people. Indeed, they were seen to be backgrounding against the Premier during the horrific New South Wales bushfires some two years ago, and I think this is utterly shameless. We even have a quote from one of the Premier Berejiklian's loyalists saying usually he briefs against her for doing her job with some measure of competence. But they went on to say he doesn't like the contrast. He makes himself look big by trying to make others look small. And these are the actions of every awful male manager you have ever had shirking responsibility, pushing the blame onto others, and trying to steal the success of others who are just trying to competently do their own job. And I have to say, perhaps this is why, uh, and this awful relationship management, perhaps this is why Queensland Premier Palaszczuk decided to dump Morrison's failed hotel quarantine system and instead build dedicated cabin facilities. And Queensland needs to go ahead and do it because the Prime Minister wouldn't take responsibility for it. They didn't go through Prime Minister Morrison, and I guess this may be the same reason as for Premier Berejiklian. If it all works, then the Prime Minister will walk away with the glory it's the PM's doing. If it fails, without a doubt, our Prime Minister always seeks to blame someone else, the premiers of the states. This is completely unacceptable behaviour for a national leader. And I have to say, I can only assume that those senators opposite must feel a sense of shame in having to put up with this circus. 
As for Western Australia, I can tell you right now the Prime Minister is winning no friends in my home state. Alongside the outrageous cave people comment from the last week, now we have the Prime Minister undermining Premier McGowan. The Premier has been doing his best to keep Australians safe and healthy, undermined by a two-bit Prime Minister who's trying to deflect the blame. We are witnessing before our eyes the breakdown of the national cabinet system, and it is the Prime Minister's fault. He can't run from this one, and he can't shift the blame. New South Wales thinks the Prime Minister is, and I can't quote, but we've heard it in the news, Queensland is just getting on with the job without him, and WA is doing its utter best to keep West Australians safe in the face of a Prime Minister who desperately wants to, to drag Western Australia into the COVID disaster gripping Australia. It is a matter of grave public interest that this Prime Minister start cooperating with the states and working in the interests of all Australians. And this should mean no more backgrounding when the going gets tough. No more blaming and blame shifting from the Prime Minister and from those in the top job and around him. No seeking glory when it is undeserved. And no more undermining of premiers like Mark McGowan, who I'm proud to say has done a very good job keeping Western Australia one of the safest places in the world during this pandemic. And I know that we all face risks and that it could happen to any state at any time. But I have to say Western Australia has done more than most and more, certainly more Senator than New Hughes. South Wales Senator to Hughes. keep itself safe. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I've got to say, I thought that was a fantastic comedy sketch. I mean, it was hilarious, really. Seriously, it's really, really funny. But smears rather than substance. I mean, what else would we expect from you lot? But not, I mean, of course, from the senator from Senate, WA, Hughes, hiding in those senator caves. Senator Hughes, through the chair, please. And Senator Pratt, could you cease interjecting? The author of today's MPI, through you, Madam Deputy Chair, hiding in those caves, under the dunas, making sure there's no COVID in WA, because thank goodness, thank goodness there's not, because the hospitals can't cope over there already. I mean, you guys are in so much trouble and you don't even have a COVID case. Can you imagine if, like the rest of Australia, COVID actually came to WA? But I mean, let's be honest, you guys couldn't cope. Because with it, I'm not sure. What do we call him now? Clown McGowan, or is it Mark S McMoron, Senate, the Senator, Premier of Se New South Senator Hughes, through the chair, and also, can you withdraw your, your the way that you address Premier McGowan? I withdraw. But as similar to those opposite were quoting from the newspaper earlier, I have similarly read those terms in the newspaper. And so I I'm have, not 100 per sure. Per Senator Hughes. Just so for all other people that wish to contribute, I did draw Senator Pratt's attention to the President's ruling around um, unparliamentary language and simply quoting from an article doesn't, uh, doesn't mean that you um, are excused from um, unparliamentary language, rules around unparliamentary language. So I'll ask Senator Hughes to continue. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. So I, did, I, I will read for those opposite, though, some information around the funding around WA hospitals, because this Prime Minister is for all Australians. So even when Labor state premiers fail to support their own state, the Commonwealth under this Prime Minister is there to ensure that those citizens of WA are best supported. Because what we know is that funding for hospitals in WA from the Commonwealth has increased by 72.8 per cent. Sorry, Senator Pratt's not staying to listen to this. Because over the same period, the WA government, the state government, Sen who Senator, actually was Senator responsible Hughes, for public Senator, hospitals. Senator Hughes, uh, I think Senator, <laughs> Senator Urquhart has a point of order. Point of order. Um, it is not parliamentary to reflect on someone when they're leaving the chamber. And I would ask Senator Hughes to take that into consideration. Thank you, uh, Senator Urquhart. 
the point of order is upheld. We do. Um, it is um, unparliamentary to to reflect on uh, a senator when they're if they're leaving the Senate chamber. Please continue, Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Bit feisty today. So as I was saying, over the same period. The WA state government, you know, under the Federation, those guys that are actually responsible for funding hospitals, their funding over that exact same period increased by 18 per cent. So whilst the Commonwealth has increased its funding by over 72 per cent, the WA state government, which let's face it, it's, it's pretty much on its own. I mean, you know, we know you guys weren't pretty big over there. so. Uh, no one else you can really blame. So we are now increasing the funding at approximately four times that the state government is doing. And I honestly hope for the people in WA that someone within the WA government starts to pay attention to that, because their hospitals are currently at the highest level of alert without a single case of COVID. So if people want to be concerned, I wouldn't be casting aspersions from WA about how fantastic they are when it comes to COVID and COVID management. But of course, it's the Prime Minister of all Australians even the ones who have incompetent premiers, are incapable of funding the services they're supposed to be responsible for, that the Commonwealth, through this Prime Minister, is, in is ensuring that those citizens are protected. But that isn't actually where I wanted to start today, but I just thought it was important that we sort of, sort of got a bit of clarity out there on who is actually looking after all Australians. And unlike many people in this place, I've actually known the Prime Minister personally for nearly 20 years. And he is an absolutely fantastic leader, because I got to know him when he was state director of the New South Wales Liberal Party, and that was when we were working on the 2004 campaign. And you guys, you know, those opposite might remember it through you, Chair. That was Medicare Gold. Remember that one? That was a cracker. We had the Mark Latham handshake. We had Mr. Howard being mobbed by loggers in Tasmania as they were so grateful for the support that the Howard government was giving them, as opposed to what Mr Latham was wanting to subject them to. So Mr Morrison, when he was Mr Morrison, as State Director of the New South Liberal Party, was an absolutely fantastic leader, great campaigner, fantastic campaigner, and someone who was an absolute privilege to work with. But I thought also, but I actually I would like to say it is actually because of the Prime Minister, the thought of Massaman curry just turns my stomach after that campaign. I have never seen anyone who could literally order curry every night of a six-week campaign consistently. It really is something to behold. It's probably his biggest flaw, actually, is his embracing of curry in so many flavours. But I thought for those opposite, we might have a little talk about what's actually been the achievements of this government and how they have delivered for Australians across the nation. And we know you sneer. Those opposite love to smear and sneer and carry on when the Prime Minister talks about Team Australia. Well, that's because we know those opposite aren't on it. The only team they're on is on the team of their union bosses and making sure they do exactly as they're told, not interested in helping to fight for small businesses. In fact, not even interested in large businesses. You pretend that through you, Chair, that those opposite are interested in jobs. No, no, no. You're not interested in jobs because you're only interested in jobs that the government pays for. You're not interested in jobs that are created by Australian innovation. You're not interested in jobs that are created by Australian companies. You're not interested in those businesses that employ the vast majority of Australians. And those vast majority of Australians are still connected to their workplaces, even in the current situation that we're seeing in ACT, New South Wales and Victoria. These people are still connected to their jobs, and that's because of the introduction of JobKeeper, and that kept them together, and they were there. But it was never a permanent solution, and you, those opposite were claiming we'd fall off the economic cliff, but guess what? Some people actually paid attention in economics classes, and that didn't happen. And what we've actually seen now is that we have more Australians in work than we did before the pandemic. We have more women in the workforce than we did before the pandemic started. And in fact, we're the first advanced economy to have made, reached that milestone. Faster than the US, faster than the UK. None of them can claim the same sort of economic victory over COVID that, that was experienced by Australians, all Australians, all Australians, last year, led by this Prime Minister. And it's the 
3.4 small businesses, 3.4 million small businesses that are receiving tax relief all across this country. All across the country, everyday Australians who set up their own small business, employ fellow Australians, they're being supported through tax relief. But we know you guys don't like tax relief on the, on the other side because it was all about $387 billion of taxes at the last election. And I just wonder whether, when the current opposition leader finally faces up to the member for Maribyrnong, whether or not we'll be bringing those taxes back. Because I uh, haven't heard the former opposition leader say to the current opposition leader that he's not keen to see them be reintroduced. And we know that those that sit up the further end of the chamber like to talk a lot about emissions. Now, a lot of hot air is uh, expended discussing some of these issues, but what we should be recognising, and again, this is for all, us, all Australians across the country, all Australians are now saying that emissions are at a lower level than they were, 19 per cent lower since 2005, and it's the lowest level since 1995. So emissions have been reduced to their lowest level since 1995 under this government. But this government has done it in a way by a Prime Minister who led from the front and made sure it was technology, not taxes. He didn't go out there to shut industries down. He didn't go out there to whack on every tax he could find. What we've done, though, is invested in Australians across the country, all Australians, even those ones in WA let down by the health expenditure that we know is incredibly poor and have been locked off from the rest of the country under that COVID doona. But we've also supported all Australians through schools. There is an increase from 2014 to 2021 of spending for schools has gone from $13.8 billion to $23.4 billion. That is a significant increase in expenditure in education, which is, again, I mean, for those that have read the Constitution, the responsibility of state governments. But the federal government, the Commonwealth government, led by this Prime Minister, is ensuring that every Australian is well supported, even when their premiers can't do their job. But I have a very special, special place in my heart for the Hunter. The Hunter region is absolutely booming, and I am loving every minute that I get to spend up there and can't wait until New South Wales opens up as our vaccination rates keep charging through and Premier Berejiklian will stick to those lockdowns, making sure we can ease them off as soon as we can as our vaccination rates are charging along, uh, again, unlike some of those other states hiding under the doona. But you, know, you could almost call him the PM for the hunter. I mean, he and I have been up there a couple of times together and have made significant announcements in, around investments that are going to boost that region. But not only the people of the Hunter, they are going to boost for the entire northwest of New South Wales. Now, I know those opposite don't like New South Wales. We know that. All a bit jealous of Sydney. I know we've got the harbour. It's kind of the best state, that's fine. And I say that having lived in three of them. But, you know, the Hunter region, open up the whole northwest region. We've just spent $66 million investing in Williamtown Airport, not only for the Defence Force, not only securing those jobs, but to ensure Newcastle can open up as an international destination once borders open up. I mean, let's be honest, New South Wales are probably going to be going to London before they're going to Perth, the way things are going at the moment, and soon you'll be able to fly from Newcastle. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I, for one, Senator Hughes, love New South Wales and Sydney and the harbour and everything else that comes with it. And I must say, I'm a little bit offended by your very weird comments on curries. Having served in New South Wales Parliament for five years, I can tell you that I've had my fair share of disagreements with Premier Gladys Berejiklian and the New South Wales Liberals. But I have to say on this very rare occasion, I do agree with them wholeheartedly. Scott Morrison, is a prime minister for himself and no one else. I say for himself and no one else because Mr. Morrison is the prime minister who was holidaying in Hawaii when bush were ravaging our forests, our bush, our communities and our wildlife. I say for himself and no one else because Mr. Morrison is the prime minister who was gallivanting around in England when hundreds of thousands of us were barred from seeing our families overseas due to border closures. I say for himself and no one else because Mr. Morrison has completely bungled up the vaccine rollout in Australia. 
which is his responsibility. More than 10% of Wilcania's mostly Aboriginal population is now infected with COVID-19. Tragically, one First Nations man from Dubbo has passed away. The vaccination rollout in Western New South Wales have been miserably slow. These communities would not have been in this trauma and mess if the Prime Minister had done his job. I say no one else but himself because Mr. Morrison chose to leave hundreds of thousands of temporary migrants and international students out of the government's COVID support packages, leaving them at the mercy of charity because they can't vote for him. I say no one else but himself because Mr. Morrison is plunging us ever deeper into a climate emergency which threatens the planet and our future generations very survival just because his campaign donations come from the fossil fuel lobby. Not only that, we are in the climate code red and Mr. Morrison is busy handing out hundreds of millions to his pals, the gas industry, so they can frack the earth and pollute even more. What a sham, what an absolute disaster this Liberal National Government is with Scott Morrison at the helm. Mr. Morrison is not fit to be Prime Minister. The COVID-19 pandemic presented the Prime Minister with a chance to do things differently. Here was the Prime Minister's opportunity to redeem himself. Instead, inequality has skyrocketed and the climate crisis has gotten worse. Mr. Morrison, you may not want to hold the hose, but the true fact of the matter is that you are holding us all back with your sheer incompetence and self-obsession. All you are interested in is holding on to power. To do what though? To keep acting in your own political interest rather than that of the public. That's what you're here to do with the power and responsibility that you have. Shame. Well, for the sake of our collective peace of mind and our collective blood pressure, I hope the Australian public has seen right through you and your shenanigans and boots you out come the next election. We are sick of Mr. Morrison's self-interest dominating all policy and political outcomes. It's time to get rid of this lot and take some real action on tackling inequality and the climate crisis. And only the Greens in shared power with the Labour government, who we can give a big push to go further, faster, can deliver this change and this hope for our community. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the situation in New South Wales is very grim indeed. Almost 30,000 cases, uh, 1,164 cases recorded today, 94 deaths in this outbreak so far, deep concerns about Western Sydney's hospitals capacity, queues of ambulances outside emergency rooms, some waiting for up to eight hours, concerns that staffing shortages uh, will soon limit the state surge ICU capacity. There's also the crisis unfolding in Western New South Wales, where COVID has been spreading amongst a largely unvaccinated and vulnerable population. Yet the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, wants to declare mission accomplished. Uh, and there is, the truth of the matter is it is gonna get a lot darker before Mr Morrison's dawn. The trend is against us. The infection wave has not yet peaked. There is every indication that New South Wales is facing more terrible weeks and months ahead. And all of this was entirely preventable, an entirely predictable outcome of the Prime Minister's obvious failures. Botched vaccine rollout, failure to set up quarantine facilities, and a constant undermining from day one of the state's responses. His failure is the greatest public policy failure in Australian political history, and it's ordinary Australians who are paying the price. The crisis is entirely a function, uh, entirely a reflection of this Prime Minister's hollow man inadequacies, his complacency, his vanity, 
his refusal to take responsibility, his incapacity to, to be able to distinguish between his own political interest and the national interest. And as this crisis continues, these failings are becoming more and more apparent to Australians. Over the weekend, the Sydney Morning Herald reported the following, and I will quote it at length. The Herald said, Berejiklian is a Liberal team player who keeps her grievances about Morrison private, but in private she is scathing. The New South Wales Premier has told Liberal colleagues she'd have preferred Peter Dutton had won the last federal leadership. She'd rather be dealing with Dutton because Morrison is so unpleasant, she said. She described the Prime Minister as a bully. Barry Giglian went so far Ayers, as to tell a colleague... Senator Ayres, sorry. Um, we, um, I just want to draw your attention to the ruling of uh, the President that quoting another source does not allow a senator to bypass the normal rules in relation to unparliamentary language. So if you could keep that in mind as you can continue your um, contribution, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Berejiklian, Ms Berejiklian, the Premier, went so far as to tell a colleague that Morrison's behaviour was evil. Senator Ayres, um, I would ask you to, um, I'll, to I'll, reflect I'll, I'll on that the language I'll... that you're using, yes. even though you are quoting. So yes. a, a, the president has previously ruled just because you're quoting a document doesn't allow a senator to, to bypass the normal rules in relation to unparliamentary language. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'll withdraw that. Uh, take, I'll, I'll, it'll also save the Senate from hearing a substantial part of the uh, character assessment that it provided for the Prime Minister, and I'll go on to the end of it, where, uh, where it, it says, among Berejiklian's inner circle, it's considered a joke to call Morrison the Prime Minister for New South Wales. They consider Morrison, the, the Prime Minister, to be the Prime Minister for Morrison and no one else. That's what the Prime Minister's friends think of him. It's not simply a personal assessment of one leader over another. It has real costs for Australian families. The article then goes on to chronicle the New South Wales Treasurer's efforts to establish an effective new JobKeeper scheme in New South Wales. It says that Mr Perrottet was so determined to fix uh, Mr Morrison's failed economic response that he, uh, that he began to establish his own scheme. Uh, Morrison, it says, the Prime Minister, refused to supply the essential information even though the program would not cost Canberra a cent. The Herald goes on to say the politics seemed pretty plain. Mr Morrison didn't want to be seen to be abandoning the states. This confirmed the suspicion in the Berejiklian government that Mr Morrison was more interested in the politics of appearance than the substance of outcomes. Has there ever been a more brutal summary of a political career than that? Mr Morrison was more interested in the politics of appearance than in the substance of outcomes. For three years, the people of Australia have watched this unlikely Prime Minister. They've seen the announcements, the press conferences, the Facebook lives, the hectoring, the lists, the mansplaining, the slogans, the made-for-television marketing, the phony iron high-vis jackets, the leaks, the negative briefings, the diversions, the gaslighting, and the spin, and Australians have stopped listening. They've started to tune out from the bullying, the flip-flopping, the shifting goalposts, the mini Trump efforts to create his own reality, the efforts to keep the story moving along. Marketing, spin, and slick political messaging works right up until the moment when it stops working. And then when it stops working, Gravity takes over, and that's the problem for this Prime Minister. The reality is 
that there are over a thousand daily infections in New South Wales when we should be vaccinated, healthy and free. The reality is that Prime Minister Scott Morrison sat on his hands when it was uh, sat on his hands on vaccines when it was his job to order them. Hasn't turned a sod or laid a brick for effective national quarantine and continues to undermine the health efforts of the states. The reality is that this Prime Minister has broken every promise he has made to the Australian people, that they would be first in the queue for vaccines, that stranded Aussies overseas would be home by Christmas, that four million vaccinations would be delivered to Australians by the end of March, that the vaccines wasn't a race, that all aged care residents and workers would be vaccinated by Easter 2021, that six million people would be fully vaccinated in May, four million by April, and now confusingly, apparently all Australians will be vaccinated by October. The reality is that millions of Australians are waiting for their vaccines. In the bush in Western Sydney, aged care residents and workers, disability workers, NDIS recipients, school teachers, Indigenous Australians, children, supermarket workers, truckies. The reality is that, the, that millions of us are locked down with no end in sight because of this Prime Minister. The consequences of lockdowns and the public health measures that his own backbench complain about, unemployment, the mental health impacts, the impacts on kids, lost opportunities, the dragging back of economic growth are entirely a function of the failure of this Prime Minister's leadership and his incapacity to do his job on behalf of Australian people. And meanwhile, the Prime Minister is preparing for his mission accomplished moment. Yesterday, he said that our vaccine challenges had been overcome. He must be living in a different universe to the rest of us. Mr Morrison received his vaccine early this year, but millions of Australians are still waiting for theirs because of his failure on vaccine delivery. He thinks his best chance of re-election is to try and pretend that everything is somebody else's problem, everything is somebody else's fault, I saw today uh, the efforts to try and blame the people of Wilcannia themselves for the low levels of vaccination in that township. And he wants to suggest that it will all be over very soon, but it won't. Gladys Berejiklian, the New South Wales Premier, knows it. Mr Perrottet, the New South Wales Treasurer, knows it. And the Australian people know it. They know who he is more marketing than man, more Billy McMahon than even Billy McMahon was. The Prime Minister for New South Wales, the New South Wales Liberals know that's not true. He is the Prime Minister for nobody but himself. He is only interested in his own political interests, not in the interests of the Australian people. The New South Wales Liberals themselves know that the only good way to look at this Prime Minister is through the rear vision mirror. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Is that right? Yes. Good. Excellent. First time I've ever got that right. Well, look, um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I rise to make some remarks about this matter of public importance. Um, and as a member of the New South Wales Division of the Liberal Party, I can assure the Senate that the um, New South Wales Division would regard the Prime Minister as a, a favourite son of that particular division. And um, I recall back in 2019, which seems like a long time ago now, that there were uh, two state elections or two, two elections on that, uh, that year, one state election, one federal election. And I recall uh, the, uh, the Premier and the Prime Minister campaigning on a regular basis across uh, Sydney and across the state of New South Wales. And that is the position that uh, we have seen throughout this pandemic that there has been a high level 
a high level of coordination between the state government and the national government here in Canberra. Um, and that is what I think people have come to expect from this government, that um, it's been a government that has accepted that in a national pandemic and an economic shock that there is a need for the federal government to work closely with the state governments uh, because, of course, under our constitutional system, the power and the responsibilities are shared across the federation. Um, now, many people have complained about the former Council of Australian Governments, which was put to death by the Morrison government uh, for good reason. I think it had been described regularly as a place where good ideas go to die, and that is the case. The establishment of the National Cabinet, which has been a innovation designed to bring together the health and the economic response that Australia requires as a federation to get through this pandemic, has been very successful. Um, now you can, you can look at the data points and you can look at what has happened across the globe. And I think what really matters to people is how many people have died, how many infections has there been, and what has the economic response been like in terms of the, the rebound after you have lockdowns and public health measures in place. Now, on deaths, you have still effectively the lowest rate of comparable countries. You have still a very low rate of infection, and you have the strongest economic rebound of all OECD nations so far. So th that has been the, the net position so far of Australia some 18 months into this pandemic with the National Cabinet at the centre of our response. Now, in 2020, New South Wales had a particularly good year relative to other jurisdictions and relative to other states that we would regularly compare ourselves with on the eastern seaboard, uh, where, for the most part, New South Wales remained open, whilst Victoria was closed. Now, 2021 has been a tougher year as the Delta variant has taken hold in Sydney. And I think you'll find that the Premier and the Prime Minister have uh, levelled with the Australian people. Uh, New South Wales has been the Australian state where the Delta variant uh, has seeded itself uh, on the mainland, uh, where it is destined to stay. And these two leaders have spoken the truth, as has the Premier, jo as has the Premier, as has the Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. And the reality is, no major city across the world uh, has been able to withstand the Delta. I mean, the, the Delta is going to embed itself in every major city ultimately, um, and the sooner the people get out and get vaccinated and, and have public health orders and have rules and have plans to manage Delta, the better. I mean, I, I don't think Western Australia has a plan to manage the pandemic. I think their plan has been to close the border. That is, that is not a plan to manage the pandemic. Now, the, the plan in New South Wales has had to change because, um, as a result of carrying this country for this last 18 months, um, New South Wales has been highly exposed to hotel quarantine. I mean, everyone, everyone wants to assist Australians to come back to this country. Now, that requires hotel quarantine, and 75 or 80 per cent of the hotel quarantine has been done in New South Wales. Now, when Victoria went offline last year, um, they didn't do any hotel quarantine. Now, at the moment, we've heard senators um, complain and bemoan the uh, relatively high level of cases in New South Wales, but um, even with 1,000 cases a day, New South Wales is still doing hotel quarantine. So um, these are the risks that you face when you're a global city trying to carry uh, the rest of the continent through a pandemic. Uh, you, will, you will face uh, the Delta, and it will come to all the other jurisdictions that have uh, no or low, low levels of case numbers at the moment. I mean, that, that, that is the reality. That is the reality, and that is where Australia is heading. So, um, having dealt relatively well with the economic and the health issues, um, we have seen uh, the Prime Minister uh, work well with the state premiers, including the Premier of my state, New South Wales, um, on the recent outbreak. Now, you have seen very significant fiscal support, over a billion dollars a week, going into New South Wales. Uh, businesses are able to go on to service New South Wales and access disaster support payments for their businesses, job saver. Uh, and these are in addition to the payments provided by the Commonwealth 
through the Services Australia system. Now the Commonwealth and the states are paying. Sorry, the Commonwealth and the state of New South Wales are going halves uh, in relation to these particular job saver payments, which are putting in place a, a floor under businesses, which we want to see open up fully in the next eight to nine weeks in New South Wales. Uh, so I think that shows the high level of coordination and cooperation that there has been an agreement that the federal and the state government would pay for job saver. But more broadly, there's also been a high level of coordination in terms of vaccinations. Uh, there's no question that with the outbreak in Sydney, there has been a much higher need for vaccinations. And the national government has prioritised getting vaccinations to Sydney in particular. And of the one million additional doses of Pfizer that came from Poland, more than half a million of those additional one million doses went into Sydney, into South West Sydney, uh, in order to get people protected, because of course just one shot of uh, the vaccine provides a good level of protection against the virus. More broadly across the state, into the western districts of New South Wales, where we, where we unfortunately do have a COVID outbreak in some Indigenous communities, the national government has deployed an OSMAT team and additional uh, vaccinations to support the state government in getting vaccinations into those remote Indigenous communities, which I visited myself. Uh, and it is very regrettable that there is COVID in those areas, but we are working swiftly with the state government to ensure that vaccines can go into the arms as quick as possible. Now, when you have COVID in your community, uh, the best thing you can do is get a vaccination, and that is a testament, I think, to the high level of coordination and cooperation between the federal and state governments that there has been a huge influx of vaccinations into New South Wales, which now, as of today, has 67 per cent of our citizens with a first dose in the arm. Leading the nation, New South Wales once again on vaccinations. And I believe that that means that New South Wales will be the first state to real freedom because we will have had the honest conversation with the citizens that the Delta is here, it won't be um, able to be eradicated, uh, and we're going to have a high level of vaccinations, um, and that will make us able to reopen very quickly. And that's been possible because of the coordination between these two, these two governments. Now, of course, um, this has been an 18-month battle with the pandemic, and last year we did deploy the very successful JobKeeper scheme, uh, which has underpinned Australia's world-leading economic response. But we also had the very successful uh, early release super scheme, which the uh, people across the aisle I think have been very uh, supportive of, because they know that uh, giving people access to their own money in a pandemic, in an economic shock, is the right thing to do. And it's very important to put one's citizens ahead of one's donors, which is a, I know is a troubling concept for people across the aisle. But the reality is that when Australia faced the greatest economic and health crisis since the Second World War, um, the super funds and the Labor Party were more interested in saving the super funds than they were in saving Australia. And that is a great shame and a great stain on the Labor Party. And of course, it comes on a day where we see Labor's former treasurer, Mr Swan, become um, the chairman of one of the major super funds. So I guess the real question is, um, does big super own Labor or does the Labor Party own big, big super? Now, that is a question for the ages, certainly a question I hope the Senate can debate one day in a future matter of public importance. And I think that would be a, uh, quite an illuminating discussion and I look forward to that happening perhaps in the next session. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This motion, moving a matter of public importance, states the reported views of members of the New South Wales Liberal government, including that they consider Mr Morrison to be, quote, the Prime Minister for Morrison and no one else. While that is increasingly heard in the media, among members of the government, among members of the Liberal and National parties, and among the people, I reflect on an additional, more significant and rapidly growing conclusion among the people, and it's allied to the one that MPI debates. That conclusion is, the people are saying the Parliament of Australia is for the Parliament. And what they mean by that is, the Parliament is working for both the Tidal parties. That is, the Liberal Nationals and the Labor Party. And the people of Australia are the ones paying the price. 
because the people are serving the parliament when we need to get back to the parliament serving the people. I'm very positive about Australians, our resources, our opportunities, our potential, yet I'm very worried about Australia because of shoddy governance for many decades. And so are the people, for example, the truckies. The truckies blockaded a highway recently south of Brisbane. The truckies are the salt of the earth, regular people, real people. There's nothing that hasn't been on a truck, whether during processing or after it's finished being made and, and sent to market. Truckies interact with everyone, all ways of life, all callings, all needs. And now they're calling out the politicians. Not just the government, truckies are calling out politicians generally. Why? Because they're feeling doubtful, confused, afraid, overwhelmed, hopeless, and they're getting angry and they're feeling very frustrated. Why? Because their, their need is for a livelihood that's being threatened, need for survival, need for truth and honesty, basic needs, the need for consistency and ease, predictability for being heard by the members who are supposed to represent them in Parliament, need for leadership, trust, integrity, credibility. So let's have a look at some of the data. We've had now hundreds of days in lockdown in Victoria, months in some of the other states, capricious, smacked on and taken off suddenly, people's lives ruined, stress, isolation, poverty, suicides, domestic violence, cruel restrictions, one of the twins being lost because the parent was denied uh, access to Brisbane Hospital and, and she came from northern New South Wales. Fancy losing a twin because of some capricious government and bureaucrat. Parents dying without the comfort of their kids. Kids in cancer treatment alone because their parents have to go into, curfew, into, into lockdowns. Then we've got curfews. We've got the local government uh, author uh, authorities in, in, uh, in Sydney, local government agents, uh, areas in Sydney. People calling on them to show them their papers so they can move from one LGA to another. Child suicides, domestic violence, alcohol abuse, kids at boarding school not able to go home for, for the holidays and see their families. Threats and bribes now to get people to vaccinate. And that threat is undermining the vaccination itself. The World Health Organization says lockdowns are to be used only initially to get control of a virus. Well, 18 months is not initially. Eight, and, and that means every time a government slaps on a lockdown in this country, it is admitting for the whole world to see they have not got control of the virus. Clearly there is no plan. People can see and feel this. They, but politicians lack the strength of character to admit their error. They're locked in gutlessly to save, people's, to save face in front of the people. The Liberal Nationals and Labor governments in state and federal are pushing this rubbish on the people of Australia. And the people, though, are starting to, starting to get the Liberals to backpedal. Because the, what's happening is the data is starting to come out. People are feeling the pain. And they're saying, to hell with you lot. They want to sort out Parliament. The politicians still won't back out because of the fear that they have drummed up. The fear that they've ingrained throughout our society. And that is killing people. So what we have now, for the first time ever, we see the Liberal, Labor, Liberal Nats and Labor pushing a vaccine. This is the first time in history, an untested, unproven vaccine, the first time in history that governments are injecting healthy people with something that can kill them and is killing many. At the same time, we see ivermectin, a now proven, safe, effective, affordable treatment and a preventative, a prophylactic, and the Liberal Nats and Labor are both stopping this treatment. There's a complete lack of a plan, a, a bias away from the data, a contradiction of the data. All the truckies want a simple basic needs met, end damaging lockdowns and curfews, vaccine only by choice, children back to school so they can get on with their lives and their livelihoods Senator and protect Roberts, their families. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. A Prime Minister for no season. Poor leadership is something that we have in this country at the moment, and which can lead, as we all know, to catastrophic outcomes as we are witnessing right now in this country. Poor leadership, certain characteristics are evident with inability to listen, a lack of empathy for others, and inability to take responsibility. So 
We know that on this side of the chamber, we know that the Prime Minister has not the ability needed during this time of a pandemic to even be able to communicate effectively. But now we see the New South Wales branch and the New South Wales government publicly expressing the same frustration. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has ticked these boxes consistently during his tenure as Prime Minister of Australia none more so than the last 18 months. And these aren't, as I said, just our views. These are the views of the New South Wales government. What COVID is doing to Australians um, is so evident to us. But I, I want to refer to a survey data today uh, which suggests that Australians are more worried about their job security and mental health than they are about the COVID breakouts and more deaths. The YouGov poll argues that one in three Australians believe vaccinations are the pathway back to normality, with only 22 per cent of people believing continued lockdowns should occur until COVID cases reach zero. What Australians want is a vision out of the pandemic and a timeline for that. They want to see a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's hard when there's 60 per cent of Australians who find themselves in lockdown right now. They don't want a Prime Minister who only cares about himself and his own job. They want a Prime Minister who will lead. No more important than now is for us to have a Prime Minister who has the conviction to be able to lead the Australian people. I want to speak about Donna Nguyen, an 18-year-old young woman from Sydney who contracted COVID at a party in Sydney was tested numerous times before finally testing positive and ending up in hospital twice before recovering from the disease. It is a sad story that should be a warning to everyone who isn't concerned about the Delta variant, because you should be. On the fifth day of quarantine, Donna's condition deteriorated quickly. And Donna said, and I quote, I was passed out for 14 hours a day. Time moves so strangely when you're in that state. Morning and night were barely indistinguishable. I, begin, I began hyperventilating. Donna was not able to eat because she couldn't stop vomiting. If I tried to breathe, I would cough and gag. Staggered to the bathroom, Donna tried to take a shower. She passed out from the heat. I was excessively shivering, but was sweating and hot. Donna lay dishevelled in her bed for six days, unable to sit up. She recalls, and I quote, when you're in that state with no clear directory of getting better, you lose the joy in everything, she says. I'm sorry that this happened to you, Donna. It didn't have to be like this. If we had a prime minister committed to keeping Delta out of the country, then you may not have been forced to go through this ordeal that will be with you and stay with you for the rest of your life. Donna was happy that she's recovered, and she was lucky that she's able to survive and is recovering slowly from COVID-19. Unfortunately, over 1,000 Australians have died from COVID-19, and many, many more may still face that bleak outcome. The lack of vaccines and no fit-for-purpose quarantine system in our country, and we have a Prime Minister who only had two jobs, and that was to roll out the vaccine in a timely manner, but he said there's no race, nothing to see here. Well, we all know that he's failed. We've even seen him reject the idea of having purpose-built quarantines to keep Australians safe. We know the hotel quarantines don't work. We know that we're losing too many people. We know that there's over 60,000 aged care workers in this country who still haven't had a vaccine. We don't know how many carers going into and delivering home care packages that haven't yet received a vaccine. This was a race, Mr Morrison, and it was a race that we needed to win. Senator Davey. Very much. Now, imagine that, Madam Acting Deputy President. We're often told that we in this place are out of touch, more focused on naval gazing and internal issues than governing for the country. And today, Labor really is taking the cake because they 
are more interested in navel-gazing into internal Liberal Party issues than on uh, what actually matters to the people of this country. The people of this country who are concerned about their jobs, who are concerned about their mental health. I mean, do we really care what the Premier of New South Wales thinks about the Prime Minister behind closed doors when 44 per cent of Australians say they are concerned they are in a worse mental state today than they were pre-COVID. Labor would rather have us talking about an unsourced allegation of she said, she said that appeared in, week, in one weekend paper than on governing the country. Well, I would rather focus on he did, he did. Indeed, so would the Premier of New South Wales, because when she was asked directly about this unsourced, uncorroborated claim that Labor are focusing on, Premier Berejiklian said on the record, I thank the Prime Minister for his support during the entire course of the pandemic, but especially in relation to this outbreak. And, um, the support that we have provided to New South Wales and all states, but specifically to New South Wales, is evident because since 1 July this year, 1.7 million claims, over 1.7 million claims for COVID disaster payments have been granted for New South Wales citizens, valued at 921 million, with a further 2.6 billion being issued via recurring payments. So, I mean, Labor have their slogan of the week, which is that the PM had just two jobs, they say. Well, if that's the case, I'm going to say, Prime Minister, slow down. You are clearly overachieving, because as well as the two jobs that the Labor Party uh, say he should be focusing on, the Prime Minister has also led National Cabinet to an agreed, updated four-step national plan to transition Australia's national COVID-19 response. The Prime Minister has led an expansion of the New South Wales Business Support Package, which now supports more than 400,000 businesses employing 3.3 million workers. That's just in New South Wales. That's only in New South Wales, not to mention the expanded support. We've got an additional 400 million Victorian business support packages. We've increased the disaster payment, $750 for individuals who've lost 20 or more hours work a week. Um, we've also secured an extra 85 million doses of Pfizer, providing access to additional booster vaccines into the future that will protect Australians in an ongoing way. We've invested $125.7 billion in Medicare over the forward esti estimates. We've announced $36 million in innovative medical product manufacturing projects, which bring manufacturing onshore to help protect Australians and keep Australians safe from COVID. We've extended telehealth consultations. We've waived childcare gap fees for parents. We've Unveil $1 billion in funding to underpin the first Closing the Gap implementation plan that has been developed with Indigenous Australians, not for Indigenous Australians. We've announced a financial and wellbeing redress, redress scheme for Living Stolen Generations members. We've aided the Queensland Government in their very successful bid to secure the 2032 Olympic Games. Congratulations to Queensland. The list is ongoing, and I congratulate our government for overachieving. Keep up the good work, Prime Minister. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Government documents, Civil Aviation Safety Authority, Corporate Plan 2021-22. Air 
Air Services Australia Corporate Plan 21-22, Australian National Audit Office Report for 2020-21. Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman Independent Review dated June 21. Migration Act 1958, Section 4860, Assessment of Detention Arrangements, Commonwealth Ombudsman Reports, Reports number 43 to 45 of 2021, Government Responses to Commonwealth Ombudsman Reports number 43 to 45 of 2021. I shall now go to the tabling in consideration of committee reports and government res responses. Whip. Uh, I present four reports of committees as shown at item 14 of today's order of business. It's a job lot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, um, which reports did you? Sorry, so I've got the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, and the Government Response on Road Safety. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy um, President. I present the Government's response to the report of the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety and seek leave to have the document incorporated into the Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I will now go to the committee report presented out of city. The Economic Reference Committee, Greenfields, Cash Cows and the Regulation of Foreign Investment in Australia. Is anyone seeking the call? Oh, Senator Seward. Um, I move to uh, take note of that report, and I understand Senator McKim would like to make a contribution. Senator McKim. Thank you, Chair. Can I confirm that we are debating the Senate Economics Reference Committee report? We are, Senator McKim. Please proceed. Thank, thank you very much. I want to begin this contribution by acknowledging that the last time Australia was totally free of foreign ownership was in 1788, and that this nation uh, and almost all of the wealth that's been generated in this nation since 1788 uh, is founded and has been founded on the forceful dispossession of First Nations people from their lands. And strictly speaking, unless you're a First Nations person in Australia, you are a foreign investor in this country. And we should reflect on these facts and these circumstances whenever we are considering this issue. Foreign investment in Australia largely occurs in the dark. If the government of the day wants to keep quiet about who is investing, from where the investment is coming, what that investment is buying and on what conditions, then that is up to them because the publication of any decision to improve to approve investment, the reasons for improving foreign investment, any conditions placed upon the approval of foreign investment are all at the discretion of the Treasurer. Now this is a lack of transparency that has to be addressed. And I might add here that the lack of transparency affects potential investors' expectation of what is or isn't acceptable in terms of foreign investment into Australia. And it allows the government to make an arrangement with foreign investors that suits the government's political ends rather than the national interest. In a country where there is shamefully no independent Commonwealth level National Integrity Commission, this creates an environment where corruption can flourish. And a case study that I want to go to here is the case study of VDL Dairy. As this inquiry heard, the sale of VDL Dairy to Moonlake 
is a perfect example of a dodgy foreign investment approval being used for political purposes. In 2016, with great fanfare, the then Treasurer, now Prime Minister Scott Morrison, approved the sale of VDL to Chinese company Moon Lake, with the promise of $100 million to be invested and a near doubling of jobs. There has been nothing but trouble since. Members of the board quit en masse soon after. Farm managers sought indemnity from liability because of substandard operating practices. The Tasmanian government's dairy regulator found most of BDL's farms were in breach of sanitary regulations. Nowhere near the promised $100 million has been invested, and neither has there been anything like the promised doubling of jobs. And thanks to my friend and colleague, Senator Peter Wish Wilson, we found out that the government didn't even make Moon Lake's promises a condition of the approval. And yet, despite running the joint to the ground on empty promises, Moon Lake was able to find $25,000 to donate to the Tasmanian Liberal Party. This looks suspiciously like the institutionalised bribery that are corporate political donations. Now, we need to get our house in order here. And given the current downturn in foreign investment, we have an outstanding opportunity to get our house in order without being accused of targeting any particular investment or group of investors. And while the Chair's report does provide an excellent documentation of the problem, the recommendations fall far short of offering comprehensive solutions. We need to stop pussyfooting around. The Greens have made a series of recommendations that get to the heart of the issue. Publish the details of all foreign investment approvals so that we know what the government is up to and we know what is being approved and what the conditions of those approvals are. Any public undertakings made by a prospective foreign investor should automatically be made a condition of any subsequent approval to stop investors making empty promises. The public register of foreign investment should include data on the current value, the tenure, the beneficial owner, the country of origin of the beneficial owner, the use and jurisdiction of all land in which there is a foreign interest so that we can see the whole picture. We should establish a public register showing the ultimate beneficial owner of companies registered or operating in Australia so that we know exactly which foreign actors are investing and have invested in Australia. And last but not least, we need to find belatedly, long after it was promised, include real estate agents, accountants and lawyers as designated services under the anti-money laundering laws so that we can stop Australia being the laundromat of the South Pacific by allowing foreign companies to wash their money through Australian real estate. We should not allow our country to be used to launder money in the way that it is. We should not be languishing amongst the extremely small number of countries that have not legislated tranche to real estate agents, accountants and lawyers as designated services under the anti-money laundering laws. And we should get serious about our position on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism laws so that Australia is no longer the laundromat of the South Pacific. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr McKinnon. Senator Seaworth. I understand Senator Wish Wilson also wishes to make a contribution. Is Senator Wish Wilson on the line? Um, would you like, Senator Seaworth, would you like to seek leave to continue remarks then on that? Yes, thank basis? you. Okay, yes. is, leave, is leave granted? 
with leaves granted. And I understand that Senator Sheldon wished to make a contribution in regard to the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety report. Um, I think we will go to Senator Sheldon and... Oh, sorry. Has somebody moved to take note of that? Senator Polly. Yes, I'll move to take note of that report. Thank you. Thank you. And Senator Sheldon remotely. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the government's response to the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety report titled Improving Road Safety in Australia. That report was delivered on the 30th of October 2020. I want to start by thanking the senators and members of the committee for this report, particularly my colleagues, the member for Cunningham, the member for Kingsman Smith, Senator Glenn Stirl, and of course, the deputy chair of the committee, my friend and colleague, Senator Alex Gallagher. For whom road safety was always such a priority for many years, but in this place, not only in this place, but also at the Transport Workers Union. It is disappointing that it's taken almost a year for the government to deliver its response to this report. Road safety is an urgent, deadly issue, which requires an urgent and comprehensive response. It is an issue which impacts each and every Australian, and particularly impacts workers on the road transport sector for whom the road is their workplace. And far too many transport workers die on our roads every year. Trucks, vans, cars, motorcycles, mopeds and push bikes. Increasingly, transport workers are engaged through an app. And of course, their boss is an algorithm. The actual companies who ultimately control the app claim they have no responsibility for the safety of their workers. We have seen how the form of sham contracting has impacted on the safety of drivers and riders at Uber, Deliveroo and others. Australia watched with horror last year as five delivery riders lost their lives in just a matter of months. Betty Frede, Chelsea Shem, Jinchiro Shem, Bijoy Paul and Ike Wong. And in June of this year, we learned that there's been a sixth death, Barack Dogan, the death was covered up by Uber. It was covered up by Uber and not reported because he was killed 25 minutes after his last trip. He was still logged into the app until the moment of his death. But because of the 25 minute gap from his last delivery, Uber and Uber's insurance had refused to pay insurance to his family. And because Uber called for him a, him a contractor rather than an employee, he and his family did not have access to workers' compensation. Just two weeks ago, we learned that there were even more Uber and failed to share, uh, that failed to share with regulators. The New South Wales Point-to-Point -point Transport Commission revealed Uber failed to report more than 500 serious incidents, including sexual assaults and serious crashes over an 18-month period. This is a company which not only dodges taxes and dodges our industrial relations laws, it also dodges any obligation it has for safety wherever possible. Uber quite simply thinks it's above the law and that arrogance and recklessness is a threat to the safety and well-being of everyone in Australian roads. Because Uber classifies its drivers as independent contractors, Uber also manages to avoid paying the Australian minimum wage. In fact, we know that Uber Eats riders are earning as little as $6.67 an hour. It is a return to Dickinson work conditions. And in road transport, we know that unsustainable rates leads to unsafe decisions on the road. People not being able to maintain their vehicle, not be able, having a choice between keeping their contract, keeping their job, or putting food on the table. We know that for uh, because of uh, Decade, for decades, owner drivers and employees alike, drivers alike, together with the Transport Workers Union, have sought for a system of safe rates. To quote the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety, road safety report, heavy trucks were involved in 14.7% of fatalities in 2016. And despite making up only 3.13% of registered vehicles, the connection between pain and safety is now recognised by most of the road, trans road transport industry, both in Australia and around the world. To quote the Transport Workers Union, 
The common thread between driver's health and risk taking behaviours is pressure imposed upon truck drivers by their clients, particularly those at the apex of the supply chain. This view is supported by local and international experts. The International Labour Organisation says, and I quote, after an extensive review of all the literature that links pain safety, this link has now been internationally recognised. Emeritus Professor Michael Quinlan has said, and I quote, extensive academic research stretching over a 40 year period supports the relationship between payment levels, subcontracting, and an array of OHS outcomes, including crashes and injuries. And of course, on the employer side as well, Paul Ryan from the Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation has, has said that we need to ensure, and I quote, when something is contracted down two, three or four times and everyone takes their clip, the person down the bottom of that chain, whether it be a transport company or an owner operator, is paid a fair rate for the job that they're doing is essential. Payment rates to make sure that people are able to maintain their vehicles is critical and not be able to take risk behaviour uh, because of incentivisation of risky behaviour. A choice about uh, taking a fair wage, a uh, choice about maintaining your vehicle, choice about what you do regarding your um, the dangers on the road should not be the consequence of employers demanding uh, and allowing systems where people are on such subsistence wages that they're extended and stressed to do this work in any way possible. This type of behaviour is commonplace and misuse of market powers and encourages unsafe behaviour. There has been attempts in the past to introduce these protections, including the failed Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. Unfortunately, the RSRT did not live up to what many in the transport industry had hoped. As a former National Secretary of the Transport Workers Union, it did not live up to what I had hoped. But while the RSRT ultimately failed, when it was removed by the Turnbull government, it was replaced with nothing. And without any sort of protection or enforcement of safe rates, we saw the number of crashes involving truck drivers spike in the years after the RSRT was dissolved. There is blood on their, um, uh, the Prime Minister's hands. We are seeing conditions for owner drivers and employee drivers go from bad to worse. When owner driver Frank Black wrote a column in Owner Driver magazine rallying against unsafe rates, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission sent him a letter threatening criminal charges. And what did Frank say that was so outrageous? I'll quote you the column. He said, I am unfortunately missing my grandson's first birthday for a job I would have otherwise turned down. Sacrificing our rest days and family life now is necessary to help keep the wheels turning in an attempt to ensure our businesses survive in a few months' time. We can't afford for rates to be lowered anywhere in the industry. All that will happen if we undersell our work is that we'll all end up going bust. Well, what, was it an outrageous over, overstep? But it certainly was an outrageous overstep by the ACCC. I made this point to the ACCC Chair Rod Sims at Budget Estimates, as has Senator Stirl and Senator Scar. Mr Sims did not apologise for sending that letter. He was of the view that Frank Black's conduct may have been against the law. And that really demonstrates how grossly inadequate the laws for owner drivers are in Australia. This response is being tabled just days after 7,000 owner drivers and employee drivers went on strike at toll, while an additional 8,000 truck drivers at Linfox, BevChain, StarTrack and FedEx are also heading towards strikes. When you have 15,000 truck drivers across five major transport companies heading to industrial action, what you have are big multinational companies that are being allowed to attack the rights and pay of workers and small business owners. Those 7,000 toll drivers are standing up against a proposal to bring in new employees on precarious short-term contracts and outside hire on lower pay is a trick we are seeing across the economy. Companies bringing in external workers on lower rates of pay conditions to undercut their own workforce. 
We've seen it in Qantas, where there was most anti-CEO, new worker CEO in Australia, Alan Joyce, set up his own labour hire company, Qantas Ground Services, to undercut his own Qantas employees. Then he undercut them even further by contracting their jobs out to third parties. We're also seeing it in the mining industry with labour hire casuals getting just paid just 24% less on average than direct mine employees. Thank you, Senator. And also, we're seeing it has expired. Do you seek do you seek leave to continue your remarks? Do you wish to I seek leave to continue. Okay, leave granted. Thank you. Um, I, Thank you. With the leave of the chamber, I noticed that Senator Wish Wilson has joined, um, and I'm just. Uh, and we're referring to, I think, going back to committee reports and government responses um, on the Economics References Committee. So is leave granted to be able to... OK, leave is granted. So Senator Wish-Wilson. Are you on mute, Senator Wish-Wilson? We still can't hear you, Senator Wish Wilson. We're going to have to. Okay, Senator Wish Wilson, it will come back on on Thursday's um, notice paper if you're willing to defer till then. Okay, so we'll take the thumbs up as a, an <laughs> agreement, um, and we will now um, move on to ministerial statements. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I table documents relating to the following orders for the production of documents concerning, first, the Urban Congestion Fund, second, the Energy Security Board, and third, the Legislation, Exemptions and Other Measures Regulation of 2015. Thank you. Senator Seward. Thank you. First, can I uh, take note of the um, documents presented as part of the um, Security of, uh, sorry, the um, legis the um, delegated legislation committee, mm -hmm. and seek leave to continue my remarks. Take note of the government's response and seek leave to continue my remarks. I also wanted to take note of the urban congestion OPD and uh, throw to Senator Rice, who I understand, hopefully, well, her sound to... system is working. Excellent, Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. Yes, you can we, hear me? We can hear you. That's good. Yes, look, I want to, I want to take note of the government's um, response of the order of production of documents number 1217, which was tabled um, just then. I, with the support of the Senate, asked for the spreadsheets that underpin the car park rorts that took place prior to the last election. Those spreadsheets that laid out the 20 marginal seats strategy and how hundreds of millions of dollars of public funds could be jammed into them for car parks so that the government could park barrel their way to victory at the last election. And what the response that we've got to this request for these critical documents, Minister Fletcher's response, I'm sad to say, is to deny the Senate's request for the documents and to say that they needed more time to consider their response. I mean, this is an appalling response from Minister Fletcher. It comes on top of his claim three weeks ago that these spreadsheets showing the top 20 marginal seats is a cabinet document, so it can't be revealed for two decades because it might make it more difficult for future governments to make politically challenging decisions. But look, the government is happy to have the visibility of car parks to announce, but no transparency or accountability as to how they made these decisions. And if you're going to be making politically challenging decisions, all the more reason why you need to have that transparency, you need to have that accountability to be able to justify them. And frankly, the government not having enough time, needing to consider its response, stands in stark contrast to having plenty of time and plenty of staff hours to pour into compiling these colour-coded spreadsheets. Because this isn't the first time that we've had colour-coded spreadsheets. It's not the first time that the Senate has been denied the documents. We had sports rorts, of course, where we had hundreds of sporting clubs across the country that were dudded because of the Liberal Party's corruption. And now we have got car park rorts where we've got hundreds of millions of dollars that was wasted. 
for a scheme that is pointless, for car parks that are not going to solve urban congestion. But hey, you know, if it was to win a few votes, well then what does that matter? that these car parks aren't going to solve urban congestion as long as there's money to be funnelled in, to be jammed into these marginal seats. This is corruption. And who knows what program they're going to rot next? I mean, we don't, because the Liberal Party, this government, is not accountable. It isn't transparent. It's desperately trying to evade accountability. I mean, we've seen that in response to this order for production of documents. There are more delays, more obfuscation, more equivocating in response to a Senate order. But accountability is coming. We've got a Senate inquiry now underway. We will pursue these documents, just like we did with the sports rorts documents. And even if we don't manage to get them because they are hidden away, the fact that they are hidden away, the fact that it's very clear that this government has got something to hide is going to be their front of mind for the community. I mean, we are going to be seeking to uncover the whole outrageous and corrupt rorting. But it's very clear, just like sports rorts, was coordinated out of the Prime Minister's office. Indeed, I mean, it's very clear, listening to Minister Fletcher's words three weeks ago when he was claiming public interest immunity because these documents were cabinet documents, hey, that actually means that the decision to spend the money in these electorates, it wasn't just the decision of the infrastructure minister or the, or the um, urban, urban, urban infrastructure ministers. No, it was a decision, clearly, that was coordinated out of the prime minister's office that was discussed at cabinet. That's the only rationale, the only reasoning why you could say that these documents are cabinet documents and so therefore not available for the community to see. I mean, and importantly, I think what this goes to, the fact that we have seen this, cor this corrupt practice in sports rorts, in these car park rorts, in community grant schemes, the public have seen far too much of the Liberal Party's corruption and incompetence. And it's not just grant schemes. We've seen the hundreds of millions of grants going to their mates. For example, the mates to prop up gas mining in the Beedaloo Basin, to be subsidising the trashing of our climate, to be subsidising and undermining action on our climate crisis just at the moment, just when we're in the critical decade when action needs to be taken. And we have seen a complete refusal to act on climate, stalling for action on electric vehicles, not taking the actions that are needed because they don't want to be doing anything that's going to upset their vested interests, upset their mates, upset their donors. This government does not deserve the support of the Australian public. For the good of the country, for the good of the globe when it comes to climate, for transparent, accountable government, we need to kick them out. Thank you. Are there any other speakers on ministerial statements? Senator Seward? I suspect Senator Rice might want to seek leave to continue her remarks. And could I also take note of the um, response to the OPD 1226 on energy and seek leave to continue my remarks? Okay. Is leave granted? Yes, leave's granted. Thank you. We will move on to committee memberships then. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of a committee. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of a committee. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Thank you. I move that Senator Dodson replace Senator Kitching on the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee for the committee's inquiry into the provisions of the Corporations Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Amendment Bill 2021 and Senator Kitching be appointed as a participating member. Okay. Thank you. It's a question, sorry, the question is that that motion be agreed to. All those in favour? No. Against? No, uh, carried. Agreed. Thank you. More from you. Okay. Yeah. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Charter of the United Nations Amendment Bill 2021, Dental Benefits Amendment Bill 2021, Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment, Equity Investments and Other Measures Bill 2021, 
and Treasury Laws Amendment 2021, Measures No. 6, Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and now be read a first time. So the question is that the bills be proceed without formalities. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. Clark. Charter of the United Nations Amendment Bill 2021, Dental Benefits Amendment Bill 2021, Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment, Equity Investments and Other Measures Bill 2021 and Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 6 Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into the Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to the 18th of October 2021. Minister. I move that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. Um, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against? May ayes have it. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the following bills without amendment. Designs Amendment, Advisory Council on Intellectual Property Response Bill 2020, Industry Research and Development Amendment, Industry Innovation and Science Australia Bill 2021, Royal Commission's Amendment, Protection of Information Bill 2021, and Work Health and Safety Amendment, Norfolk Island Bill 2021. The President has also received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to five laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. Clark. Business of the Senate Order of the Day number one, a report from the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee. Senator Brockman. On behalf of the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Provisions of the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 5, Bill 2021, together with accompanying documents. Thank you. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator McAllister. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I continue uh, with my earlier contribution and I was saying uh, that I wanted to particularly address the concerns that senators opposite have raised in relation to um, these amendments in this bill, particularly Senator Waters, because I am concerned that the government's position has been substantially misrepresented. Uh, Commissioner Jenkins, in recommendation 17, recommended that there be a positive duty on all employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation as far as possible. What I'd like to make clear is that the government is considering this recommendation, but there is are quite a bit of complexity with this recommendation legally because of existing duties which already exist under work, health and safety laws as well as the Sex Discrimination Act, including to ensure that additional complexity is not created for those seeking to use the protections. Uh, this includes an assessment against the model work health, um, work, health and safety laws, which already impose a positive duty on employers to protect workers from health and safety risks, including psychosocial risks such as sexual harassment, so far as reasonably practicable. Our work health and safety laws also provide for compliance, enforcement and inquiry functions to be exercised by work health and safety regulators. Employers which fail to meet obligations under work health and safety laws can be subject to prosecution and severe penalties. Uh, the government is also considering existing vicarious liability provisions in the Sex Discrimination Act, which ensures that if a worker engages in unlawful conduct, such as sex discrimination or harassment, their employer can also be held liable for sexual harassment uh, or sex discrimination if the employer did not take reasonable steps to prevent the conduct from occurring. 
So uh, this existing mechanism means that employers must take reasonable and preventative steps, such as implementing policies and providing training to minimise their potential liability should an incident occur. So it is quite wrong for Labor and the Greens to characterise the government as not supporting a positive duty to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment uh, and um, victimisation. Uh, I also um, want to just return to the very significant provision of funding that we have provided uh, in relation um, to implementation of the budget um, implementation of the Respect at Work uh, response. Uh, and as I mentioned in my earlier contribution, it's some $64.3 million. Uh, now, this builds on an initial $2.1 million over three years, which was provided in October 2020 to implement key recommendations of the report. Uh, some of the further detail in relation to this very significant investment uh, is uh, a breakdown of that funding, which has been provided in our budget is 7.3 million over four years to support the Respect at Work Council, uh, implementing a range of practical measures to address workplace sexual harassment uh, and implementing amendments to strengthen the legislative and regulatory framework. Uh, there's 0.2 million in interim funding in 21-22 to continue the targeted delivery of support for women on work-related matters, including workplace sexual harassment. Uh, there's $1.7 million over two years to Comcare uh, to deliver national forums for Commonwealth, state and territory uh, work health and safety inspectors on sexual harassment and training for employers and managers covered by Commonwealth uh, work health and safety laws to better understand and meet their obligations. There's six million over four years to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency uh, and the Australian Public Service Commission to strengthen public sector reporting on sexual harassment prevalence, prevention and response. Uh, there is $5.3 million to the Department of Social Services to be provided to Our Watch, Australia's National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, which is ANROSE, and 1-800-RESPECT to build the evidence base and develop primary prevention initiatives to respond to sexual harassment. And then there's also $43.8 million over four years for additional legal assistance funding uh, over those four years, as I mentioned, for specialist lawyers with workplace and discrimination law expertise. So um, that is obviously a very, very um, significant uh, additional um, investment as well. So what I hope that this and what I believe and, and what I think is, is quite evident is that this bill uh, does evidence uh, the government's commitment to seeing uh, that women are safe uh, in the workplace to see to ensure that women prosper in the workplace uh, without fear of any form of sexual discrimination or harassment. Um, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's report was extremely well named, respect at work. Uh, that's what we all want. Uh, that's what we all deserve. Uh, that is the government's focus. And this bill delivers on the government's commitment to give women a voice, a voice of truth, a voice of justice, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to take the opportunity uh, to move the second reading amendment circulated in Senator McAllister's name. I seek leave. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Sorry, you don't need to. already been moved. Just checking. Uh, I'd like to make a um, contribution um, to this debate. It's a very important debate, the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021. The bill represents uh, the Morrison's government's overdue response to Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins' inquiry into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. The final report, Respect at Work, was handed down to the government in January 2020 and made 55 recommendations to address the prevalence of sexual harassment in workplaces. It took this government over a year and a half and a historic women's march to finally enact some form of a response. 
As reported by Kate Jenkins in her review, despite implementing world-leading reforms in 1984 with the Sex Discrimination Act, Australia now lags other countries in preventing and responding to sexual harassment. Workplace harassment not only causes untold psychological damage, Deloitte Access Economics calculated that it cost the Australian economy $3.8 billion in 2018 alone. What the report made very clear is that sexual harassment is rife within Australian workplaces, it's extremely damaging, and that, exist, that existing laws are not working to protect workers. It stated that reform is urgently needed, yet it took the Morrison government 18 months to respond, and this bill will not deliver the level of reform which is required. This did not stop the Liberals from making a big, flashy statement. That's what they do. They like to make announcements explaining that they had agreed to all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report. But, like with most things with this government, you must look at the fine detail. You have to look at that fine print. This bill, which has taken more than a year and a half to introduce, implements only six, six of the 55 recommendations in a watered-down reform. In its current form, this bill will not deliver the substantive change needed to address the systematic issues of sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. And it shows that the Morrison government is not genuine in improving outcomes for women and for making workplaces safer for everyone. This bill amends the Australian Human Rights Commission Act 1986, Sex Discrimination Act 1984 and Fair Work Act 2009 to improve the mechanisms for preventing and tackling workplace sexual harassment. We will not vote against this legislation as we will not stand in the way of these changes, which may help make workplaces safer, but we believe that additional amendments are needed. As a start, the bill does not adopt Recommendation 17 of the Respect at Work report calling for amendment of the Sex Discrimination Act to include a positive duty on employers to take responsible measures to eliminate sex dis discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation in their workplace. In a submission into the inquiry of this bill, the SDA reported that 39 per cent of SDA members experienced workplace sexual harassment in the last five years, which is significantly higher than the general workforce, which is 33 per cent. Alarmingly, this number is higher for female members under the age of 18, where over 50 per cent have experienced sexual harassment in the last five years. When you consider that retail and fast food are the most common industries for young people to get their first jobs and start their working lives, it sets an unacceptable precedent. Given the high level of occurrence, it is essential that the Morrison government impose a positive duty on employers to take responsibility for eradicating workplace harassment. Frontline workers in retail have been undercover heroes of this pandemic. Keeping Australia going through lockdowns and ensuring we have access to essential goods and services, they are exhausted and unappreciated, having to deal with soaring volumes of sales with little time to prepare. They're putting their lives at risk every day and they deserve better from the Morrison government, from protection for workplace harassment to being prioritised and I mean prioritised in the vaccine rollout. They continue to be let down on both of these fronts. It was only in the midst of the pandemic, as a result of the pressure applied on them at the start of this year with their handling of the Brittany Higgins case, women have miraculously been moved up on the agenda. But as with most of their responses, it's superficial in nature. Australian women need action from their government, not just words. They need real leadership, not someone who goes into hiding 
when things get tough. In the Respect to Work report, Commissioner Jenkins made it clear that the prevention of sexual and sex-based harassment in the workplace required a long-term sustained effort, leadership and political will to be effective. But as with this watered-down bill before us, Australian women will not get this from the Morrison government. He, they will not get it from this cabinet. It was only after Senator Cash's appointment as Attorney General that the Morrison government even bothered to respond to the report. The previous minister took no action. I wonder why. The government argued that it was busy managing COVID-19 and Australia's recovery, but I call to question what recovery. The government had two jobs, as we have said time and time again in this place. The Prime Minister had two crucial jobs during this pandemic. One was to respond by rolling out the vaccine Order. as quickly and as effectively as possible which he hasn't been able to do because he didn't bother buying enough vaccines to vaccinate the entire population. The second was to build purpose-built quarantine facilities, and he bailed on both of those. Senator Birmingham has already advised that the New South Wales is likely to be locked off to the rest of Australia for the rest of the year. The Morrison government should have foreseen the havoc which the Delta variant would have on our country. But they failed to hear the warnings and instead did nothing. There was plenty of evidence from what was happening overseas, but this Prime Minister failed, along with the Minister for Health, to respond in an appropriate manner. Now our death toll has increased. Frontline workers continue to put their health at risk their families will be separated for months and events will be cancelled, and our economy will probably slip into recession. Since June, there's been up to 15 million Australians in lockdown. That is 60 per cent of our population. Not only is this hurting our economy, lockdowns are associated with an increase in domestic violence and, in particular, violence against women. As was experienced last year, the people who lost their jobs through the lockdown were the first casuals, they were women, and are overrepresented in the people who lost their jobs. This government is all spin. They have no intentions to bring meaningful reform to workplaces. They are full of excuses when it comes to the vaccine rollout, and there is complete refusal to commit to a national quarantine system. How can we expect anything different when it comes to protecting Australians from harassment in their workplaces? Time and time again, this government fails to enact meaningful reform, and this bill is just a tactful ruse for a government weighed down by allegations to show that they do, in fact, want to bring a meaningful change to the systematic issue in workplaces with harassment being of such prevalence, I call on the Morrison government to enact the full suite of recommendations of Respect at Work report. This is the only way to ensure that there are more robust measures in place to prevent, address and redress sexual harassment in the workplace. A Labor government would implement and adopt all the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. That's all 55 recommendations, not six, which is all this government is attempting with this feeble piece of legislation to enact. Six out of 55. Despite not specifically recommended by the report, we have also moved on an amendment to implement 10 days paid domestic family violence leave. It is not only Labor, but stakeholders also believe that this is essential in reforming women's safety at work. We all know that economic independence is instrumental in helping someone escape from family violence, and this amendment would provide a safety net. 
It would give victims the time to deal with any matters that they need to deal with in order for them to take steps to leave the situation of abuse which they have found themselves in. You should not have to resign or be terminated because of this. In my lifetime, and women of my generation would have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace on quite a regular basis. There's not one of my cohort of friends that hasn't experienced or witnessed sexual harassment in the workplace, being considered to have to prove their worth uh, for promotion based on their gender. I remember in the uh, in one of my positions in a short-term finance company when I lived in Melbourne was that if you worked for this company and, you, and men were able, when uh, they joined the company, to jo join the superannuation uh, fund. But for women like myself, you may be invited to join that superannuation fund after you'd worked for the company for 10 years. That was the lived experience, 10 years before you may be invited to join the superannuation fund. Well, thank goodness for, the, for Paul Keating um, and what the Labor government did by introducing uh, superannuation for every worker in this country, because that, is, that was one of the economic um, circumstances for which your gender was used against you in workplaces. But regrettably, it is only a Labor government who would meaningfully improve outcomes for women. Only a Labor government can be trusted to bring the reforms to Australian workplaces so that we can again be a world leader when it comes to prevention of discrimination. This country, as I said earlier, we led the way. But as so many times we talk about, in this chamber, you know, we've had eight years of the Liberal governments, and we seem to be falling further and further behind in so many areas. We certainly haven't taken the opportunity to learn in relation to this pandemic about what has happened through the US, through uh, Europe, particularly through England, and to make sure that people weren't. Um, having to wait for a vaccine. You know, we still have a situation where too many people can't even get an appointment yet uh, for the vaccine. You know, we've spoken about on a number of occasions today about how many aged care workers are still waiting to get their first jab. We still don't know how many people are uh, delivering home care package care into older, vulnerable Australians' home they still haven't had a vaccine. But we know when it comes to the situation in relation to uh, being uh, penalised and discriminated against uh, your gender, on your age, it is always the majority are women in this country, time and time again. Now, sexual harassment can go for both genders, and no one here would say otherwise, that that is deplorable as well. But it's time that we spoke up for women and we made the changes necessary to keep workplaces safe Thank for you, all. Polly. Senator Faruqi, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021, a bill this government has had to be dragged to finally bring to the table, though it still leaves much to be desired. Today we are marking equal pay day and shamefully staring at a gender pay gap of 14.2%. And it is pertinent to be debating this bill on sex discrimination and fair work today because the same structures of power and privilege and patriarchy that prevent us from reaching pay equality are the ones that allow sexism, sexual harassment and bullying to continue in workplaces and in society at large. It is way beyond time that we take strong action to dismantle these systems 
and hold those who perpetuate these injustices to account. Women around the country have spoken their truth about the harassment, bullying, and abuse they have been subjected to and made it clear in no uncertain terms that they will not rest until this stops. The reality is that no workplace is safe from sexual harassment. You would be hard pressed to find a woman who has not endured an unwanted sexual advance, be it verbal or physical, subtle or blatant. Young or old, white, brown or black, executive, teacher, student, political staffer, journalist or waitress, famous or completely anonymous. As women, no matter who we are, we are targets. It is important though to recognize and highlight the ways in which different women face discrimination. Women at the intersections of racism and sexism face multiple and layered added challenges. The advocacy group Women of Color Australia in partnership with Murdoch University recently released a survey that revealed that almost 60% of women who responded to their survey had experienced discrimination in the workplace. What's more, most respondents, about 57%, felt they had faced challenges in the workplace related to their identity as a woman of color. It is this layered oppression that is absent from our mainstream discourse on the issues faced by women. Young Women's Advisory Groups of Equality Rights Alliance and Harmony Alliance, Migrant and Refugee Women for Change, pointed out in their submission to the Respect at Work inquiry that temporary migrant workers face significant barriers in pursuing complaints about exploitative treatment at work, which emanate from the strong power differences between an employer and a visa holder. It is clear that women on the margins experience their workplaces and society in general very differently from others. While we talk about gender inequality and discrimination at work, we must work to address the distinct challenges faced by women of color, migrant women, First Nations women, and other marginalized women's groups. At the end of the day, every workplace and every person within that workplace must take up the responsibility of preventing the scourge of sexual harassment. And this workplace right here, Madam Act Acting Deputy President, the Parliament of Australia, my workplace, must show leadership and ownership of becoming a safe, equal, inclusive, supportive, and just workplace. So we can set the example for other workplaces to follow. And this requires transparency and accountability as well. But we are so far from it. The culture of this place leaves so much to be desired. I really hope every single member of this place, and especially Mr. Morrison's cabinet, have read the comprehensive Respect at Work report by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins. This report, which makes for a sobering reading, found the rate of change in Australia on sexual harassment and discrimination at work has been disappointingly low. Australia lags behind other countries in preventing and responding to sexual harassment. It found our current laws not just lagging, but confusing and insufficient. We can and we must do better. The bill in front of us implements some recommendations from the Respect at Work inquiry, but not all. The Morrison government received Commissioner Jenkins' report on sexual harassment in the workplace in Australia in March 2020. So it is thoroughly disappointing to see that nearly 18 months later, its legislative response misses the opportunity to implement the recommendations in full. Indeed, it, it ignores one of the core recommendations to put the onus on employers to maintain a safe, work, safe workplace rather than on vulnerable work, workers and victims to take action against harassers. The Respect at Work report set out a comprehensive, practical and targeted suite of reforms developed after many interviews and consultations with stakeholders. The report presented a holistic plan to address discrimination and structural inequalities to relieve the burden on victims and to make workplaces safer. The report recommends to enact a positive duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment, sex discrimination and victimization with accompanying enforcement powers. This recommendation has been dismissed by the government. The Respect at Work inquiry found the current system places a heavy burden on individuals 
to make a formal complaint. Yet the government continues to doggedly and misleadingly claim that a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act is not necessary as work health and safety laws include a duty to ensure workplaces are safe. Well, isn't it clear to us that the positive duty in work health and safety laws has completely failed to protect women from sexual harassment and discrimination at work? If it was protecting people, we wouldn't be seeing nearly 40% of women experience sexual harassment at work. The government dismissal reinforces the victim must complain approach, which unfairly puts the onus on victims and is clearly not working given the prevalence of sexual harassment in our workplaces. We know that eliminating workplace sexual harassment will take a big cultural shift away from sexism and patriarchy. The positive duty on the employer to create and maintain a safe workplace would be a step towards achieving this cultural shift and would work as a signal to workers that their employers are invested in creating a safer workplace for all. The report very clearly endorsed that the legal and regulatory framework should encourage and support employers to take proactive and preventive measures to address sexual harassment rather than relying on individual complaints. The vast majority of submissions to the Senate inquiry on the bill emphasize the positive duty recommendation as absolutely critical to achieving the objectives of the Respect at Work report. The government's refusal to enact a positive duty requirement on employers is in direct contrast to evidence provided by legal experts, unions and practitioners, amongst them the Law Council of Australia, Australian Discrimination Law Experts Group, Women's Legal Centre ACT, Australian Council of Trade Unions and the Community and Public Sector Union, to name just a few. The ACTU said in their submission, and I quote, we strongly support this key recommendation. The bill should be amended as recommended by Respect at Work to include a new positive duty on employers. Unlawful discrimination provisions only arise once a complaint has been made, which places too much burden on individual complainants. A new positive duty would complement, not duplicate, existing duties under WHS laws. The Human Rights Commission reiterated its recommendation that the bill include a positive duty on all employers and said it would be a powerful tool to promote broad systemic and cultural change that sits outside of the current adversarial framework of discrimination law. Ms. Tanya Constable, Chief Executive Officer of the Minerals Council of Australia, told the Senate inquiry, and I quote, the positive duty that already exists works for traditional physical health and safety risks. It is clearly not working for sexual harassment. Therefore, given the significant issue, we support there being a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act. I hope the Senate can support the Greens Amendment to include the recommendation of positive duty on employers. I understand the bill in front of us extends the application of the Act to state employees, which is an issue that is particularly close to my heart. In August 2016, during my time in New South Wales State Parliament, a woman rang my office and reported that she had been fired after telling her boss she was pregnant. When she lodged a complaint, she was told it was perfectly legal to dismiss her. I could not believe this was possible in the 21st century in New South Wales, but it was. Two subsections in the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act 1977 allowed employers to dismiss or not hire an employee who knew they were pregnant at the time of the job interview or at the time of hiring. So I got to work. We gave notice of a bill to make this change, ran a campaign and lobbied the government. Six months later, the New South Wales government made the change to remove this exemption. Although we were able to remove pregnancy discrimination from the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act, there still exists a double standard for state employees who are exempted from Commonwealth anti-discrimination laws. So I'm glad to see that this bill will finally remove this double standard. This is a step forward. While the bill amends the objectives of the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 to include, to achieve so far as practicable equality of opportunity between men and women, I have to say the words so far as practicable really irk me. This is a step down from the recommendation of the inquiry, which suggested that the objective be to achieve substantive equality between men and women. As far as is not going to take us very far at all. 
especially not under a liberal national government, which has already dragged its heels on this important reform. This narrow-minded interpretation of the report falls short of community expectations and well short of the legal changes that we need to address the widespread issue of workplace harassment. Women have fought and won so many battles along the way to gender equity, but there are many more to win. Gaining the right to run for parliament has not yet led to equal representation. Women have joined the workforce in droves. We work hard and we pursue every career under the sun. Still, we are undervalued, underpaid and discriminated against. Gender violence kills one woman a week. The feminization of poverty means we earn less and our jobs are more insecure and casualized. It's undeniable that the impacts of COVID-19 are exacerbated for women in every sphere of economy and society. Australia's ranking in the Global Gender Gap Index has been steadily dropping for more than a decade. These are huge disparities that become even worse for First Nations women, migrant women, refugee women, women of color, trans women, and disabled women, as they fall through the cracks in the reporting of these statistics and in the enactment of change, however incremental. So today, as we talk about respect at work, let's acknowledge that the goal of gender parity will not be achieved unless we dismantle the structures of power, privilege, and patriarchy. The economic, social, and political oppression of women continues because patriarchy is allowed to flourish. Feminism is the antidote to patriarchy. I am proud to be feminist AF. Let's make sure that our feminism is powerful. It is collective, and it is for all and with all women. The message women across Australia have given us is clear. They demand an end to sexism, harassment, discrimination, rape culture, and the mistreatment of women in parliament, in workplaces, and in the community. We must hear this message and act on it. It's our job. Thank you, Senator. Thank Perry. you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As we saw on the front page of The Australian today, Australians are actually more concerned about their mental health and job security than they are COVID. Now, whilst this has ramifications for how we learn to live with the virus and open up, end lockdowns, remove border restrictions, we're also focused as a government ensuring that everyone feels safe and secure at work. This bill, Respect at Work, will implement quickly and clearly a series of legislative reforms that the government committed to in its roadmap for respect. These improvements to the anti-discrimination industrial relations framework will see changes around sexual harassment in the workplace. What was something that happened once far too frequently, was often ignored or swept under the carpet, is no longer acceptable. Now, I never thought I'd be mentioning Dolly Parton in this place. But thanks to lockdowns, my consumption of documentaries has significantly increased, so over the weekend I watched the one on Dolly Parton. And whilst it looked at her whole career, there was a large part of it devoted to perhaps her most well-known movie, Nine to Five. Now, I remember seeing that movie when I was pretty young, and whilst the movie was ultimately about women working together and taking back their power, the behaviour of the male boss was what we would consider today wildly inappropriate, to put it mildly. But when that movie was made, that sort of behaviour was seen as so commonplace that no one really raised an eyebrow about it. And in fact, the slurs were directed at the woman who was being chased around the desk and inappropriately propositioned. So thankfully, that sort of behaviour is no longer tolerated, certainly not at that level. But we do know that there is still behaviour that occurs that's not acceptable. Behaviour that makes people feel unsafe in their workplace, and especially where there are significant power imbalances where people are insecure in their job. So the amendments to the Sex Discrimination Act will, will aim to ensure, so far as practicable, that there's a quality of opportunity between men and women to clarify that sex-based harassment is prohibited. It will also remove 
the current exemptions for state public servants. The Act applies to members of parliament, ministerial staff, as well as judges. In fact, it will ensure that prohibitions against sexual harassment and sex-based harassment covers all forms of workers. Everyone is now legislatively protected, regardless of where they work. And those who perpetrate the harassment, under the clarification that victimisation is unlawful, this can now form the basis of a civil action. But whilst these clear and, and uh, concise improvements in this area, there is another part of the bill I wanted to particularly draw attention to. The granting of paid compassionate leave if an employer or their partner experiences a miscarriage. Miscarriage is still in some ways seen as a taboo topic, something we don't talk about or really acknowledge in the way that we should. Any parent will tell you from the moment they found out they were expecting they were parents. It was their baby. But we know that up to one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage. That's around 300 women every single day experiencing this. We don't know about many of them because many people still don't tell anyone that they're expecting until they hit that 12-week mark. And when it does occur, people often fail to recognise the real grief that is being felt. They make comments like, it's lucky it happened early or maybe there was something wrong with it. The parent's grief is diminished or, dimi or dismissed in a way grief would never normally be treated. Uh, this morning I spoke to the CEO of the Pink Elephants, Sam Payne, the only national miscarriage support service in Australia. And they are incredibly welcoming of this leave for loss plan, as they refer to it. She welcomed the opening up of the conversation, the recognition that this is a tragic event for many, many couples, that this leave includes partners. Because whilst we should always remember that the physical loss is experienced by the mother, partners also feel the grief around the loss of that child. So for anyone that is requiring support, pinkelephants.org.au, they actually have the resources to help you, that remind you that you did nothing wrong and it is natural to grieve. The women involved in the, in the organisation have all experienced miscarriage themselves. They know that whilst time heals, the pain never truly goes away. And the fact that so many women keep going, they try again, and sometimes again and again to have that child, this resilience is incredible. So thank you to the Pink Elephants for the work that you do and the work that you have done in this space. For ensuring miscarriage is something we acknowledge and that we acknowledge it appropriately and support those experiencing this significant loss. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Pratt. <coughs> Deputy President, I am angry about the inadequacy of the legislation before us today in Parliament. More than a year and a half has passed since the release of the Human Rights Commission's landmark Respect at Work report, written by Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins. A year and a half. What the report found was that our workplaces and the laws that govern them are failing to provide workplaces free from sexual harassment and discrimination. Hundreds of stories from women and men about the sexual harassment that they have been subjected to in their workplaces. It is utterly shameful that this government has stood idly by while people, especially women, continue to be victimised in their workplaces. This government waited more than a year and a half before responding to the Respect at Work report. An advanced copy of the report was given to the government as early as January last year, until it was re released publicly in March last year. But the Attorney General, Mr Christian Porter, left it to gather dust on his desk. He did nothing. Nothing. 
nothing on this scourge of sexual harassment that was well documented in the Commissioner's report. He did not once meet with the Commissioner about the report or its recommendations. He ignored the report and disrespected the process. To be handed a landmark report about how we as a nation can make our workplaces safer, especially for women, and then to boldly ignore it, especially in the face of the trauma that had been re uh, revealed inside that report. In March this year, when the Prime Minister asked Attorney General Minister Porter to step down, amid allegations of workplace sexual assault and harassment in the, par in the parliament itself and of historic rape allegations against the minister, this government had still not responded to this report. It was only following Senator Cash's appointment as Attorney-General that the government then rushed to respond to it. So, In many ways, I am not surprised at the entirely limited legislation that we now have before us to address this scourge. The response itself and the legislation before it is not deeply considered. And in fact, we've seen senators opposite say, Oh well, we haven't got to the issue of a positive duty yet. We're still considering that. We haven't rejected it. You have had an extraordinary length of time with which to consider this. But I have to say, perhaps it only started being considered because of the scandal around the government, not because of the sexual harassment that was experienced and is experienced and has been experienced since this report was tabled in workplaces right around Australia. This has happened in my own home state of WA, where in Western Australia's mining industries there have been allegations of rape and sexual harassment, events that have taken place since this report was tabled and could have and should have been prevented. So I don't think it's much wonder that this government is still making excuses for assessing a duty of care. Plainly, this bill is worthwhile, but it is a face-saving device for a government that is weighed down by scandal and allegations against its own members. It has not done the due diligence to put a comprehensive package together before this place. Victims of sexual harassment and discrimination deserve so, so much better. The case for change and the path forward was very clearly put forward by Commissioner Jenkins. And this parliament has a responsibility to act on and implement her recommendations. The government sat on this report for over a year without responding or indeed the responsible minister even meeting once with the commissioner. And now we have a bill before us that implements only six of the 17 legislative recommendations that Commissioner Jenkins made. And of those six, some of them are only partial implementation of those recommendations. Implementing all of Respect at Work's recommendations is entirely consistent with my commitment, the Labor leader's commitment and the Labor Party's commitment to achieve substantive equality between men and women in our nation, and to doing this by making the legal and structural changes that enable power inequalities to be addressed in the community and in our workplaces. But the bill in this current form does not come even close to this objective. It does not implement recommend, set, Recommendation 17 to insert a positive duty into the Sex Discrimination Act. It does not implement Recommendation 28 to amend the Fair Work Act to expressly prohibit sexual harassment. It does not amend the Fair Work Act to provide all workers with access to 10 uh, days paid family and domestic violence leave. 
It does not implement Recommendation 23 um, to amend the Human Rights Commission Act to allow representative groups to bring, bring representative courts to cl uh, claims to court. It does not re implement Recommendation 25 to amend the Human Rights Commission Act to insert a costs protection provision consistent with Section 570 of the Fair Work Act. It does not provide broadened stop sexual harassment orders to cover sex-based harassment extending to any circumstances connected with work. And it does not amend the Sex Discrimination Act to achieve substantive equality between men and women as an objective for our nation. It does not implement Recommendation 16 B and 16 C to prevent the creation of hostile work environments. <coughs> it does. The bill says it has to be seriously demeaning. You have to be subjected to seriously demeaning behaviour rather than just demeaning behaviour. And if you look at what, what is left out of this bill, then you can see that this bill provides an advancement but no real protection for women from sexual harassment in their workplace. Why? Because in order to raise a complaint and take it to court, you could be subjected to costs. When you get to court, you could end up debating whether the harassment that you were subjected to was demeaning or just seriously demeaning. Will it be credible enough uh, to stick to a charge? Can you imagine debating uh, the, ex the extent to which you've been demeaned by the behaviour? It is little surprise to me that so many stakeholders in the course of the Senate inquiry agreed with Commissioner Jenkins, who herself said to the inquiry, this bill does, is not good enough and does not live up to what this nation needs to protect people from sexual harassment in their workplaces. The government has failed to address fundamental recommendations for reform. The bill still leaves intact reactive and adversarial regulatory systems that are, by this legislation, largely unchanged. And because of this, the law will continue to fail to protect people in their workplaces from sexual harassment and behaviour from colleagues or bosses that demeans them, or even from customers. The Human Rights Commissioner told the Senate inquiry that the introduction of a positive duty would be a powerful tool to promote broad system and cultural change that sits outside the current adversarial framework of discrimination law. It's little wonder that so many submitters to the committee and in the community have hinged around that this very aspect of what Commissioner Jenkins recommended that is entirely absent from this bill. Those opposite have said, oh, well, we've already got a duty of care in the Work Health and Safety Act. Well, Commissioner Jenkins said very explicitly in her submission on this legislation that the Work Health and Safety Act is not an adequate, substantive, proactive duty of care because it is not specific enough and the Work Health and Safety Act is not perceived in those terms. It's not perceived uh, in the terms of preventing discrimination and harassment. It's tied up in the vagaries of psychosocial hazards, which this government has admitted still needs looking at and further reform. And yet Australian women who are subject to sexual harassment in their workplace will again be abandoned by this government failing to make these changes. Commissioner Jenkins said it would not impose an undue regulatory burden and would have a greater chance of reducing the cost of sexual harassment to business. And she uh, characterised in the report the billions of dollars that this behaviour costs workplaces and productivity. 
but undoubtedly the incredible toll that it takes on those subject to this behaviour. Even employer groups like the Minerals Council agreed, uh, such as Ms Tanya Constable, uh, when she appeared before the Senate inquiry, and she said, given the significance of the issue and the failure of existing laws to adequately address the problem, the Minerals Council of Australia would be supporting a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act. The Law Council supports it, the Diversity Council of Australia supports it, Legal Aid, Australian Dip Discrimination Law Experts Group support it. It seems entirely bizarre to me that this government has refused to include the introduction of a positive duty into this legislation. The right of workers to be free from sexual harassment is a human right, a workplace right and a safety right. And I implore those opposite to amend the bill to support a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act. I know others will speak to the importance of implementing other recommendations ignored by this government, but I want to speak to one other in this contribution. Recommendation 23, that would have um, address what the Australian Human Rights Commission identified as the chilling effect of current regulatory regimes and the impact that has on victim survivors taking action against perpetrators. The government rejected this recommendation without detailed reasoning, simply noting there's an existing mechanism to enable representative proceedings in the federal court. And I have to say, is the government living in the real world the power dynamics that exist in Australian workplaces that make workers extremely hesitant to even come forward and report sexual harassment, let alone go down the route of taking their employer to court, has been something that has been manifestly ignored by this government in the way that it has brought this bill forward, forward and in all its public comment. This government is entirely out of touch with the experiences of victims who have, while it's taken an enormous toll on them, they've left their jobs, they've lost income. In some cases, and I've spoken to women during the course of the Senate inquiry, it has ruined their mental health and their financial future. So today I call on the government to fully implement the Respect at Work recommendations by amending the bill currently before the parliament. I condemn the government for its delay and every day without action allows the scourge of sexual harassment in Australia's workplaces to continue. It is shameful that this government has failed in the legislation that is before us today to take real action to stop sexual harassment in Australia's workplaces. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. And I too rise to speak on the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill of 2021. This is the government's response to the landmark Respect at Work report on sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. And so it is also their response to the one in three people, mostly women, who have experienced sexual harassment at work. Women who have experienced great harm, women who have lost jobs and income, women who are still living with the long-term effects of their experiences, women who deserve and expect urgent action from this government. Instead, we have a response that has been described by experts as a missed opportunity and a failure, a half-hearted version of the substantial reforms that this crisis of sexual harassment deserves, a response that shows this government knows what needs to be done but is simply refusing to do it. The Respect at Work report was groundbreaking, a world-first inquiry into workplace sexual harassment, 
it shone a giant spotlight into the experiences of working women in this country. Women who too often are made to endure damaging and traumatic harassment just on the basis of their gender. The personal stories in the Respect at Work report were a call for change, urgent change. But instead of answering that call, this government chose to ignore the report. The Prime Minister and former Attorney General, Mr Porter, left it on their desks, ignored for over a year. For over a year, they refused to take action. They even refused to meet with the Sex Discrimination Commissioner to even discuss the report's recommendations. And while they let this report gather dust, they spent their time defending their own reputations about the very behaviour that this report sought to uncover. They stood by as minister after minister, member after member was caught up in the various scandals and allegations that we know this government had to endure, refusing to take any serious action, refusing to show any leadership, refusing to make clear that sexual and sex-based harassment are completely unacceptable in this country today, refusing to show leadership, not just with words and spin, but through real action, through urgent change. It wasn't until tens of thousands of women took to the streets in the March for Justice that this government finally started to care. Finally, over a year after this urgent report was handed down, the new Attorney General, Senator Cash, has responded. So this is a government that is always dragged kicking and screaming to take action. And then when they get there, they act with half responses and half measures. Let me be clear, we absolutely welcome the opportunity to finally, finally begin implementing the important and urgent recommendations of Commissioner Jenkins. But as it stands, this bill is nowhere near enough. It is nowhere near strong enough to deliver the changes that the Commissioner recommended. This bill fails to implement 14 of the 55 recommendations which would see women be safer at work. Labor's amendments will strengthen this bill in line with the recommendations of the report. Uh, and critically, our amendments will ensure that sexual and sex-based harassment are properly addressed in workplaces. And Labor has committed to implementing all 55 recommendations. That commitment goes further than just this bill. The Labor government will work with employers, workers, unions and legal experts to finalise and implement stronger laws as a matter of priority in government. The Respect at Work report clearly says that Australia's existing laws are out of date. They are failing to protect workers and reform is urgently needed, reform that this government has just not delivered. Labor's amendment to this bill seeks to introduce a positive duty on employers, a duty to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment from happening in the first place. And this amendment acts on recommendation 17 of the Respect at Work report, a recommendation supported by both unions and employer bodies, a recommendation that this government has ignored. Labor's amendment will ensure that employers have a duty to create and maintain safe workplaces because we know the cases that are reported are just the tip of the iceberg. It's not enough for employers just to react to complaints that are made. They need to actually take active measures in the first place to stop the harassment from happening. A recent inquiry into sexual harassment at mining sites in Western Australia revealed that BHP has taken disciplinary action and fired 48 workers in relation to inappropriate sexual behaviour in the past two years. But evidence from the Western Mine Workers Alliance showed just four in 10 women in FIFO workers felt encouraged to report that harassment in the first place, and half said workers are not supported through the reporting process. So we know that these incidences of sexual harassment that were acted on were just the tip of the iceberg and that there are many barriers to reporting sexual harassment. Insecure work is one. Fear of victimisation is another one. Trauma and shame. 
So taking action against sexual harassment should not be reliant on the courage of the victim. Taking action against sexual harassment should mean stopping it before it actually starts. Positive duties would require employers to take reasonable and proportionate steps to prevent this, har this harassment. And this is what would really mark a shift from the current reactive model that relies on workers having the courage and the means to make complaints. We need to shift that model. We need to shift it to a proactive model that requires employers to take initiative to create workplaces that are free from harassment. Importantly, these duties will require employers to consider all aspects of the workplace when taking those reasonable steps to prevent harassment from staff, from management, and also from customers. Now, in 2016, the Union for Retail and Fast Food Workers, the SDA, conducted a survey with the Human Rights Commission on the prevalence of workplace sexual harassment amongst its members. And the survey found that one in three incidents of workplace sexual harassment experienced by members were actually perpetrated by customers. A young woman under the age of 18 said in her response to the survey, all the times I have been inappropriately touched or commented on, it has been by customers. She said, I feel as if I can't tell them to stop because I don't want to be rude to a customer. And in my own time before the Senate, I was proud to stand with workers against sexual harassment in the hospitality sector. I heard so many stories from young women who were harassed, stalked, pinned against bars by customers, and they received absolutely no support from their management. A survey of hospitality workers at the time showed 90% had experienced sexual harassment and 19% had been sexually assaulted at work. These young workers deserve to be safe at work, safe from harassment, whether that be from other employees, whether it be from management or whether it be from customers. It is employers who are responsible for making these workplaces safe. Uh, and indeed, many employers have signed up to zero tolerance measures through the Respect is the Rule program in the hospitality sector, putting workers' rights to be safe over the assumption that customers are always right. The positive duty obligations in Labor's amendment will require employers to take action towards eliminating harassment from all areas of the workplace, including those customers. And in order for the positive duty obligations to be effective, Labor's amendment will ensure the Sex Discrimination Commissioner has the power to investigate and enforce compliance. This bill is a direct response to the Respect at Work report, but it is also a chance for the parliament to make further steps to improve women's safety. The Respect at Work report found that gender inequity is an underlying cause of sexual harassment. Recognising the unique experiences of women workers is an important step in reversing this inequality. As part of the bill, the government has included the provision of compassionate leave for miscarriages. Uh, and Labor unequivocally supports this change and acknowledges how impactful this will be on those who experience miscarriage. This is absolutely the right thing to do. In times of immense personal trauma, a person should not have to worry about losing pay or losing their job. They should be supported with paid leave to allow them time to process and deal with these deeply personal matters. We, we agree with this. We also believe this should extend to those experiencing domestic violence. That's why Labor's amendment to legislate 10 days paid domestic violence leave is also so critically important because no one should have to choose between their livelihood and their safety. So this leave will allow workers who are facing domestic violence access to 10 days paid leave. And that means they don't have to worry about their pay or their job while they make the incredibly brave decision to get help or seek support. The government have already acknowledged the need to address gender equality in workplaces through changes to leave entitlements. So supporting Labor's further amendment should be a no-brainer. Labor's amendments to this bill are about taking real action because as it stands, this bill is a slap in the face to workers who just want to feel safe and respected at work. 
Workers who deserve a Prime Minister and a government that will stand up for them and show leadership for them. Of the 55 recommendations made by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, this government is ignoring 14 critical recommendations. Women of Australia are struggling to believe the Prime Minister and his promises that he takes this issue seriously. And it's just not hard to see why. 40% of women and 25% of men have been sexually harassed at work in the last five years. Workplace sexual harassment is costing our economy $3.5 billion per year. And Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins found there is an urgency for change. The Morrison government has failed to meet this urgency and it is failing Australian women. Only Labor understands this urgency. Only Labor will take the action needed to implement all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report. And if those across do not support our amendments to this bill, a Labor government will introduce stronger laws as a matter of priority. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. Uh, Acting, oh, sorry, Deputy President, and I rise to uh, make a contribution on this very important step forward. It's a small step, but um, the bill that's before us entitled the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021. Now, this bill is a movement of reform towards reform, but very limited and ultimately insufficient to address the moment that we are in. That said, it will still go a small way towards making Australia a little safer for Australians who are exploited in their workplace by sex sexual harassment. And uh, it's time that something was done. So how would I characterise it? A firm first step, but so much more needs to be done. Now, Labor is proposing to improve the strength of this bill and to seize this moment to make a change that will profoundly protect and improve the lives of Australian women and ensure that sexual harassment and sexual violence is crushed within a generation. And we should not lose this moment. I note this unique historical moment that we're in. Thanks to the courage of some incredible women, our nation is finally having a long overdue conversation about society's treatment of women. But I also note that it's the, the recent statistics over the last five years reported in uh, Commissioner Jenkins' report indicate that it's, while it's 40 per cent of women who are harassed, the last five years has shown an increase to 25 per cent of men who are experiencing sexual harassment as well. Now, I applaud Brittany Higgins and her courage in telling her story. Her brave stance catalyzed a chain reaction that seared through every layer of Australian society, from the powerful corporate boardrooms to political parties to the halls of this very building, the struggle of women for safe workplaces was put on the national agenda. Let me give the Chamber some history on this bill. Initially, the first um, hashtag MeToo movement prompted the landmark Respect at Work review set in motion by former uh, Minister for Women, Kelly O'Dwyer, in 2018. Conducted by our Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, this report laid out 55 recommendations to make our institutions and our workplace is safer for women and crack down on the scourge of violence and harassment that's been endemic for too long. And I actually have the report with me. Um, I don't know how many people will be watching. I know more people listen, I think, across the country than watch. But this is a substantial body of work, a very significant and careful investigation into the reality of living in Australia in our time and sexual harassment that's going on in our workplaces. It's not something to be ignored. And those who are listening to the debate this evening and perhaps into tomorrow as well should really be aware that the government commissioned this report. The government has this information. The government has the power to write the legislation, all the resources of government to create outstanding legislation in response to this outstanding piece of work. But when faced with that opportunity, you'd have to say they've scribbed it. They simply haven't taken the reins and moved us far enough along the journey towards a better, a better Australia. Now, Labor will back um, the very important work of the Commission. And of course, 
we have made it clear that we support all 55 recommendations. And that's a very different kind of support from us, an authentic, genuine one that we're happy to be held account accountable for, which contrasts significantly with the all announcement and pretty short on delivery version of reality that we're experiencing with this Liberal National Party government. You know, there's the announcement, then there's the gap, or increasingly the chasm, and then there's what actually gets done. And that's what's happening with this piece of legislation as well. We know that Minister Porter kept this report, this very important report, locked away in his bottom drawer for over a year, gathering dust. So I do want to acknowledge that Senator Cash, having taken over the portfolio, has got on with the job, but I just wonder how much more might have been done, how much better a job might have been able to be achieved in this Australian parliament if the work necessary to govern well was actually undertaken instead of allowing great reports like this to just sit off to the side with no response. Because the fact is, this could still be sitting in Minister Porter's bottom drawer but for the course of history. And it took an alleged rape in the ministerial wing for the government to finally come to its senses, blow the dust off the report and begin to implement the pieces of it that it liked. So let's be clear. This extensive, well-researched, well-prepared report, an opportunity to create very significant and lasting legislation to improve the life and well-being of the Australian people. And when they finally got to blowing the dust off the report, what have they come forward with? A bill that will implement, implement six, six of those 55 recommendations. Number 16, 20, 21, 22, 29 and 30. It's something. But there's no way that it's enough. Absolutely no way that it's enough. The bill as it stands will clarify the object of the Sexual Discrimination Act. This will add in a line to the ob object clause of the Act so that in addition to elimination of discrimination and harassment, the Act claims to, and I quote, achieve so far as practicable equality of opportunity between men and women. The bill will also clarify an existing provision in the Sexual Discrimination Act to ensure that it's unlawful to harass a person on the ground of their sex due to confusion regarding this provision in current case law. The bill will also expand protection significantly to cover all paid and unpaid workers, interns and volunteers. It will also cover previously excluded categories such as members of parliament, mop staff, judges, and would remove the current exemption of state and territory public services from protections under the Act. Now, this is important, given the context of this debate, and it would close a loophole that should never have been there in the first place. It shows, importantly, that this parliament is not above the law and that we must hold ourselves to the same standards as every other workplace in Australia, and they need to be lifting and rising standards, not minimum basic standards that continue the practices that are too far enmeshed in the culture of Australian workplaces. The work we do in this place is of national consequence, so there should be no reason, no reason at all, why our workplace should be an unsafe place. This bill also expands ancillary liability provisions so that people who cause, instruct, induce, aid or permit another person to engage in sexual harassment or sex-based harassment can also be found liable for the unlawful conduct. It also clarifies whether federal courts can hear civil applications regarding victimisation under the AHRC Act. Now, one of the most important reforms in this bill is to amend the AHRC Act so that the president will be unable to terminate a complaint on the grounds of time um, until 24 months have passed. Now, that's a 400 per cent increase in time. And it's very necessary, based on the evidence that we've received in here, and certainly uh, from my own experience of uh, experiencing sexual harassment, there's a period of sort of trying to process what on earth happened to you. Sometimes when you're harassed, it's such a shock because it's often with a person that is senior to you and a person that you trusted. 
and you have to do the, the, the mind replay to actually think, did that really happen? And then the confronting of that and what might follow, the impediments to action, the emotional impediments to action, let alone the practical ones, means that often there can be a significant delay before people come forward. Now this, I, I'd have to say perhaps it's Senator Cash who's really seen this as one of the few women in leadership positions in this government, because back in 2017 this government cut the time frame for people to bring forward a complaint from um, they cut it in half. So it was a year and they took it back to only six months. So we haven't seen great leadership over the period of government. And let's face it, these guys have been here for eight years. We have not seen good leadership. So in a way I suppose it's remarkable that there's been progress, but not enough. So I, I, I do endorse this in, increase in the um, time in which a terminate of, uh, termination of a complaint can happen to 24 months. Now, the bill will also give the Fair Work Commission the ability to stop bullying orders to deal with sexual harassment in the workplace. And other important reforms are also included in the bill, such as amending the Fair Work uh, Act so that sexual harassment can be conduct amounting to a valid reason for dismissal. Oh my God, and how many women wish that that had been the case prior to this legislation coming forward. And it will also seek to enable an employee to take two days of compassionate leave if uh, the employee or their partner has a miscarriage. Now, they are the worthy reforms that I have identified in my contribution, but they barely scratch the surface of what needs to be done. As I said, only implementing six of the 55 recommendations of the respective work report, barely 10 per cent. Now, I participated in the inquiry regarding this bill and heard some very, very troubling evidence about the insufficiency of current Australian laws in dealing with the scourge of sexual harassment. And it's convinced me that the bill the government has presented is not enough to adequately address the scale of the crisis. In addition to the smorgasbord of disgusting evidence that's embedded in the report that reveals the ugly reality of sexual harassment in the workplace. When uh, this very rushed inquiry um, was undertaken, Labor senators uh, put forward a dissenting report. And in that report, we quote Ms Julia Fox, the National Assistant Secretary of the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association. And she told uh, the committee, and I quote, working in retail and fast food, our members are also exposed to an increased risk of sexual harassment due to their customer-facing roles, with one in five members sexually harassed by a customer. The impact that sexual harassment has on workers is profound. A quarter of our members who experienced sexual harassment said that it negatively impacted their employment, their career opportunities and work. Almost half of those who have been sexually harassed reported experiencing mental health issues as a result. With 6%, 6% reporting they'd experienced suicidal thoughts and 4% with PTSD. Employers need to recognise the health and safety impacts of sexual harassment in the workplace and take steps to ensure the workplace is safe. And I know that those comments may trigger some people who might be listening to this debate, and I encourage you to seek support from the mental health <coughs> lines that are available to help us all when we find ourselves in a time of struggle. The ACTU submission to the inquiry that looked at this piece of legislation and found it inadequate noted, and I quote, that the government's response to the respect at work uh, report falls well short of what the report says is necessary to prevent sexual harassment and other forms of gendered violence at work. The government's decision to refuse to take the actions recommended by the respect at work, um, an inquiry commenced by them to end sexual harassment and other forms of gendered violence in Australian workplace, is unforgivable. Workers at Parliament House and countless other workplaces around the country who have had the courage to speak up about these injustices deserve much better. And there is an opportunity for those on the crossbench and the Green senators to work with Labor 
and I encourage the government to give it consideration even at this late stage of uh, the bill advancing through the Senate to make changes as outlined in the amendments that will be put forward by the Labor Party, to seize this moment, to take <clears throat> heed of the historical moment that we are in. Do not squib it. Do not lose the opportunity to make a bill that does a few things of import much better than it currently is. Give Australians protection that they need. Tanya Constable. The Chief Executive of the Minerals Council of Australia spoke to the committee about the appalling rates of sexual harassment in the mining industries. She told us workplace sexual harassment in mining industry is notably higher at 40 per cent than the national prevalence rate of 33 per cent. The proportion of male perpetrators is higher at 83 per cent than the national average of 79 per cent. The likelihood of being sexually harassed by more than one person is higher. The mean number of perpetrators of sexual harassment in the mining is three compared to 1.7 overall. There's so much more to say, and I look forward to continuing the debate, but this is a moment for an improved bill as we move through the next stages of consideration here in the chamber. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, th <clears throat> Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. In March this year, I joined thousands of angry Australian women. We've had enough of the never-ending gendered violence, of horrific sexual assaults, of the shocking allegations of the abuse and violence perpetrated against women, especially here in the halls and offices of parliament. Australian women roared in March, and we marched to say it was enough. We'd reached our line in the sand. We'd had enough of the appalling workplace culture in Parliament House and other workplaces the continuing discrimination, the continuing harassment and violence. I'm sickened that we still have people holding positions of leadership and authority in this parliament who are the subject of serious allegations and whose behaviour is the subject of serious questions. So what sort of message does that send to women, particularly young women, Madam Deputy President, about taking up positions of leadership and working here in this place. The reality of women's lives, of our lives, is that we are surrounded by, every day by sexual violence. From the age of 15, one in two young women report being sexually harassed at work. Almost two in five women have experienced sexual harassment in the last five years. It's not just young women or working women facing this every day. Even when we're frail and elderly and in aged care, we are at risk of assault. One woman a week is killed by their current or former partner. And the rates of violence, as we know, are even higher for First Nations women. From the youngest women to the oldest women in our homes and our workplaces, we live our lives surrounded by violence. We learn not to look at this full on. To stare at this for too long burns a hole in our hearts. We know all this, we've known this for lifetimes, and it's way past time to act. I'm horrified but also frustrated and furious that there's been so much talk and so little real action. If we in the Senate and the other place, the lawmakers, cannot keep women safe, cannot believe women, then something fundamental has to change. This government seems incapable of taking action of taking those bold steps. It's developed a small response to an overwhelming issue, a mediocre mumble to a full-throated demand from Australian women. This legislation is so limited in its scope, exactly like the Morrison-Joyce government. In 2018, the National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces was announced, and that culminated in the Respect at Work released by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins in March 2020. The report found that workplace sexual harassment in Australia is both prevalent and pervasive and that the current legal and regulatory system is insufficient to effectively address sexual harassment in the workplace. The report, through 55 recommendations, proposed widespread changes to how sexual harassment is handled in the workplace, including 
in relation to improving training, education and awareness in relation to respectful relationships, methods of reporting and initiatives around support, advice and advocacy. When handing down her report, Commissioner Kate Jenkins said, I call on all employers to join me in creating safe, gender equal and inclusive workplaces, no matter their industry or size. This will require transparency, accountability and leadership. Sadly, they're all attributes this Morrison Joyce government does not possess. This legislation is a weak response and a missed opportunity. Instead of taking the opportunity to commit to and implement all of the 55 recommendations in the groundbreaking Respect at Work report, we have this response, which is nowhere near strong enough to nowhere near to deliver the legislative changes proposed by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. This legislation should be changing the Fair Work Act to explicitly prohibit sexual harassment. It should introduce a positive duty on employers to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment happening in the first place. It should make substantive equality between women and men, and it should allow unions or other organisations to bring legal action against perpetrators on behalf of complainants and establish cost protections for complainants so they are discouraged, so they aren't discouraged from taking legal action against perpetrators due to the possibility of having to pay massive court ordered legal costs. The Respect at Work report clearly says Australia's existing laws are out of date, failing to protect workers, and that reform is urgently needed. After commissioning the work in 2018, the Morrison government ignored the final Respect at Work for over a year, leaving it to gather dust on the desk of former Attorney General Christian Porter. It just, it just should not have taken this long. I'm very proud, Madam Deputy President, that an Albanese Labor government will fully implement all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report to help keep Australians safe from sexual harassment at work. An Albanese Labor government will help keep Australians safe all the time. And I'm even prouder of the commitment announced by Labor today that backs our promise and will see action to make women's lives better. Labor will commit around $24 million to ensure there are properly funded working women's centres in every Australian state and territory. That's what Labor will do. Working women's centres provide free confidential assistance and advice about workplace matters including sexual harassment, wage theft and discrimination. Sadly, many working women's centres have cut back their services or they've closed or they face closure because of the Liberals' federal funding cuts. And I have spoken in the Senate here at the dire situation the NT Working Women's Centre is facing because of federal government funding cuts. In October, the NT Working Women's Centre faces its cliff edge. That's only just a little over a month away. Without further funding commitment, it will have to substantially cut back its services to Territory Women. There are only three Working Women's Centres currently in existence in Australia, and of these three, only one in South Australia has its future assured. Working Women's Centres are completely based not-for-profit organisations that provide free and confidential advice and holistic support services on work-related matters to female, transgender and non-binary identifying workers and specialise in gender-based workplace issues. The Northern Territory and Queensland Centres were established in 1994 and the South Australian Centre in 1979. Working women centres work primarily with women who are not represented by a lawyer or other advocate. These women are often economically disadvantaged, vulnerable and work in precarious areas of employment. The working women centres assist with a broad range of workplace issues, such as gender discrimination, unfair dismissal, bullying, harassment, 
sexual harassment and assault. They also conduct research and project work on a range of issues that women experience in relation to work, including access to childcare, family friendly practices, the needs of First Nations working women, pregnancy and parental status discrimination, and leave entitlements, work-life balance, pay equity, and the impact of domestic violence on women workers and their workplaces. Additionally, they provide free and fee-for-service training for workers and employers about workplace rights on areas such as bullying, sexual harassment, and domestic violence. And the experience of working women's centres is that sexual harassment at work remains a persistent public health challenge with implications for workplace safety and workers' compensation. In their submission to the Senate inquiry on this bill, the Anti Anti Discrimination Commission described sexual harassment as a significant and pervasive issue here in the Northern Territory. It pointed out the significant barriers that exist for NT women in a small jurisdiction. For example, if a woman works in a particular field, there may only be one employer in the Northern Territory where she can do that particular work. And speaking up may result in her losing her job and severely limit future employment prospects. Recommendation 49 from the Respect at Work says, Australian governments provide increased and recurrent funding to working women centres to provide information, advice and assistance to vulnerable workers who experience sexual harassment, taking into account particular needs of workers facing intersectional discrimination. Australian governments should consider establishing or re-establishing working women centres in jurisdictions where they do not currently exist. And the government's roadmap to respect response to the report. They agreed with the recommendation and stated that they will engage with state and territory governments on funding for working women's centres. The Commonwealth Government cut core federal funding to the Queensland and Northern Territory Working Women's Centres in 2016 and again in 2020, with the centres only managing to survive because of modest funding commitments from the Labor state governments. The Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations and Shadow Minister for Women wrote to the Attorney General, Minister for Women and Minister for Women's Economic Security on the 27th of August, urging the Morrison government to provide urgent funding to ensure the NT Working Women's Centre does not close and to ensure there are properly funded working women's centres in all jurisdictions. And I would like to certainly acknowledge the Shadow Minister's strong and ongoing support for the work of the working women's centres and particularly for the strong advocacy they've done to ensure the NT Centre can keep its doors open. The government indicated through Senate estimates that they are negotiating with the states and territories on a joint funding arrangement for working women's centres to be established in all states and territories. This was welcome news, but it cannot be an excuse for the Morrison government to try and dodge responsibility and put this on to the states and territories. The NT Working Women's Centre has proven its worth for more than 30 years, and the evidence is clearly there, the work of the NT Working Women's Centre and what it's done and what it continues to do, which aligns with the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children and will contribute to the development of the next national plan. With the Women's Safety Summit planned for next week, I have no doubt the vital work of the Working Women's Centres will again be highlighted. The time is running out for the NT Working Women's Centre. Women of the Northern Territory cannot afford for it to further reduce its services or worse, to close its doors. In the past five years, one in three people experienced sexual harassment at work, including two in five women. This widespread Workplace harassment costs the Australian economy $3.5 billion a year. It must stop. 
I don't believe this legislation will do this. At best, this bill may be a small first. Senator McCarthy. A first, That's right. At best, this bill may be a small first. Senator McCarthy, we just lost your audio. We'll try again. But the government has not indicated any further legislative changes they will make or the time frame for doing so. And the time is running out for the NT Working Women Centre and for women in the Northern Territory to retain a specialist service that acts to ensure they can be safe in the workplace. Thank you. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and thank you for coming in early to take my last few minutes. <clears throat> this bill joins a long list of half-hearted attempts, complete failures and downright contempt for women's issues, as demonstrated by the Liberal government since its election, but particularly this Prime Minister, Mr Morrison. In 2016, with Mr Morrison as Treasurer, he cut $35 million from community legal centres, which provided vital support to women and family violence survivors. The National Association of Community Legal Centres has said 160,000 people were turned away due to funding cuts. As Prime Minister, Mr Morrison completely defunded the National Family Violence Prevention and Legal Services, the peak body representing First Nations survivors <clears throat> of domestic abuse. Ironically and callously, the group lost their funding on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And just a few months ago, in June in fact, Mr Morrison allowed Mr Barnaby Joyce to join the cabinet group Mr Morrison had formed to improve outcomes for women. This Women's Safety and Security Task Force has been blasted a farce with Mr Joyce as a member. Among the many amendments Labor will move to strengthen this bill is to provide for domestic violence leave. But of course, who could forget the assertions made by Minister Cash when, as Employment Minister, she rejected calls for domestic violence leave, claiming instead it would be a barrier to women getting a job and it would act as a perverse disincentive for employers to employ women. <coughs> Ignoring or being completely ignorant as Employment Minister of the fact that there are many current enterprise bargaining agreements where unions have successfully negotiated domestic violence leave, and there are hundreds of employers who support it. We will see in this debate whether Minister Cash has changed her tune. Last December, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner June Oscar released the We Anu Thangi Report, Women's Voices, a landmark report the first in 34 years following the 1986 Women's Business Report. Commissioner Oscar held open meetings across the country to hear from women and girls. What has the government, or indeed the Prime Minister, or the Minister for Women in this place done about this report? Absolutely nothing. They have not even acknowledged its existence. The report provides guidance to the Commonwealth Government on measures which can be taken to effectively address the needs of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander women and girls, and the failure of the Morrison Government to acknowledge this report completely misses the opportunity to include some of its recommendation into this bill before the Senate. Then there are, of course, Mr Morrison's personal failures, his disgraceful management of recent sexual assault allegations in this parliament, particularly when he revealed he'd asked his wife about what he should do in relation to the Miss Higgins matter. 
This was followed by his failure and his refusal to talk to thousands of protesters outside of the parliament. Most of these women were most of these protesters were women, and along with many of my Labor caucus members, we went out and joined that protest. Then there's been the complete protection of the member for Pearce against the allegations of historical rape. Mr Morrison has steadfastly refused to investigate that matter, admitting he hadn't even read the allegations against Mr Porter. The Prime Minister could have taken his lead from the Chief Justice of the Federal Court, Susan Kiefel, who did investigate and found against Justice Hayden. Many Australians feel the Prime Minister hasn't done enough to listen to or protect women, and this bill before the Senate is another clear indication of that. There was, of course, his now forgotten mea culpa, an admission of error, that he'd failed to get the tone right on the marginalisation, the trivialising, the harassment and the sexual assault of women. That acknowledgement of failing to get the tone right is long gone and actions speak louder than words. And this bill before the Senate is further acknowledgement that the Prime Minister has no intention of getting it right. After commissioning the National Inquiry in 2018, Mr Morrison ignored the final Respect at Work report, ignored it for over a year. And it was only after all of the disgraceful sexual harassment and rape allegations in this place that the Prime Minister resurrected the report, which had been gathering dust on the desk of the former Attorney-General and member for Pearce, Mr Porter. It should never have taken this long. This bill is very basic. It fails to implement all of the recommendations from the Respect at Work report. It well and truly lets women down. The report tells us that two out of every five women experiencing sexual assault at work. That's a number, a significant number of the women in this place. By failing to act on the Je Jenkins recommendations, it doesn't build much confidence that Mr Morrison will act on the recommendations of the inquiry they've charged the commissioner to hold into the culture of this workplace. If Mr Morrison won't act to prevent sexual harassment in Australian workplaces, it doesn't seem likely that it would hold his government to a higher standard. The government has shown disregard and disrespect for Australian women time and time again, and this bill was an opportunity to get it right, but it falls well short. Workplace sexual harassment is prevalent and pervasive. It occurs in every industry, in every location and at every level in Australian workplaces. Australians across the country are suffering the financial, social, emotional, physical and psychological harm associated with sexual harassment, and this is particularly so for women. The behaviour also represents a very real financial impost to the economy through lost productivity, staff turnover and other associated impacts, with workplace sexual harassment estimated to cost us the Australian economy around $3.5 billion a year. The inquiry also found that most people who experience sexual harassment never report it. And I'd suggest most women in this place know this, because if they haven't experienced sexual harassment in the workplace themselves, their friends and, and or their family have. This is something women 
do discuss amongst themselves, but sadly we rarely report it because it's often done uh, one person to another and it's very hard to prove. But we all know someone, or many people sadly, many women who have experienced sexual harassment. And women don't report it because they fear it will have an impact on their reputation and career prospects. They fear they won't be believed. They fear they'll be embarrassed. They fear, because they've seen it over and over again, that the perp perpetrator will simply get off with a slap on the wrist or perhaps won't be questioned at all. We know that back in April, Mr Morrison made a flashy announcement promising he would adopt every recommendation in the Respect at Work report. And I remember watching him make those words. But as usual with this Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, it was all spin. In reality, the Morrison government is refusing to implement a number of the major legislative reforms recommended by Commissioner Jenkins, and the Morrison government have also failed to take action or tried to pass off responsibility to the state, something we see in this place every day, for a number of the other key recommendations, including recommendations 25, 27, 28, 49 and 50. Because I can bet you any money you like, government senators in this place will stand up and say the government is fully implementing the Respect at Work report. So let's put it on the hand side that they're not. The Morrison government has not adopted recommendations 17 and 18, which place a positive duty on all employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation as far as possible. Over the last two or three months in Western Australia, we've had an inquiry going on in the state parliament, and it's looking at sexual harassment uh, in the mining sector. Now, sadly, it came about because a woman was raped and those matters are before the courts. Uh, and since that time, a number of other women have come out and um, have made rape allegations against workmates. Workmates, just think about that for a few seconds. Now, I've no doubt that if the government actually was real about implementing the Respect at, right report, um, Respect at Work report and actually did introduce a positive duty of employers to prevent sexual and sex-based harassment. That would make a world of difference in the mining sector. What we've seen the mining sector at the moment come up with is all these punitive measures. And yes, we do need punitive measures. And yes, people should lose their jobs if they're found uh, to have engaged in sexual harassment. And of course they should face criminal charges if they've engaged in um, rape. But there is a requirement for the employers in the mining sector to do a little more than provide a wet mess and a gym. If they had a duty of care, a positive duty of care, they would need to engage with their workforce, talk to them about the sorts of things that make a workplace better and safe. Because the re reality is that in Western Australia, those swings are long. They're 12 hour days. The swings are 14 days in a row. So this is a long time to be away from your family, and it's a long time um, to allow negative workplace cultures to develop. So that is a major flaw in this legislation. But what we can what I can say too is that a couple of weeks ago I held um, a meeting in Western Australia, and we had our Shadow Minister for Women, um, Tanya Plibersek, come and talk to that group. Well, she zoomed in, obviously. 
And, um, Ms Plebisek described the legislation uh, as really important and, and went on to say you wouldn't be allowed to work in a workplace where there was live electricity. You wouldn't be able to work in a workplace where there was asbestos falling on the ground. But in Australia, you can work in a workplace which is unsafe because there's sexual harassment. But sadly, what we're seeing is this is an example of spin-over substance, a government big on talk and pathetic on delivery. If you want to see what a total failure of national leadership looks like, it's this legislation and the weasel words that go with it that's currently before the Senate. It is an absolute um, missed opportunity and another refusal by the Prime Minister to take action on a problem right in front of them and then try and pass it off as something else. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, this Prime Minister would have to be the bare minimum Prime Minister. On all accounts, he fails to deliver, says one thing and does another. And on this particular piece of legislation, it is just unthinkable that he told Australian women that he would take seriously our concerns and our anger and our frustration with harassment at work, that he would implement all of the recommendations of the Jenkins inquiry and report. And yet, once again, we see this Prime Minister fall short. He's full of excuses, but he really has answers for nothing. After the last 12 months, 18 months even, women have had enough in this country of being shunted from post to post by this government. COVID has been terrible for Australian women. More women than men have lost their jobs. More women than men have lost hours. More women than men have lost pay. More women than men have had to take on more unpaid work. Today is Equal Pay Day, the 31st of August. And what does it show us? That the wage gap between men and women in this country is only getting worse. And it's getting worse under the leadership of this Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison. If there was ever a Prime Minister that was bad for women, this is it. This government and this Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. And when he's confronted with the facts, when he's confronted with the difficult issues, he always finds a way of blaming everybody else. He never takes responsibility. It's always someone else's fault, or he wasn't told, or he didn't bother to read the documentation. This bill and the government's response to the Respect at Work report had been sitting on the desk of Mr Christian Porter for months and months and months. And it has only been brought forward because the issue of harassment and sexual abuse in the workplace of women by men has become so stark in our national discussion and debate because, Madam Acting Deputy President, of the bravery of a handful of very strong, courageous women. Women, Madam Acting Deputy President, who work in this building. Brittany Higgins is a hero. Brittany Higgins is one of the strongest women I have ever met in my life. And she was sexually assaulted, allegedly in this building, in a minister's office. And we are told that people very close to the Prime Minister knew. Senator Hanson Young, it's 7.20, so we will be um, 
Moving to adjournment, so I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Bragg. So, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make some remarks this evening about cryptocurrency. Um, it is perhaps remarkable that one in five Australians have uh, exposure to cryptocurrency, according to various surveys. Now, this is a, a phenomenon which uh, may not be well understood by legislators. Certainly, there was a debate in the U.S. Senate just a couple of weeks ago on this exact question, and I think one of the senators, who may have been Senator Cruz, made the remark that only two or three of the U.S. senators really had any sense of what cryptocurrency is, and I'd say that's probably fair enough to be applied here, uh, including to myself. But it is something that has taken hold with younger generations, uh, and it appears to me that as a one trillion dollar industry now, uh, we want to be doing all we can to ensure that Australia and Australians can get the, the most benefits uh, that it can from digital assets and cryptocurrency. Now, the question is, uh, what are the benefits of these uh, new innovation, new changes? And the answer is uh, more efficiency, which is perhaps quite boring, but uh, in a real sense, it is more choice and more competition to traditional uh, financial services providers in particular. Uh, where you've seen, uh, in particular, banking oligopolies and the like take hold for uh, decades, uh, you could see cryptocurrency and digital assets uh, breaking down uh, the, the barriers uh, to competition so that people can have more choice uh, in running their own affairs. And I think one of the interesting uh, things that I've learned in studying this sector is that uh, younger people uh, want to do banking and finance different to their parents. Um, they want to have more control, uh, they want to have a say on that, and decentralised finance and the like I think presents really op interesting opportunities for us to break down some of the very long traditions in Australia where you've seen too much power in the hands of too few. Uh, and so I think the opportunity for Australia in terms of uh, choice is clear. The opportunity is also very clear, and I have to say I've been blown away uh, with how many jobs uh, this industry has already created in my home state of New South Wales, uh, for people who are working at uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and the like, uh, there seems to be uh, dozens of these companies employing 40 and 50 people, um, and they are managing a lot of assets. And so we want to make sure that there is a proper framework um, around this industry. Uh, it is important that we don't have regulatory arbitrage, where you have a heavily regulated financial sector over here and then you have a totally unregulated sector over here with people doing very similar things. Um, so we want to make sure that there is consumer protection in this space, uh, but we also want to make sure that we are incentivising investment. Because if there is a $1 trillion sector out there, uh, we want to make sure that we're getting um, as much of that benefit in terms of investment and jobs into our country, because after all, uh, we have a safe jurisdiction. Uh, the laws here are certain. Uh, and so we should be looking uh, to have policies and laws which are at least as good, at least as good as Singapore, the UK and the US. Certain US states have already passed very detailed laws to deal with digital assets and cryptocurrency, which is attracting investment and jobs and new choice. So we want to be a fast mover here. Um, it has taken a long time to enact changes to our company's law uh, to incentivise more investment into certain parts of the finance sector. Certainly, we can't wait dec decades to put in place new laws to protect investors uh, and incentivise investment in this cryptocurrency space. So I think the trade-off here for us as a country is, um, is exactly that, is how do we protect consumers who are already, wi who are already widely using these assets, uh, one in five Australians, according to some surveys, but equally, how do we ensure that we capture that investment and those jobs into places like uh, Sydney in particular, uh, because we are competing with Singapore, we are competing with London, we will compete with states like Wyoming in the US, which have passed detailed laws. So where to from here? Uh, there's a Senate committee that I'm chairing which is looking at this in detail. Uh, we will come back uh, by October with a plan to deal with cryptocurrency and digital assets, which will look at markets, custody, it will look at the tokens, it will look at the tax settings, and it will put forward a plan that can put Australian 
digital assets and cryptocurrency at the top of the heap, certainly in our time zone. Senator Brown. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about one element of the jobs crisis that has been created by the Morrison Liberal government's failure to maintain a uniform national wage subsidy scheme. Because the ham-fisted, alphabet soup approach to disaster payments adopted by the Morrison government since the premature end of JobKeeper has meant that many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Australians, have been left without income support and indeed be treated differently depending on the state they live in. Indeed, it has been reported in Tasmania's The Mercury newspaper last week, and I quote, the number of airport workers stood down due to flight cancellations across Tasmania has climbed from 30 to 100 as border closures continue to hurt the tourism sector. That's the income of 100 workers in Tasmania gone because Mr Morrison's Liberal government has steadfastly refused to provide support and assistance to those who are direct casualties of his inept ability to provide a robust quarantine system that works and a vaccine rollout comparable to the rest of the developed world. Not a single one of these 100 impacted workers are eligible for Mr Morrison's aviation support package. Not one. And yet these are workers in the aviation sector who have been stood down, lost their income because of the direct impact of border closures and lockdowns brought on by this government's failures. That was meant to be the point of the aviation assistance package, to support these very workers. And if that wasn't meant to be the point, what was? Why do workers across Australia continually have to suffer because Mr Morrison refused to admit he got it wrong with the early axing of JobKeeper? The failure to provide support to workers in this sector will have an ongoing uh, flow-on effect to businesses that rely on visitation to, a, to Tasmania for many months to come, even after border restrictions are eased. This is due to an exodus, exodus of skilled and accredited aviation ground operation staff, without whom Tasmania will be unable to handle an increased volume of air traffic. This is a looming supply chain failure, brought about purely by the Morrison Liberal government's inept in transition. I, I commend the Labor member for Lyons, Brian Mitchell, for continuing to raise the plight of these workers and seeking to have this important matter addressed on their behalf and on behalf of the many Tasmanian businesses their critical work supports. I urge Mr Morrison to admit he's got it wrong and provide the necessary support to these workers to keep our aviation industry going for the long term. But let us be clear, it is not just aviation support ground staff who are suffering. We are seeing workers at, air, uh, at air, other airport services like food vendors and car hire companies being stood down as well. Beyond our airports, we're seeing our accommodation providers, hospitality venues, restaurants, cafes, pubs, tourism operators and so many more suffering from a significant and sustained reduction in visitation. This is a burgeoning crisis that many businesses will struggle to recover from. That is why Tasmania's Labor members of federal parliament wrote to the Prime Minister some weeks ago urging him to reinstate border financial support for workers and businesses impacted by border restriction. And the chorus of support for these necessary measures has only grown louder since. As quoted in the Sunday Examiner, tourism operator and publican at the Duke, the Duke Hotel in Hobart, Douglas O'Neill said, and I quote, we've seen a massive drop in revenue. There's just no tourists coming in. Three weeks ago, I woke up and cried looking at my bank statement because I didn't know how I was going to pay staff, end quote. Like so many others, Mr O'Neill has said the poultry one-off grants currently available would not even cover a week of wages or rental costs. The time for action was yesterday. But if Tasmanian workers and businesses are to survive to see the other side of this crisis, they need support today. Tasmanians can see the downturn on the streets, whether it's the abysmally low patronage at Hobart's iconic Salamanca market and what that means for the many hundreds of stallholders, the low number of diners at our restaurants or the friends and families we know who've had their rosters cut and shifts dropped. This downturn is having a real world impact. The Prime Minister pledged last year that he would build a bridge to get Australians safely to the other side of this crisis. 
Well, it seems to not only the construction of physical bridges, but in, indeed metaphorical ones, is where, is where this Prime Minister struggles to keep Senator his Brown, promises. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise tonight to focus on a, strategy, on a tragedy that is happening in the streets of Perth. Recently, there has been a number of deaths of First Nations women experiencing homelessness in Perth streets. In the heart of Perth CBD, four Aboriginal women died on Perth streets in less than four weeks over the coldest months of winter. On June 18, a young Noongar mother who dreamed of being the next Kathy Freeman, Alana Garlett, and I have permission to use her name, died in Royal Perth Hospital in June after being found unresponsive outside the Wesley Uniting Church on Hay Street in the CBD. In the two weeks after her death, three more Noongar women died within a couple of hundred metres of that same spot. On the same freezing night, a vigil was held for Alana at State Parliament on August 4. Another young woman was found in Yagan Square. The following week, another woman died outside the Perth train station. And then another young woman was found unresponsive in the CBD the following night. That's four deaths in less than a month. At least one woman has died on Perth streets every week this winter, after 56 people died while homeless in Perth in 2020. These women are dead due to WA's housing crisis that governments have overseen. Noongar elder Vanessa Colbung is an aunt to one of the women who died and is herself homeless. She is a respective activist within the Noongar community and she recently said, this is all a product of a system that failed us and continues to fail us. We can't see a light at the end of the tunnel when women and birth givers are dying in front of us. We bring these people into the world and we have to watch them die with no one being held accountable and no justice being given to us. We feel like we are digging our own graves and the homelessness sector has to be held accountable too. We present ourselves at services and we face an obstacle course with no end in sight. People are getting desperate and talking about doing things they shouldn't that shouldn't be spoken about in one of the richest countries in the world. How can we deal with any of our social issues if we don't have the foundation first? Housing. Dr Betsy Buckham, OAM, is a legendary advocate for Aboriginal people who, have worked for, who has worked for years with Aboriginal families in Perth, in Perth to help them advocate for housing and generate political pressure for, politi for policy solutions to end homelessness. Dr Buchan has described these deaths as Perth's own pandemic, claiming the lives of at least one of our people every week this winter. She recently said, we are completely overwhelmed with families calling all day from early in the morning. So many of these destitute families are calling for help burying the children, which costs thousands of dollars they don't have. Others are demanding accommodation before they, can, before they become the next death desperately ill people, discharged from ICUs and hospitals, straight back to the street. They are angry and embittered because, they are so, because there are so many deaths. People are terrified that they will be next. Their loved ones keep dying. This is a total crisis. While everyone has been focusing, focusing on COVID, and rightly so, more lives have been lost in Western Australia from homelessness than the pandemic. We need to look at this as well as the current pandemic. The colossal failure by all levels of government, both nationally and in WA, the state government, to focus on vulnerable First Nations women is shameful. I cannot believe that we're seeing young Noongar women literally dying on the streets of the richest, safest state in the world. It is unacceptable. My heart goes out to the families of these women and to those of the 56 who died on WA streets last year. The, uh, the solution is urgent investment in more social and affordable housing and specialist homeless services, something the government has all but abandoned, both here and in Western Australia. We need to be seeing a significant input into this issue in the upcoming state budget. 
How many more women do we need to lose in Perth before governments, both state and federal, recognise the dire situation we are facing and that First Nations women are facing in this country? Senator O'Neill. Sure, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the pathetic failure, in fact, of the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, to adequately, adequately protect Australian consumers. The Treasurer has once again missed another deadline for implementation of a crucial reform recommended by the Hain Royal Commission. And what could be more important, more crucial, than ensuring that com consumers scammed by companies are able to access restitution? I'm talking, of course, about the compensation scheme of last resort, so long promised by this government, but still not delivered. This is the government that voted 26 times against a banking royal commission, and it's still slow walking its recommendations or even jettisoning them completely. As we've seen with the attempted repeal of the responsible lending laws, the coalition government is unwilling to legislate to protect Australian financial service consumers. Now, a small delay is understandable given the pressures of COVID-19, but this is just another example of the Treasurer kicking the reform, the necessary and promised reform, into the long grass for another six months. This is the second time that this particular reform, called the most important recommendation of the Banking Royal Commission by Consumer Group Choice, has been delayed by six months. It just cannot continue to be kicked off into the long grass. There is, there is no reason for delay. Over the past year, more Australians than ever took out superannuation savings from their fund, and some of them were forced to use additional financial products to attempt to make ends meet during this recession. Yet, despite their efforts and their need to use financial products, they have no recourse to financial compensation if the regulator looking after this sector finds that these Australians were actually given misleading advice. The delay by this government has real-world effects. The Australian Financial Review report reported in June that, the Australian, that Africa has had to pause work on cases for one reason until Mr Josh Frydenberg finalises this compensation scheme of last resort. AFCA can't do their work. AFCA is turning people away at the door because, in the words of their spokesman, they did not feel it was right to ask consumers to invest considerable time and energy in pursuing such matters until it was clear that there was actually a prospect that they may be paid compensation if awarded. The ABC reports that 620 Australians have, asked to wait have been asked to wait indefinitely for access to financial compensation until the Treasurer decides to get his act together. This is appalling, appalling governance. And what we see constantly from those opposite and interactions that I hear about through my office, they go to their member, their local member, and they say, I've got this financial product problem and they get the standard response, off you go, go off to AFCA and they'll help you. Yet the reality is the Treasurer's inaction, the Treasurer sitting on his hands, is preventing those people from getting the recourse that they so, so much deserve. Now, justice delayed is justice denied. Australia, Australians who the regulator has ruled have been dudded by misleading financial advice and products are able to access financial compensation because aren't able to access financial compensation because the government just hasn't bothered to legislate the appropriate frameworks. Now these victims of financial crime may not see a cent until 2022, and many of them have already been waiting years for just compensation. I couldn't think of a time of more heightened financial pressure for so many people than right now as COVID is escalating in its impact through our economy, our families, our community, our small businesses in particular, and amongst those who have invested in financial products who have a right to expect that the government regulates that sector that they're responsible for. The government's had plenty of time 
on its hands. It's found time to attack super industries, the one sector that actually came out of the Hain Commission unscathed. Yet this government cannot find the energy or the heart to get everyday battlers the compensation they deserve. It's a searing indictment on the heartlessness and the lack of direction of the Morrison government. Minister Frydenberg cannot delay this reform any longer, and I call on him to give the people what they promised, a compensation scheme of last resort. Senator Patrick, on the remote, you have the call. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Overnight, the US uh, troops in Afghanistan, uh, the last US troops in Afghanistan flew out of Kabul. The Afghanistan conflict has been Australia's longest serving military commitment, a war repeatedly endorsed by this parliament and a war that has ended with an ignominious collapse. There is no great secret as to why we went into Afghanistan in the first place. In the immediate aftermath of September 11, 2001, the Prime Minister John Howard invoked Article 5 of the ANZUS Treaty, the, uh, the first time that provision had ever been invoked. We sent our special forces and the uh, RAAF as part of an international campaign against Al Qaeda, but first and foremost, it was a down payment on the ANZUS Treaty and the US security guarantee uh, that comes with that for this country. Over time, however, the rationale for our military efforts evolved. The shift can be discerned from the statements made by Australian government ministers as the years, indeed decades, went by. In August 2002, for example, Defence Minister Robert Hill declared, the focus is shifting away from destroying concentrations of Al Qaeda and Taliban forces in Afghanistan, a job now almost complete, to tracking down any remnants and preventing them from regrouping. In 2008, Labor Defence Minister Joel Fitzgibbon declared that Australia's military efforts were uh, ensuring that, and I quote, a tyrannical regime which provides safe haven for terrorists cannot take hold in Afghanistan again. In December 2009, Defence Minister John Faulkner said the challenge was to enable the Afghan National Security Forces to take full responsibility for security and stability. That's when the job is done. In 2000, uh, October 2010, Prime Minister Gillard, uh, Julie Gillard declared Australia will not abandon Afghanistan. That's right, we would never abandon Afghanistan. In February 2012, Defence Minister Stephen Smith declared that we are on track uh, to transition to an Afghan-led responsibility for the Afghan National Security Forces by 2014. Well, in the seven years since 2014, a lot more blood and treasure was spent in Afghanistan, but to no avail. The truth is Australia should have left Afghanistan much earlier. Our political leaders should have acknowledged the deeply corrupt nature of the Afghan government. Corruption was the cancer that destroyed the regime in Kabul. The patient was always on life support as billions of dollars of assistance were wasted. And once US uh, President Trump took office and the, the, the writing was on the wall, the US no longer had the will to continue fighting. The cost was too high and Afghanistan was not actually very strategically important. Against that uh, background, in a speech to the Senate on October 2019, I called for the Australian government to quickly wind down its military commitment in Afghanistan and Iraq. I said then, given our, the current state of flux in American policy and erratic character of decision making in Washington, and there is an urgent need for Australia to closely look closely at current Middle East operations uh, and ask some very searching questions about the risks involved and our long-term strategic interests. I further argued we were unquestionably entering a new era of competition between major powers focused uh, on East Asia and the Pacific. In these circumstances, Australia must face significant strategic challenges closer to home. That's where our national interest lies. Now, that was October 2019. But the government sat on its hand, mild, mired in political inertia and unwilling to do anything in advance of the United States. Then, when the United States did begin to pull the plug off, our government moved with indecent haste, abruptly pulling out our remaining troops and sh uh, shuttering our embassy in Kabul. Hundreds of Afghans who had helped our forces left at risk. We had, begun an or had we begun an orderly drawdown of forces two years ago, we would not have seen the shambles of, we of recent weeks. Are there lessons to be learned from all of this? Absolutely there are. After 20 years of conflict, we need a fully empowered inquiry into Australia's war in Afghanistan. There should be an independent inquiry carried out uh, by independent Australian experts with full access to all relevant government records, cabinet papers, military assessments, 
operational reports and intelligence files. Of course, there's little appetite for such an inquiry from either the coalition government or Labor. So this might prove to be a task for future historians. Fortunately, the Cabinet papers for 2001 will be available for public access next year. We will have to see just how much uh, will be redacted on dubious grounds of national security. Meanwhile, we should remember that those who ignore and fail to understand the past are often condemned to repeat it. Thank you. Senator Polly. Acting Deputy President, well, I rise tonight to make some brief comments in relation to Senator Rachel Seward. Uh, this is her final week in the chamber, and although I want to actually just agree with so many of the comments that were made last week um, after her valedictory speech, I'm actually speaking from a different perspective, and that is from the class of 2005. And 2005 was a great year. We had um, a, a lot of senators elected at that time, but unfortunately, there is still remaining in the chamber only Senator Glenn Stowe and myself, with Rachel leaving this week. We did adopt a couple of stragglers, like Senator Carol Brown and uh, Senator Connie Ferravanti Wells. And the reason we embraced them so warmly was I'd introduced a system whereby we would collect money from the class of 2005 to, to actually add uh, to the coffers of the Senate staff Christmas party. So when we're all talking about all the great things that Rachel's done since she's been in this place, let's get down to tin tacks, what we all come back down to, and that is money. We are going to lose Rachel's contribution. So even though there were times when I really did have to chase her, and I think her offers at times got sick of me ringing, saying, come on, Rach. Uh, but look, sincerely, I just want to put on the record that um, to come in and to be able to serve this place uh, with a distinction that I think has gone across the chamber with our respect for uh, Rachel's contribution. I remember the first inquiry that I think I travelled with Rachel, we went to uh, Central Australia. It was the uh, petrol sniffing um, inquiry with Community Affairs. And that was a, an eye opener for myself because I hadn't been to Central Australia and I certainly hadn't had the experience in the First Nations community to the same extent, obviously, as Rachel Seward had. So I found her to be a good educator. And the thing that I found with my work with her over many years through community affairs, mostly, was her compassion, her strength of respect for the witnesses and people that were coming uh, before us. We did actually endure some really tough inquiries during that time. Some of them were life issues where Rachel and I are on polar opposites uh, around those issues um, most of the time, I might add. But unlike others that are on that committee, I can truly say that Rachel actually showed dignity and respect for people who had a different view to herself. She was always um, a bit like, I think when I first uh, met her in, when we had our class of induction for new senators was, who is this little pocket rocket? And I have to say she really um, grew uh, to warrant that nickname for myself and sometimes I'd actually refer to her as a terrier, but it was always with fond regard. But to, um, to go back to the sort of committee work that we did, um, that translated into estimates and I'd have to put on my record, on the record here tonight. Uh, that we worked so well together in community affairs, but particularly when I was um, the shadow um, assistant minister for um, aged care, and the way that she would allow me to take the running on the issues around aged care and around deme dementia um, did not go unnoticed because she had the same passion as what I have to see the changes. And I know that she spoke about um, her her sadness about leaving this place where she hasn't achieved as much as she would have liked to in a whole range of areas, including climate change. But I think also, uh, like myself, she'd have a heavy heart uh, to, for her to be leaving knowing that there's still so much to be done in the aged care sector, so much reform, more investment, as well as in disability services. So I want to just say, uh, on behalf of uh, what's left of the class of 2005, 
uh, to wish Rachel all the very best. Uh, there's a new chapter in her life. She's going to actually get the opportunity to spend time with her family, to do um, some uh, surfing and, and the like. But like with everyone who serves in this place, it's our families and our partners and our friends who also give, um, give the allowance for us to be here and to do the job that we were elected to do. So um, again, all the very best, Rachel, to you and your family, and I wish you every success for your new future endeavours. And I have no doubt that I, I wouldn't mind betting that you'll be back in front of a, a committee at some time in the future, giving evidence and certainly lobbying. Senator. Polly, your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to talk about an uncomfortable but important subject. It's the harm that exposure to pornography is doing to our children. Now, when a committee of this parliament examined the issue, it found that with young people's growing and widespread access to digital platforms, often outside adult supervision, the exposure of children to violent and extreme pornography was a matter of great concern. The number of adults who testify to the life-destroying harm of the unrealistic portrayals they see in, in pornography is large and growing. But on the developing minds of primary schoolers and teenagers, the facts are plain disturbing. There is a large and growing body of national and international evidence that shows children and young people who view porn suffer impaired social development, damaged mental health and stunted psychological development. The flow-on impact of the early sexualisation of children and the increase in child-on-child -child sexual assault and violence is just as severe. The former can lead to low self-esteem, lifelong problems with body image and eating disorders, and poor emotional and cognitive development. They manifest in more serious conditions like depression, anxiety, promiscuity and sexual delinquency. We can't deny this stuff has real consequences. Teachers report primary schoolers reporting, attempting what can only be described as sexually abusive acts on one another as they mimic what they've seen in pornography. High school girls speak with embarrassment about the pressure they face to engage in acts and to provide explicit images and videos. The consequences are seen in the injuries with which adolescents in particular present in our emergency rooms, everything from the impacts of choking through to tearing and prolapse. Pornography damages children. It warps their perception of healthy interactions with one another and their expectations in their own relationships as they grow. It teaches a destructive, depersonalised, violent and frequently degrading view of sexuality. And it corrupts the notion of consent. At a time when we've never been more aware of the harms of domestic violence, when we have never invested more public money in combating intimate partner violence, why are so few people willing to confront, frankly, the connection that exists with pornography? The testimony of those working at the front line of domestic violence services shows the truth. Di McLeod, who's a director of a DV centre on the Gold Coast, puts it this way. In the past few years, we've had a huge increase in intimate partner rape. The biggest common denominator is consumption of porn by the offender. With offenders not able to differentiate between fantasy and reality, oblivious to injuries and never even considering consent, we've seen a huge increase in deprivation of liberty, physical injuries, torture, drugging, filming and sharing footage without consent. And that's the edited, less traumatic version of her quote. Adults should be able to make their own decisions about whether they access pornography, but children simply don't have the capacity to deal with this kind of content. Some parents will say, some people should say parents will supervise better, should supervise better. And to an extent that's true, but it's hard to be watching them all the time, particularly in the era of mobile phones and tablets. But there are things we can do. We can explore verification of whether a person is 18 before they access this stuff. It is a sensitive issue, though, because I expect adult users would be uncomfortable with the idea, albeit false, that the government was collecting a list of porn users. Age verification could be done without requiring a big government database, much like when you go to buy something from Dan Murphy's. 
But the international experience of implementing a system of this kind is that it can be technically complex, particularly given many of these websites aren't based in Australia. We should learn from the experience of the UK struggling to implement this. But there's another option. We could require internet service providers to offer filtering of explicit content to their customers. It's a solution that empowers parents, respects the freedom of adults, and doesn't require a complex regulatory scheme. Something like this is now in place in the UK, and up to 40 per cent of customers, depending on the ISP, have chosen to opt in. Importantly, it's not a mandatory filter of the kind suggested by Senator Conroy some years ago. It must be voluntary for it to fairly balance the important objective of protecting children with the rights and freedoms of adults. And so I encourage the industry to step up and do what's needed to protect our children from this evil material. Thank you, Senator Stoker. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.